<laughs> hey, <clears throat> how's it going? Uh, I am Rebecca Stone. I head up uh, customer solutions marketing for Cisco, which is really just a fancy way to say product marketing. Uh, and I will be joined on stage shortly by my friend and colleague, Omri Gilfand, who heads up uh, product strategy for our SASE products. And we're here to talk to you a little bit about a theme that you probably started to hear. Hopefully many of you made your way over here from the keynote and heard it there. If not, you'll probably hear it over the course of the next few days, which is that Cisco is on a journey towards simplification. And we are on a journey towards helping you simplify your IT infrastructure. You heard uh, Javid talk about hybrid work and how we're trying to unify the solution around hybrid work to make it easier for you to in install solutions for, um, for remote workers and across your, uh, your uh, office. We also talked about security. And you heard uh, Tom talk a little bit about how we are unifying all of the different uh, applications and products that we have from a security perspective in order to have that unified security platform. The last thing that you heard was from Jonathan Davidson. And Jonathan talked a little bit about your network infrastructure and how we are on a journey to simplify that. What you probably heard from Jonathan is hopefully two things, since I wrote that messaging, so hopefully, hopefully he delivered it well was the first was really a journey towards the convergence of hardware. And that hardware across your access networks, your data center networks, even uh, between security and networking. The next thing that you heard was that we are on a journey to deliver that all via a cloud platform. And when Omri and I were talking a little bit about this presentation and what we were going to do to explain how and when the convergence was going to happen, we were trying to come up with a few real world examples for why this was important and, and a way that you could kind of visualize how this was going to happen. And the uh, recommendation that he suggested was actually currency. And as I thought about it, at first I was like, oh, I don't really get it. And I, I, after I thought about it a little bit, I was like, oh, this, this actually makes a ton of sense, particularly here where we are today. Because when I first started traveling across Europe, and this might date me a little bit, but when I first started traveling across Europe, I had to go to a bank and get a traveler's check. And then I had to go to a, another bank when I arrived in the country and cash that traveler's check and get a certain currency for that country. And every country that you went to within Europe, you had to do the same thing. And that was a complicated process. You had multiple currencies in a very small region. And then the euro was introduced. And that is sort of like the convergence of hardware, right? Is that it all came together into one thing. The next thing that happened is the next few times that I started to travel was I had credit cards. And that was a simplification in itself because I was down from 10 different currencies to three credit cards, my business credit card, my, whole, my, my personal credit card, and then my ATM because, you know, I still wanted to pull out that cash if I, if I needed it for something. That was a simplification because we moved from one, one type to an easier type. This trip, however, it was completely different. Because this trip, I didn't use any of that stuff, even though it's still in my purse. I use this. I've used this almost everywhere. And that's an example of a move to a cloud platform. Because it really exemplifies the coming together of all that currency into a simple, easy to use device on your hand. And this device not only delivers that currency and, and helps me buy things in all of the stores and restaurants that I've been to, um, but it also helps me because I'm able to talk to my kids and I'm able to do WebEx calls um, and I'm able to answer my emails and I'm able to do running. I tracked my run this morning too. So um, it, it is really truly a convergence of all these things on a cloud platform that simplifies it for me. Unfortunately, that simplification for me has made it increasingly complex for you to navigate because there is the connectivity that I now have to have 24-7, whether I'm in the office or I'm here or I'm uh, at home, it creates complexity if you are delivering an application to me because you have to think about multi-cloud and hybrid cloud uh, solutions and then add a layer on top of it in that we are in an incredibly complex security environment because I need to 
uh, I need to be secure no matter where and how I'm working. This causes your IT experience to suffer. I've talked to so many customers this week who have said, we can barely keep up with the things that we need to keep up with. It's really, really hard. It's hard to scale, it's hard to be predictable, and it's really less reliable than, um, than we'd like it to be. And when your experience is suffering, then the user experience is suffering because you're not able to deliver the time to, uh, to delight that you'd like to. You're not able to free up the time that you could be doing thinking about those higher level strategies because you're trying to just troubleshoot the problems that you're having across the network. In fact, by, in, by next year, more than 40% of CIOs, so 40% of the businesses that you represent, say that it's going to be really hard to deliver on the business outcomes that they want to drive because they can't allow for that digital transformation. The struggle is real. So what does it take to be successful to do it? As we said, there are two things. There's the cloud platform, and the second is the convergence of the hardware that we need to think about. In order to, if you start with the cloud as your priority from an operations model, from an operations and management model, you'll be able to better uh, access and allow for security, access, and IoT in your networks in a simple and scalable way. If you start with that as your, as your foundation, you'll then be able to work with your ve vendors in a different model using flexible consumption, and that allows you to change and move resources much faster and much more quickly than you could before because you'll be able to, uh, to prioritize the different things that you might need to prioritize in a different way. The second thing is the automation and the analytics that come from that infrastructure. Today, if you're typically on-prem, you're doing a lot of that manually. You're potentially scripting it so that you can pull it out. Um, with cloud, all of that is done for you. It's maintained for you. You don't have to do it. You simply have to connect to an API that is hopefully stable. Um, and then you'll be able to pull those analytics out. If you do all that, if you automate all of that as your infrastructure, as your platform, then you'll be able to deliver on the examples like what's here, hybrid work, as a solution, but you also might be able to deliver on a couple of other examples too. Let's say you are wanting to serve a digital business or you are in a manufacturing plant and you wanna track all of your devices and your inventory across your, your uh, plant. Those are all examples of how by moving to this new structure, you'll be able to simplify. So how Cisco is thinking about that from, from that cloud operations model is three things. One, you have to have that automation, and that's, that is driven by the cloud. So simplifying those day-to-day -day tasks by creating an easily scalable way to do that. The second thing is the network insights. So we talked a little bit about analytics and being able to uh, pull the data out. Those network insights are now accessible across your entire infrastructure. This, the last thing I again mentioned is that API value creation. Those APIs are not only gonna be able to pull the data out, but you're going to be able to build different solutions and applications on top of your network using things like AI and ML in order to be able to deliver a solution to, to things that you might be trying to solve. And we know, I, Jonathan talked about this fact, that this is going to be a journey. For many of you, you may be on-prem right now. I'd like to uh, see, by a show of hands, how many of you have fully on-prem networks, Catalyst and maybe DNA Center, okay? How many of you are, um, are hybrid? How many of you maybe have Meraki and Catalyst, okay? And then lastly is, um, how many of you are fully on uh, the Meraki cloud platform? Okay, so not quite as many of you. Um, and then how many of you just really wanted to take a seat because the, the <laughs> that, uh, that concrete is hard to walk on. You need a, a break every now and then, right? Um, it's okay because this path is gonna be different for every one of you based on where you are, not only in this journey, but where you are in the, the journey to the cloud across your entire IT uh, strategy. 
And how we're going to help you in that journey is in three ways. One, if you are on premise and you have, uh, if you have the need to stay on premise, whether you have security issues or, or a business need that you might be driving towards, we are committed to Catalyst, we are committed to DNA Center, and that roadmap is going to continue far into the future. Um, in fact, you can even, uh, you can ev even do things like uh, VM, for uh, D DNA Center, which allows you to be self-hosted in the cloud of your DNA infrastructure. The next thing we're going to do is obviously, of course, we're going to continue to invest in the Meraki infrastructure, which will allow for those more scalable remote sites to be able to, to build as needed. But the majority of you raised your hands and the majority of customers that I've talked about are really those hybrid approaches where you have Catalyst and Meraki in your infrastructure and you're trying to see across both. Maybe you even have um, competitors uh, in your infrastructure. That's where we're going to introduce cloud monitoring. Cloud monitoring is going to allow you to see and scale across both your Catalyst and Meraki devices, uh, right, and we'll talk a little bit more about the details of that. Um, but you will be able to see and manage um, those devices in a unified way. And that's where that converged hardware, that cloud managed uh, for Catalyst, and the converged uh, and the, and the uh, cloud platform, which is, uh, which is the, the uh, cloud monitoring, come together. So we have a little bit of an example from a customer of ours who is actually in this journey himself. And why don't we go ahead and roll that tape so you can hear, oops, there we go. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service. Uh, we've been running for about a decade and hitting almost 20 different countries. So we have to provide meal kits that are healthy, correct portioned, um, and easy to cook. Because we're a global company, we are very far apart from, from our counterparts and employees. So having the cloud to have the applications in every region uh, without having a big footprint um, everywhere in terms of hardware is really great so we can get to what we need without the fuss of, of waiting around or, or having something physically there that we have to maintain and make sure that's available all the time. The biggest one recently has been able to get our Catalyst fleet into the, the monitoring as well, um, something very new and we wanted to try out, um, but having that has then kind of decreased the uh, issues of hopping into every single switch in our campus to find the problem. We now have that single pane of glass that, that everyone wants to, to dive in and have a uh, look at issues. I think the, the biggest advice is, is just to get in with, with whatever workload is the easiest for you to start. I think that that first step to kind of see how it works and see that it probably isn't as daunting as you think is is vital. So as soon as you get one in you'll try and get the next one in and, and you'll have that the path that you want to follow to, to get everything across the cloud and accessible everywhere, which is just kind of the ease that you want as, a, as an engineer. We're already starting to roll out these uh, larger smart warehouses uh, and they'll kind of utilize a, a lot more intelligence into how they want to do their production line stuff. I think right now is that opportunity to bring it all together, uh, not just have us as a platform and them as uh, taking uh, customers of that network. We want to be able to give them some insights into their stuff. If we can kind of sew it in and get Meraki and, and the IoT stuff to be one single pane of glass for their production and then us have one single pane of glass for our network management, uh, that makes just for a, a lot more ease in terms of looking at the solutions, getting automation around the data that they're getting and just making more sense of, of us together as both production team and a network support. It's a great story and it's really indicative of many of the customers that I've heard uh, talk about how they're starting to use monitoring. It's really about allowing the tier one and tier two uh, cus customer service to be able to support things in an easier, more scalable way, easier to, to take the time and requirements off of your most senior managers and senior leaders in order to be able to focus on the things that really matter. And that's the value of bringing together the number one in cloud management with Cisco Meraki and the number one across the board in networking with Catalyst is the drive towards the simplification of your day-to-day. -day. 
Now, the first step, as, as Damien talked about, how do you take that first step? Well, cloud monitoring, as I, as I said, is that first step. You may have heard Jonathan talk about it. That first step is available today to anybody with a DNA license immediately. You can leave here and go and sign up for cloud monitoring for all your catalyst switches. The next step towards full cloud management is moving your access points into a dual managed Wi-Fi 6E uh, access points. And those are also available as of a few months ago uh, and can be managed both by uh, DNA and by uh, the Meraki platform. The early field trials for cloud management with the Catalyst 9300s will begin over the next year, and cloud monitoring for the access points also over the next year to two years. So our convergence story does not end there. We have an exciting amount of security and networking convergence that Omri is going to discuss. Omri, why don't you come up stage and share it with us? Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. So you've heard from Rebecca about the benefits of convergence and experience simplification in access networks. Now I want to talk to you about how we extend this journey of convergence and simplification to SASE in order to unlock its true potential. IT teams today struggle with, it, with managing the complexity of applications that are no longer confined to the four walls of the data centers. Applications can run in public clouds, in private clouds, in colos, and even in SaaS applications. And this is compounded by today's hybrid work reality in which users can be anywhere. Users can be working from home. They can be working in an office location. They can be in a trade show like this. They can essentially be anywhere. So the traditional perimeter no longer exists. And the attack surface of organizations increases significantly. Add to that the fact that cybersecurity and cloud talent is in high demand and difficult to obtain. The IT environment today is more complex than ever. And organizations are less secure. So to help IT teams get ahead Cisco Plus Secure Connect, which we've launched six months ago, is our unified SASE solution. This solution converges and brings together Cisco's networking and security capabilities in order to deliver the outcomes that customers expect from SASE, which fundamentally boils down to connecting users wherever they are to applications and resources wherever these are. Leveraging, powered by the, the Cisco Meraki dashboard, we deliver a unified and streamlined experience that extends from premise to cloud. And powered by Cisco Umbrella, we deliver all the key security functions that you would expect, including secure web gateways, firewall, DLP, CASB, ZTNA, and remote access. Secure Connect unlocks the true promise of a unified SASE solution by creating this secure fabric that extends from cloud to premise, a fabric that connects users, branches, sites to private and public applications. And it delivers on the secure internet access and secure private access use cases. Now, when we designed and built Secure Connect, we had two core product principles in mind. Interconnect everything and security everywhere. Interconnect everything is a principle of simplicity. Anything that you connect and attach to this SASE fabric is inherently interconnected. And it is controlled by the policies that the customers set. Customers and admins don't need to worry about where resources are, what type of access technology is being used, it is all abstracted into this single consistent fabric. And beyond that, it also gives you, you know, future protection. So as new technologies emerge, once you connect them to this fabric, you gain all the benefits of this SASE fabric and the platform. Security Everywhere is essentially enabled 
by the notion of centralized management that is powered by the Meraki cloud management platform with distributed enforcement. Policies can be applied in the most optimal location. Again, providing a superior end user experience. You don't need to necessarily backhaul everything to a centralized location. And you can do that without losing visibility and, of course, without compromising your organizational security. With Secure Connect, we essentially extend the cloud edge all the way to the enterprise edge in order to also allow customers to benefit from their existing investments that they have in place. Now, with that, I'm also excited to announce that we are further extending the scope of Cisco Plus Secure Connect by adding support to Veptela SD-WAN. Veptela SD-WAN customers can enjoy all the benefits of Cisco Plus Secure Connect for both secure private access and secure internet access use cases. Connectivity of Cisco Veptela SD-WAN to this SASE fabric is done with just a few clicks of a button and with this principle of interconnecting everything, remote workers gain access to resources behind Veptela SD-WAN sites. And connectivity between Veptela SD-WAN sites and Meraki SD-WAN sites is also established. All managed and controlled through a single dashboard. So you can monitor your entire environment in the same place. This new capability will be available to Secure Connect customers for preview. Customers that have Vectela SD-WAN will be able to access it later this month. So with that, let's go to demo time. And I want to show you how easy and simple it is to integrate Viptela. So first, this is the overview page of Secure Connect. This page by itself brings together security and networking and, and everything you need to monitor in your environment. You can see your security threats across the organization. You can see the different policies. And in one place, you can look at your sites, you can look at your users, and you can also look at the different applications. Going into sites, and here, like in any good cooking show, we've already connected two SD-WAN sites for Meraki. Clicking on a site gives you, of course, access to the site. You can look at the details. You can look at the status of everything. And you can also look at the various security events related to this site. This is where you can also, and you're getting a preview of the ability to look at how we enforce things between premise and cloud. You can see that certain things are blocked at the premise, certain things are blocked in the cloud, and again, this is done seamlessly. Now, to add a Viptela SD-WAN site for private connectivity, all I need to do is go through simple wizard, add the name of the site, click through it, and I get a summary of what needs to be done. I also have access to the commands, and I can easily copy them and paste them through vManage. And once I save and I go back to my Secure Connect dashboard, I have one step, which I have to do once on the first side that I connect, and I need to configure BGP in order to enable private connectivity. And again, very simple, easy. And once this is done, you can monitor and sites go up. Customers that already have an integration of Veptela SD-WAN with Umbrella for secure internet access can import this, these sites with a single click of a button. So just by adding and discovering those connections, we add them to the same dashboard. So you can monitor your entire environment from one place, look at your sites, look at the health of your sites, and the other good thing is that you can start applying policies. So here I'll just go through a simple process of showing you how a single policy, which enables access to a company dashboard, an internal application, a private application. This application, by the way, sits behind a Vectela site. Again, the admins don't need to think where this application is. All they need to set is this policy. And from a user perspective, the experience is Seamless. It needs to be transparent. All they need to do is to click on the link for their private dashboard. They can log in. Here we did not turn on MFA, so we just go through a regular process, and that's it. They get that. 
Simple. So to recap, Cisco Plus Secure Connect provides this unified and seamless experience that is easy to deploy and simple to operate. It removes the complexity and increases the visibility that you have across your organization. Some of our customers were able to deploy SASE in as little as two hours. It empowers IT teams to securely connect remote users at any point of service and enable work from anywhere. And in a recent discussion that I had with one of our customers, sh they shared with me that they can now onboard remote users, and I'll quote, 10x faster than before. It builds also greater network security and resiliency, improving your overall organization's security posture with continuous visibility into threats. So teams can better respond to unpredicted events and to changes which we know are part of our day-to-day -day reality. Fundamentally, it empowers organizations to confidently navigate their SASE journey with this single turnkey solution that is built on the Cisco Meraki platform, which converges and brings together networking and security to create a unified and simple yet powerful experience. So let's also hear from one of our customers on how Cisco Plus Secure Connect helps them with their digital transformation journey. Milwaukee Electronics is a current Meraki customer of ours, and in trying to improve their security posture, they identified that SASE would actually really fill this gap. Milwaukee Electronics is a family-owned business founded in 1954. We're on the path to becoming a leader in our market space for innovative electronics manufacturing. Today, we've got electronics at the bottom of the ocean in uh, National Geographic's cameras, and we've even got electronics up in space in the Mars Perseverance rover. We had several challenges that led to our partnership with Cisco. Supply chain issues in the market to acquire new infrastructure technology, and the desire to get a security architecture that would meet our customers' expectations and regulatory requirements. The company came to us and said, hey, we need you to find a solution that works. We can't take these random outages. We can't run a business this way. We need something reliable and dependable, and Cisco is our solution. We picked Cisco Plus Secure Connect because it covered many different needs that we had as an organization. It could do the remote connection for us, it could do DNS and web filtering, and it allowed us to apply the same security principles across not only our physical locations, but to any remote workers we had, no matter where they are. Cisco showed Milwaukee Electronics how easy it was to deploy Cisco Plus Secure Connect across sites and users in a matter of a few clicks. Implementing this solution lets me maximize my IT team's resources, it positions the business for scalable growth, and it lets us focus on flexing to our customers' diverse needs. The services provided by Cisco Plus Secure Connect are critical to our organization, allowing us to expand our security footing and reduce risk to the organization as a whole. My mission as the company's security and technology leader is to guide us through a digital transformation. Knowing that that begins with a solid foundation for execution, we implemented Cisco Meraki's network infrastructure solution and paired that with Cisco's SASE solution. That let us empower our digitally distributed workforce with the ability to work securely on our critical applications from anywhere at any time. Okay. okay, so whatever is driving your transformation infrastructure, whether you are like Milwaukee, where you are trying to pull together that security and network, or like HelloFresh, where you're tr simply trying to scale and streamline and, uh, and uh, f help with those networking operations, we really are investing in simplification, simplification at Cisco in order to help you deliver that seamless hybrid work experience build security resiliency across your organization, automate operations, and of course, create those new customer experiences. With Cisco's networking platforms, you can accelerate and we can help you on that journey. Thank you all so much. Make sure that if you would like to hear some more information, you can scan the QR code or attend any of these sessions for more details. Thank you. Do the outro. Thank <laughs> you.
All right, hello and welcome back. If you've just joined us for Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam, uh, we just had a great innovation talk from Rebecca Stone and Omri, and they were um, talking a little bit around hybrid work and simplifying the network experience. So that was really great to hear as well. Now, um, they are going to head over to the studio, so stay tuned because Steve is going to be chatting uh, to them as soon as they arrive. But I just want to remind you in the meantime, um, if you are experiencing Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam from here in Amsterdam, um, or if you're watching from home, let us know how you're getting on. You can do that by using hashtag Cisco Live and at Cisco Live. Um, and if you're watching on Cisco Live.com, which we recommend as the best viewing experience, we have some emojis um, on the screen there. So let us know. Thumbs up if you're having fun. Um, and we want to see, you know, see what, how you're experiencing it. If you're at home, your cat or your dog is sat on your lap, we want to see that as well. I know I've had pictures of my dog watching me, so that's quite fun. <laughs> um, Remember as well, for the first time ever, we are translating and we have captions for seven languages. So it really is, you know, making sure that the event is as inclusive as possible. And let's talk a little bit around what we just saw. It's around a reality of a changing work every day and how we have to adapt to new ways to work. So it was really great to hear from Rebecca. I know we have Cedric out. He is out with Grant, one of our guests. So Cedric, uh, tell us, you know, introduce Grant and let us know what you have to share. Hey there, Nish. Like, I am still here in the Cisco Unified Experience Zone. And I also got on brand. Like, you know, I got a really nice jacket from the Cisco Enterprise Networking team. I'm still here. As I said, we're going bad butts, best butts, right, Grant? So here you are once again. Good to see you again. How are things going? Great. No, they're going, they're going great. We just heard from Rebecca in the uh, innovation uh, talk uh, about cloud management for Catalyst. It's really important these days. It's a focus for Cisco. So can you tell us why is that important? Yeah, absolutely. Cloud monitoring and cloud management for Catalyst is one of the first steps that we were taking towards delivering that cloud operating model for our customers. So it's giving everyone who's running a Catalyst network uh, the ability to see, inspect, and in many cases troubleshoot switches across their sites and locations. Awesome, great. So I think it would be really cool if you could just like give us a quick, quick demo of like how that actually works. Great. And anyone can come down and get this demo. We love to show it off. Uh, but what we have up here on the screen is a Catalyst switch, a 9300, that is currently being monitored in the Meraki dashboard. It's located in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So we're looking around the world as we speak. But from this, in a single view, I get the ability to see not only all of the traffic running across the switch, which clients are connected, uh, but ultimately even port level detail into the traffic that is flowing. So instead of having to go into your CLI or navigate into a complex interface, my tier one and tier two support can instantly see where a problem might be, where I can optimize and deploy services and support as needed, or even fix it from where I sit. Great, so like it seems really, really interesting. It seems very technical, I have to say, for me, but like I'm sure it's super simple. Like, But um, so Grant, like, can you tell us a little bit more, like we heard from Rebecca, now we've seen a little bit of a demo. How are customers using this today? Right. Well, I think where they're using it starts with that idea of it is simple, right? We're taking that ethos of the Meraki simplicity and bringing it to the entire portfolio. So anyone can dig in and start managing these switches. Uh, one of our customers yesterday uh, runs an electronics wholesaling business and they have 150 locations uh, centered in Denmark, but around the world. They have a team of five people in IT. And so they are using cloud monitoring to give their tier one and tier two support instant access to networks around the world. Uh, and then they can bring in their higher powered support. But it's allowing them to scale their services and deliver a much better unified experience around the world to customers, employees, and partners. And we're seeing that in retail, we're seeing it in education, and we're even starting to see it in healthcare and other places. It's really, really powerful. So you're just saying that only five people in the IT department manage so many devices with the cloud managing for Catalyst part? Yes, we have customers managing upwards of 800 switches through this single dashboard around the world and with the smallest possible IT teams you can, you can think of. Like, this is amazing, right? Like, just with a small IT team using Cisco technology, you can just manage. Like, this is a cost reduction part uh, that is just awesome to hear about. Um, so thank you so much, Grant. Um, we are still here in the Cisco um, experience. I'm just going to like wander around a little bit more and kind of have a look of what we have here um, behind us with the sensors uh, and so on as well. So let's just kind of have a look a little bit here. Um, sorry. 
So here, um, we just have some, like, we have some sensors over here. Like, I'm going to talk to this gentleman here. Like, can you explain us a little bit more about the sensors here and how it actually connects with the enterprise networking portfolio that we offer? Sure, with, with pleasure. So what we have here is several different sensors that we have. All of them are part of the Meraki portfolio, which means all of them, all of the information will be on the Meraki dashboard. We have these sensors such as temperature and humidity sensors. We have air quality sensors. We have door opening sensors. Um, and all of that integrates directly into the dashboard, which means if we ha if we want to have a door open trigger um, a door open trigger uh, the camera to take a snapshot and send it over Webex to the to the security officer that would ha that can happen very easily through the dashboard. That's awesome! Like that's a lot of triggers here. Um, we're going to go back to the studio right now with Nish. So Nish, over to you. Thank you so much, Cedric. So we're here back in the studio. We're going to have Rebecca and Omru, who just did an innovation talk. They're here in the studio with Steve. So hold on for a second for that. But just a reminder on a little bit about what they talked about around how our world is changing every single day. We're all seeing it. We're all feeling it as well. And that's really requiring us to change the way that we work. So modernizing infrastructure is the first step, right? But we're talking about IT agility. And I know that Rebecca, Omri, and Steve are going to chat about that now. So Steve, over to you and your guests. Let's well, get behind thank the you so much, my friend. I am right next door to you in Studio B. Um, thanks for the great setup on this. I do appreciate it. So we just came out of the fantastic iTalk just a moment ago. And I am so glad to have Rebecca Stone and Omri Gelfand here with me. And thanks for running straight on over. I appreciate it. You're being so game. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It was good for a workout. I haven't, I haven't gotten my run in today. So. Oh, that's good. So we're going to go later as well. Yes, right? we already exactly. Have Let's do up. it. What did you think of the iTalk? How did it go? Did you enjoy doing it? Uh, what was the audience response like? Give us your feedback. Why don't you go first? Well, first of all, it was it was a blast. You know, we had a great fun, shared with the audience what we're doing on converging and bringing together networking and security. Definitely resonated. We saw a lot of you know happy faces. You know, good response from the audience. Yeah, I think we got some good applause at the end, yeah. right? And yeah. lots of cameras. I, you always can tell when the cameras are up and they're taking pictures of the slides. That's when you know it's a good event. So. That's how you yeah. know that they're absolutely and totally connected exactly. to you, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, so I really enjoyed it as well. I got a chance to watch. When we talk about simplifying the network infrastructure, right? When we talk about simplifying our customers' IT transformation capabilities, this is core to what we do. You're our Senior VP of Customer Solutions Marketing. Um, Amri, you are our VP of Product Management for SASE NAS and uh, Cisco Meraki. When we look at cloud management for the Catalyst portfolio, if we were to focus on that, it really does enable our customers' path to converged hardware, right? It's it helping does. their IT deliver on all this promise of agility that we make, the promise of simplicity, right? Yeah. So how does that actually play out? How do we deliver on the promise? I guess that's the good question. Yeah, I think, um, so I think there's two steps to it. One is one is cloud monitoring, which is really the first step for a lot of the customers that I've spoken to, at least. Um, there is There are customers who have Catalyst in their networks, and they're, they're kind of either testing out Meraki or they have Meraki in their branches, and the monitoring allows them to have visibility across both without going to two different dashboards. And that is a simplification in and of itself that, that our customers have really expressed um, delight with, um, to be quite honest with you. And then we have management. And so management is really about our access points right now, today, uh, and having that dual management mode. Either you can do DNA Center or Meraki for those access points. And that allows you the flexibility to fit them into the infrastructure that works best for you. And then over time, you'll be able to monitor that entire network um, as, as one holistic thing. So that's that's really the journey we're both going on together, our customers and Ca and Cisco themselves. Absolutely, and it is day-to-day -day practical application. Absolutely. And we can really come back to that enough. We can talk about these in theory, but what can yep. people actually do with yes. it, right? So Omri, um, on that security side, right? Let's take the same approach. What are our customers experiencing today in their real world? What do they love about Cisco Plus Secure Connect from your point of view? Yeah, great question. Uh, I, I think to start this, we are really bringing together the security world and the networking world as and, and converge it. Now, again, today in a lot of the solutions, customers struggle to secure and manage their environment. Applications go anywhere. They can, you know, they're not in the four walls of the data center anymore. They go to public cloud, private clouds, colos, and users are also anywhere. So IT teams really struggle to keep up with securing and managing this environment. 
With Tesco Plus Secure Connect, and this is one of the things that customers love about it, we're bringing it all together into a common operational model. And when you think of it, it's, it's really you know, a challenging task to do because we're trying to mix two worlds that are very, very different. Yes. A networking world is all about connecting things together. Where in a security world, you know, you're safe and secure when you're isolated, when everything stays in the right place. Sure. So bringing this together to the Meraki dashboard allows customers to strike the right balance between securing and also connecting everything in a seamless way. And of course, get all the benefits of an operational model, this cloud monitoring, this cloud management that extends from cloud to premise. Perfectly put, perfectly put. Um, I want to get both of your feedback. Talk a little bit about how our Meraki dashboard is creating an easier experience for every single Cisco customer. Um, and Rebecca, start off and I'm going to just jump on board. Yeah. Let's make it a little free I think for we're all. Both, we both have a long history in, with the Meraki dashboard. So, I, I mean, I love talking to the Meraki customers because they get so passionate about how easy it is to use. And, and really it is. Like I've talked to probably five or six customers just yesterday um, that were talking about the fact that you know, they've been been able to scale their operations, you know, with maybe two, three IT um, networking operations managers to be able to do global deployments um, in less time than they could previously. So they actually are able to then take those network operations managers and put them on other projects that allow them to deliver a better user experience to, uh, to their customers, to their employees. And, and that's, I think, really the benefit of, of being able to do a cloud managed platform like Meraki. Absolutely. And, and, and along the same line, you know, when we think of SASE, it is enabling customers to focus on doing the more routine activities on a day-to-day -day basis. It does give you better control and better visibility to security threats. And of course, that allows your teams to start focusing on higher value items. So doing more with less is definitely a very, very important narrative that we see. The other benefit is that we are leveraging the Meraki platform to not only manage the security policies in the cloud, but leverage customers' existing investments mm. in their on-prem equipment, you know, the hardware, the software that they've invested, and leverage those capabilities to streamline that service delivery all the way from premise to cloud, essentially creating this fabric that gives you that ability to scale and deliver a better user experience at the end of the day. Really is a perfect gap. Yeah. yeah, I just I was just gonna say we heard Jonathan talk about the blanket in the keynote and then the warm, all the yeah, exactly the warm, blanket. cozy exactly. fabric blanket, right? <laughs> fabric, it's all about fabric. <laughs> it's all about fabric. And you know, the doing more with less, I feel like that could be now the theme, that could be the epitaph for every company in yeah. the world. How do we do more with less and how do we leverage, properly leverage what we've already owned, what we've already made the investment in, yeah. and for Cisco that that is so important. Um, you talked about the cloud operating model yes. during your iTalk. Why is cloud monitoring such a critical step right now in the journey to a cloud operating model? I think it's exactly what you just talked about, which is that there are already investments being made in infrastructure today with Catalyst and with on-prem environments. And in order to be able to help our customers transition in a way that doesn't mean a rip and replace of everything that they have, we are allowing them to take the steps over time to get them into a place where they're more comfortable. It also helps with the training of the staff who may know how to use one application and needs to be trained on, on now the new application. And I know there's lots of opportunity <laughs> for training, both on Meraki and DNAC um, here. So uh, so yeah, it, it, allows the, it allows the customer to take the journey the way that they need to. And it empowers them to make the decisions in their network that are right for them. And they are the drivers. They we really are. can't lay into that enough. Amri, I wanted to ask you, um, IT leaders, they have to deliver on the security needs of their businesses, it's got to be core. How do our products here at Cisco, maybe even Cisco Plus Secure Connect as a good example, how do we help them make sure that they can actually get that done and deliver the way they have to deliver? Well, maybe it's important to talk about what's different with Cisco Plus Secure Connect. There are a lot of SASE solutions today in the market. Typically you see those SASE solutions as solutions that bring this cloud management model, this cloud operating model, to a secure services edge which sits in the cloud and integrates with different SD-WANs. Mm -hmm. 
Integration is not convergence. With Cisco Plus Secure yeah. Connect, we are essentially taking this cloud operating model, leveraging what Meraki solved really, really well by taking cloud management and bringing it all the way to the premise. Mm. So one of the differentiations that we bring with Cisco Plus Secure Connect is a new way to think and reimagine re SASE and really unlock its potential. Instead of bringing everything to the cloud, we take the cloud and we make it pervasive. We extend it all the way to the edge and that ties back into that investment protection and leveraging the current assets, but it will also translate into the end user experience mm. because you're not adding unnecessary bumps in the wire and the most important thing is you're not jeopardizing your visibility with the monitoring capabilities as well as your security posture of the organization. Wow, Amri, that is such good storytelling around our, around our security infrastructure, right? Oh, I wish we could do this forever. I want to end with a customer success story that maybe everybody tuning into the stream would really get benefit from and that they would get excited about. So what have each of you seen where you said, yes, there, that is why we do what we do? Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to interview a customer at HelloFresh at Cisco Live Melbourne who uh, shared just a really amazing story about how they are truly all in on this integration and cloud journey and using the, the uh, technology that we have available in the right places at the right time. Mm -hmm. And what's so great is they said, you know, the Cisco Meraki stuff helps me hand off a lot of those um, easier tasks to the junior members of the team that um, that I can just let them go and troubleshoot and figure out. And that gives me the time to really think about the higher level strategic things, the way that we're growing our business, the way that we're scaling, how we're expanding. And that's really what it's all about. I think giving back time, simplifying that experience for our IT uh, users and, and, uh, and, like, and our customers in order to be able to just free up the time to do some of the strategic things for the business. Such good human storytelling. Omri, same thing. Uh, so <clears throat> I'd like to focus on the outcome. So one of our customers and is, is a legal firm, George Sinclair, and they have had the challenge of connecting different attorneys that are spread across multiple states. So I'll jump to the, to the outcomes. When speaking to their CIO, he shared with me that with Cisco Plus Secure Connect, they were able to now onboard remote users, and I'll quote, 10x faster than before. And they also wanted to be able to solve challenges in migrating and dealing with disaster recovery of different sites. They're in regions that have a lot of disturbances and hurricanes, so they have to migrate their operations from one place to another. And with Cisco Plus Secure Connect, being a cloud-delivered solution with cloud management, they're now able to actually do this within a matter of hours, and in the past it took them days to do some of those things, and including you know, experiencing outages as part of that. So again, I, I, I love focusing on the outcome because that's the bottom line, and of course, it did solve for the efficiencies, and it liberated the CIO to start focusing on higher value items. Fantastic, again, <clears throat> very, very applicable, very now, very, very current. Uh, great stories, both of you. I, again, I wish we could do this for a longer period of time. I always love these uh, conversations, but Rebecca Stone, Omri Gelfand, thank you both so much for a great eye talk. Thank you for joining us here in the, uh, in the studio, and I hope we'll get more of an opportunity to talk with one another. Awesome, thank awesome. you. Awesome, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Nish, we're going to head back over to you in Studio A. Thank you so much, Steve. You know, you really pulled out some golden nuggets out of Rebecca and Omri. I think it's the music to a lot of our ears. I think something that really stood out was how they talked about how you could simplify with technology and you could do it in a sustainable way with what you already have. You're not ripping out everything. You're not starting from scratch and just really finding ways to optimize the way that, you know, the people strategy um, and everything around that as well. So thank you so much, Steve, Rebecca and Omri. Now, uh, we've still got lots to come, so uh, stay tuned with us. We've got a session on identifying internet problems before they become end user problems. And then obviously we have as well, we've been talking a lot about hybrid work, so a session around the next chapter of hybrid work with Snorri and Larissa Horton as well. So stay tuned for that.
Great. Well, we're going to switch gears now a little bit with Cisco Live, but I just want to remind you as well, if you are joining us, whether you're here in person or whether you're at home, do use hashtag Cisco Live and at Cisco Live Amir to let us know how much fun you're having at this year's event. The best way to watch the stream at home is on CiscoLive.com. So use those emojis that you see as well. Thumbs up, hearts, whatever you're feeling on how you want to express your enjoyment and excitement for the show as well. Now, for the first time, we're also um, translating. We've got captions for seven languages. So I love that we're making this event more inclusive and we can reach more people um, as well. Now, the shift we're going to make is talking more about sustainability and net zero solutions. And obviously, the hybrid work um, strategy and everything that we've been talking about through the keynote and right through to now as well is going to be a great way to do that. Now, I don't think it's a secret, sadly, that we are all facing a global energy crisis. And we continue to have prolonged challenges with things like climate change, and we need to find ways to reduce the energy consumption. So this is what this uh, session is all going to be about. And you'll see sustainability is a really hot topic at Cisco Live. So let's take a look at this video on how Cisco is going to help make buildings more sustainable with Cisco smart building solutions. Humans and nature. We're in this together. Yet nature has given and given. It's our turn to do more. Cisco Smart Building Solutions and our partners' technology benefit both humans and nature. Catalyst switches connect securely, delivering power over Ethernet, reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. Cisco wireless and DNA spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet. And collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. All right, I need to speak to our brand team to see where that was filmed because it looks absolutely stunning. It's somewhere where I definitely want to go for a nice walk and a hike as well. Speaking of steps, we've spent a lot of time walking around and I know in the world of solutions as well, um, we have Rob Boyd or the yes, Rob Boyd. So Rob, you have do. a guest and you're talking about UCS X series. Over to you, Rob. Thank you so much, Nish. Yes, we are here. And if you look at the side, Cisco UCS X series, like what is this going to be about? How is this about su sustainability? Well, this is about sustainability from a grassroots level all the way through the supply chain. What is Cisco doing? What are some examples perhaps about things that are being done that just help the entire equation? And with that, I want to introduce Hasib, who's going to walk us through some very interesting things that have been done here, both with UCS X and how mm -hmm. it's helping us achieve these sustainability goals. Hasib? Right. Thank you, Rob. Um, so Cisco UCS X series is a modular system which was designed with sustainability in mind. So something which I want to point out right in the beginning is, I don't know if you, how well can, you can see it, this is a mid-plane free design. So what that means is, that besides the minimal power distribution in the mid-plane, there is no switching intelligence in the chassis itself. So what that helps us with is you have your compute nodes in the front, you have your GPU nodes in the front, you have uh, intelligent fabric in the back, and these connect together. And the chassis is not part of that uh, switching at all. Okay, now we all know that your CPUs, GPUs, your fabric, the refresh cycles are all misaligned, right? They never align, line up, and it's very common. This chassis would allow you to only upgrade the component which you need to upgrade. If your new generation of processor comes in, just like Intel Sapphire Rapids, you just need to replace the compute node. New GPU comes in, you just need to replace the GPU node. And if a new fabric comes in, then you will just go in the back and replace the intelligent fabric modules. Uh, so this reduces the e-waste. So if this was a rack server, every time a new generation of processor comes in, what you would do is you would go in and order a new system. The system also includes the power supplies, it includes the fans, it includes a new chassis. You don't have to do that in X-Series. So these fans and the uh, chassis as well as the power supplies, they should last you throughout the life of your uh, X-Series. 
Different needs when it comes to power, uh, well, compute versus data storage. These things are constantly in flux. This, we're just constantly eliminating the amount of hardware that's required, but without giving up the modularity. In fact, it almost feels like you're increasing the modularity as you move some decisions into software and, um, and as well as into the cloud. But what about power and cooling? Are we still making advancements in terms of how we use those resources? Right, that's a very good question. So this chassis has sensors distributed all across the chassis. And that combined with our intelligent algorithms for the fans, we can control the speed of the fans on the fly. So we have what we call zone-based cooling. If a zone is running hotter, the fans will actually run higher at a higher speed. If a zone is cooler, they'll run at a lower speed. And something else which I wanted to mention is go back to the mid-plane free design. As you can see, you can just see right through the chassis, which means that you can run your fans at a lower speed and still provide very efficient cooling. And running fan at a lower speed means obviously we're consuming a lot less power. And last thing which I actually wanted to highlight was that these power supplies, if you don't need that much power in the chassis, if you're, it's a night time, your workload isn't consuming a lot of power, we will shut down some of these oh, power supplies yeah. and put them to sleep, actually. Yeah, because just even on standby, those things are going to be drawing power, but let's take them out of the equation. Final thing real quick, in a minute or so, uh, tell me about how customers are leveraging, what's the management interface like this? Right look like in terms of making it work for them? So our UCSX series is managed through our uh, management platform called Intersight, Cisco Intersight. So Cisco Intersight, one of the, it's a policy-driven platform, and one of the main goals of Cisco Intersight was to pass on all these controls to the customers. So I have a screen pulled up over here. We have separate policies, one for power, the one which you see right here, which allows you to do the things which we just talked about, putting, the, uh, putting it in a power save mode where the power supplies will actually go and sleep. We have thermal policies which allows you to control your fan speed. You can choose to run your fans at a lower speed, better acoustics, and so on and so forth. And to wrap everything up, every blade has its own BIOS policies, which is power and performance. And we can actually control the power to the blade and give you the optimal settings so that you can get the most out of a CPU at the least amount of the power. Well, that makes sense. Thank you, Aviv. I appreciate that, Hasib. <laughs> but guys, this is this is really about uh, sustainability from that grassroots level, as I spoke about. And you sometimes think, well, it's just a singular box, but you think about how customers are deploying these, and this really adds up quickly. So having this granularity of control at the data center level, if you will, is really where we begin to make a difference as we move control up into the cloud, but we still have to execute physically uh, down on the field. But Nish, we'll go back to you. Thank you so much, Rob. I know Steve and I were talking about the UCSX series earlier. Uh, sustainability is obviously a really hot topic here at Cisco Live, and actually to see how you can have the power, I guess, of choice and choosing, swapping things in and out. It's a bit like Lego, right? You get to play around with it a little bit, which is quite fun. Um, and then, of course, by doing that, you're reducing the e-waste. There's so many power-saving um, benefits as well, and, of course, flexibility to really customize it to what you need. Um, now, just a reminder, if you're joining here live or you're watching from home, use hashtag Cisco Live and at Cisco Live um, to let us know what your experience is looking like. I know we're about to go into the um, innovation talk with Denise Lee. She is our VP of Sustainability for Engineering, and she'll be joining us in the studio later as well. But before we even head to that talk, Rob, I know you're still in the world of solutions. You've got so much to see around you. What, what's the atmosphere like right now? Tell me about it. Atmosphere is great. I just, why we're here, moment, Steve, don't back up too far. I was just going to point out, this is where we just were talking about UCSX. This is behind kind of this, if you've seen the bicycles kind of in the center, this is for people who are here. But nonetheless, you can get an idea just with the signs up here, just how much detail is available, how many experts are available. As we uh, pull back over here, actually, I'm going to just tease, because this is not an area I'm super familiar with. We're going to be featuring this, I think, later in the week but they've got a full bicycle team out here, but it's not about the bicycle team, it's about how we're working with, I think it's a Dutch cycling team, that how we're working with them from a, um, a call center, contact center environment to really enable them to, to interact both with their own teams as well as their customers, however they need. If we pan around here, just to give you a feel, You'll see, the, you'll see the duck pond. This is the sustainability messaging all the way through here. This is against the entire back wall, most of the Cisco stuff. And as I mentioned earlier, if you happen to catch it, their partner solutions out here give you the ability to kind of jump back and forth and test what you're being told and what you think is going to work and this kind of thing. You should be able to get all your answers while you're out here. But I encourage you also to come down here. We've got more customer experience things happening. If you get all the way down, we're going to be talking about the Metabus in just a moment. But I think I'm throwing back to Nish. And so with that, Nish, I'm going to go ahead and let you go to the studio before we go to the innovation talk. Thanks for the time. 
<laughs> Thanks so much, Rob. Now, this is a topic that I'm really passionate about, sustainability. That's the innovation talk we're about to head into. And the session is called Accelerate Your Journey to Net Zero with Cisco Solutions. Now, whether you're at the start of your sustainability story, whether you're right towards you know, a really mature um, uh, sustainability strategy, there are ways that Cisco can help you do that. And in this talk, they're going to be talking about how Cisco is uh, marrying or, or meeting together the ideas of sustainability or technology. Uh, gone are the days you know, when we are choosing between what's good for business and what's good for the world, and this is really how we can do both. Now, Denise Lee, who's our VP of our Sustainability Engineering Office, is going to be joined by Jeremy Foster. They're going to discuss how our Cisco solutions are helping to reduce energy consumption, a reduction of greenhouse gases, emissions and waste, and energy efficiency and of course more circular business models which is really key as well so we're about to head out to the innovation talk and um, just before we do that actually let me just highlight there's a little bit around green and networking as well this is something that they're going to be talking about in the talk and how Cisco's end-to-end -end architecture across all of our portfolio is going to help with that circular consumption now, what this means is that you can adopt our sustainability practices, find practical ways to implement some of them into the significant source of emissions. Over to the innovation talk now. I have been waiting for a really long time to ask this audience one question. How many people are familiar with scope accounting? Hold on, keep them up. So I've asked this question now for about a year, and in the various places I go, I get a lot of blank stares, maybe one or two hands, but this region, as the slide and the data here shows, is supposed to be far out ahead. This region of the world is leading in our journey to net zero. From regulatory perspective, from a technology perspective. And it's so exciting to be here in this region, back in person, to be able to ask that question. If you're not familiar with scope accounting, we're not gonna go into too much detail, but what I will simply say, it's a great way to get grounded into understanding what it means to get to net zero. It's a common denominator where all languages and organizations and companies are learning how to count greenhouse gas emissions in a way that provides checks and balances. The one thing you need to know about scope accounting, if you don't already know it, it's that Cisco's scope three, we have three scopes in scope accounting, is our customers and partners scope two. That's how these things are balanced, right? So in order for Cisco, when we say we're gonna get to net zero by 2040, and you may be part of companies and organizations that have put your own goals and commitments, in order for us to make those commitments, it has to be done together. So we recently launched an IDC study. Uh, it came, or we recently got the results back. We launched it quite some time ago. And globally, the data has come back to validate that yes, in fact, Western Europe is ahead in its importance of sustainability. The biggest driver of that is being, it's, that is to do good for the people, the planet, and its employees. So good on you. This region cares about its people, the planet, and its employees. Now, we see more and more organizations making commitments to net zero, making commitments to sustainability. And yet, Accenture came out with a study that said, of all of those organizations, 93% are on track to fail. They're on track to fail because based on their progress to get to net zero by these dates, they're nowhere close to need needing to um, have actionable plans, metrics in place to actually get there. So what does that mean for us today? Cisco feels not only a responsibility, but an obligation at the intersection of sustainability and technology. In the last couple of years, we have continued to ramp up our dedication and our programs and our commitment to sustainability. We've committed to net zero by 2040, which you've hopefully seen um, in today's keynote. Our goals and our plans have been approved by the Science-Based Target Initiative, which is considered one of the gold standards of the industry. We are one of the first technology companies to have our plans approved. We're part of the European Green Digital uh, co uh, Coalition. We've put money in Cisco's foundation to specifically go after sustainability in all of adjacent markets and, and innovations outside of our immediate focus areas so that we can bring everyone along together. And with our Global Problem Solver Challenge and our partner organization, we're investing in 
solutions, hackathons, programs. Um, this last one recently uh, came out with Rockwell as one of the um, key innovators on a water leakage detection program, right? So again, where are we solving for in real time with our extended ecosystems and partners? When I think about how does this technology scale, we aim to do one thing in our commitment in our portfolio. And it's A, to keep it very simple for these ecosystems to bring everyone along because we recognize that everyone is at different stages of this journey. And so I'm going to walk you through three key solutions. And these solutions are here to stay. We are building long-term roadmaps against these solutions in our products, in our offers, and how we bring these to market. It's going to take time. So while the innovations inside of these solutions may come out as new and exciting, every time you see us, every event we have, these solutions will stay intact. The first is sustainable data centers. And Jeremy will be here to walk you through in detail what that, the, what that looks like. And hopefully, it's no big, no big question as to why we're starting with sustainable data centers. The second is the built environment and smart buildings and workspaces. And we think about the intersection of hybrid work that we need to enable, the intersection of how we're building um, and all the materials that go into creating buildings. There's a lot of opportunity in this space. The third solution is really making sure that in every place of the ecosystem of, of every layer of the internet, all the way down to the service providers and how we provide internet for the future, that we are looking at every possible place in the network to build sustainable and scalable technology and solutions. Underpinning all of that, of course, are sustainability, or er, sorry, are industry solutions and what I'm calling ecosystems. Think about the broader ecosystems that come to play when we start to expand beyond the IT networks to the OT networks and beyond. These ecosystems of partners are newer than what we've seen in the past. Clean tech and all of the expanded additional TAM that we'll start to see becomes very, very interesting when you consider how much investment is going into this area. Just last week here in the EU, there was an announcement around the Green Deal. Between the Green Deal and the US uh, Inflation uh, Infrastructure Act, there is cited over $1 trillion in the clean tech industry. $1 trillion of investment, and that all goes into the solutions like these. So without further ado, um, I am very happy to introduce uh, Jeremy Foster to take you through sustainable data centers. Thank you, Denise. There's some folks back there looking in. Feel free to come in, grab a seat. Let's cram in here and talk a little about two of my favorite things, sustainability and the data center. Now, when you think about the space and what the data centers have done for us, they've done some amazing things. Like imagine your life if you didn't have the data center. Phone wouldn't be very good, It'd be a lot different. But it also uses an amazing amount of energy. And that's why it's such a great place to start making a big dent in those initiatives that Denise was talking about at the beginning. It's the big blue bar there, by the way, at the bottom. So how do you put that into motion? Well, the first thing is you want to work with vendors like Cisco who build our equipment from the word go to be sustainable. And we'll talk about that. The second thing is you don't have to deploy that equipment. <laughs> and so how do you take advantage of that biggest consolidation possible in your data centers as you go through it. And the last thing is when the fun really starts, which is once you get through the deployment, now you have to manage that data center. And what about sustainability? And how do you do that? And how do you keep that top of mind for the next five years? Well, we'll start with the basic building blocks and some of the things that we're building. This is Nexus 9800. It's a new 400 gig switch. It's part of a new 400 gig lineup. And 400 gigs great, 100 gigs great. What it'll allow you to do is reduce the number of ports you have, which automatically is going to help you reduce the amount of power that you're using, which makes sense. But this is using Silicon One, which is new technology that we're bringing throughout the entire Nexus lineup, which is very power efficient. Just an example of the types of things we want to build so that as you select building blocks, you know you're going to end up in a great spot. The next one is UCS. UCS X is the most sustainable server platform on the planet. There's a million features, uh, more than I can talk to you about right now. Of course, it has things like 100 gig end-to-end -end networking, again, reducing the amount of ports. It has 60 different zones for cooling. 
so that as you're actually using the system, it's smart enough to know where does it need to cool down and cools down where it needs to as opposed to just having all the fans going all the time and not being super efficient. So there's a, this has been our fastest selling server platform ever and it's something that we keep at top of mind is sustainability when we're engineering equipment. So we just wanted to talk through those briefly. Uh, deployment. So what's it look like when a customer deploys these types of solutions? Uh, we'll take this large financial customer as an example. Almost exactly as Denise described, they have net zero initiative 2035, trying to figure out how do you sort through the data center and, and, and move through this in phases. The first phase was 500 servers. Those 500 servers were about two to three generations old. Uh, and, and when you look at the consolidation ratios and the type of outcome that they're able to deliver, I mean, the results are huge. So if you take today's modern equipment, you're talking about this customer going from 500 servers down to 136 servers. That's basically two thirds reduction in the amount of physical space required inside of that data center. But what's even better about that is they also saved all the other things that you need to support the environment, like the software costs, 27% off the software that is associated with operating that environment, 39% off the maintenance and support within that environment, ultimately yielding 31% reduction in the overall amount of power that they would be using inside the data center. So while you may be thinking, wow, these, these are big numbers, but you said 500 servers, that's a lot of servers. The ratios I'm talking about, the numbers you see on the screen, doesn't matter why, whether you apply them to 50 servers or 500 or 5,000 servers, that's what the technology drives are those kinds of consolidation ratios that you should expect as you're looking at modernizing. Now, how do you operate that environment? And this is a lot of new stuff here that we've really been working on. I think something you should be looking at as you're looking at the tooling and the infrastructure as well is how do I operate it and how do I keep sustainability at top of mind? How many people are familiar with Intersight? A lot of the folks up front. Um, so what is Intersight? Intersight is our infrastructure management platform that covers compute, compute fabric, and networking together. And what Intersight really does is it's a SaaS-based platform, so it lives out in the cloud. It allows you to do, it helps customers do things like stay up on security and compliance, proactively support the environment. In other words, let's say you have a memory dim that's going to go bad or an SSD that's about to go bad. We can actually tell you before it fails so you can take it out of service and avoid any type of downtime. But what types of features we've been adding is around sustainability. So with our workload optimizer, you can actually make sure your workloads are running in the right places within that virtualized environment to make sure that you're using it in the most power efficient way possible. And you'll see in the next few weeks, let's deliver some sustainability dashboards to that tool, which really give you a nice way to visualize how are you doing on your sustainability journey as you're working through your Cisco Intersight and server network and storage. Speaking of network, Nexus Cloud. Nexus Cloud is a new service that we just delivered, announced a few months ago. It's currently also in tech preview. It will and does run on top of the Intersight platform. So it's an example of us bringing Nexus and UCS kind of network and compute within the data center closer together. And some of the most important features are things like this example you see here, which is the dashboard that talks about sustainability. And you can see some really interesting data, things like not only how much you're spending, but where is your spend going based on the utilities that are near that particular data center. So how much of the power is coming from wind? How much of the power is produced from solar? How much of the power is produced from nuclear power? And you can get these types of breakdowns in effectively real time, which is really pretty neat. And speaking of Intersight, a lot of the folks in the back of the room didn't, didn't know what it was. We have an instance that it primarily is in Americas. We're really, really excited to announce that we're going to have an EMEA instance that's entering tech preview in the next 90 days. So anyone here who's interested in Intersight or Nexus Cloud can get a local instance and have local access to that here in EMEA. And the last thing we wanted to talk about here is our sustainability offer. So if you're out thinking about how am I going to consolidate, maybe I should look at some of these newer modern tools. UCSX is available if you're interested in 
purchasing a few servers, we've actually put together a package where we give you the rest of the infrastructure, the chassis, the compute fabric, uh, and we've included the services to help you get up and running with Intersight. It's a web page. It's really easy to use, but it's important that you, you, can, you can learn some of the higher end features, right? And then you can get a really great discount on workload optimizer with the sustainability dashboards that I talked about. And those implementation services will include that as well. So if there is any question about anything, you just head over this way, look to your right. You'll see the hybrid cloud section within the world of solutions. The Nexus and UCS is all there. We're ready to answer any questions. And thank you very much. Denise, I will turn it back over to you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jeremy. So data centers consume about 1% to 2% of the world's electricity today. Smart buildings and workspaces and the built environment represent 37% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Now this, in in of course, includes steel and concrete and other things, but the built environment and the ongoing operating use of electricity that goes through all of these buildings represents 37%. So while data center is a major opportunity for the ICT industry, the built environment is a major industry for the world at large. Remember I talked about ecosystems and IT and OT converging. Well, to play off of the platforms that Jeremy was talking about, smart environment automation continues to play into buildings as well. You may or may not know, but the typical building manages over 30 different systems in its day to day. Between HVAC and security, think about all of the systems you need to talk together. Now think about all of the systems sucking up and, and consuming energy. And what better thing can you possibly put to connect all of those things together inside of a building than the concepts of networking, right? Visibility, insights, insights lead to some analysis and hopefully some automation. So we are working in this portfolio to really bring together the consolidation of power and data on the same line. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the overall integrated fashion of, of sustainable design. So how do you build circularity into an overall process? If we think sales cycles are long uh, in a refresh cycle or for switches, just think about the sales cycle or the development of a building. So let's start with sustainable design. The integration of what creates this hybrid work environment or this future workspaces, again, that consolidation of all of these systems into one, we look at a platform like Cisco Spaces that's reading from sensors. And now we're looking at contactless, touchless, HVAC systems, occupancy. How many of you have recently gone into an office that was on, cold, or hot, and there weren't very many people in the office? The concept of always ready but not always on is something that we are building into our platforms, right? The ability to take every endpoint and every device and connect it to the network is something that we're looking after as a way to consume and more, like less electricity, but make it more energy efficient. Um, when you think of the safety and security of these buildings, there's so much that goes into every environment, whether it's stadiums, uh, buildings, airports, all of these things need to have the flex to go up and down with occupancy. And COVID has taught us, in addition to just the physical safety, there's also the proximity safety of you know, when we needed more social distancing or you wanted more HVAC or more air, air, air filtration, what's happening on the outside. All of these things work together. One of the technologies at the sitting at the backbone of smart buildings is our Catalyst 9K series. So you look at Catalyst 9K in that switching portfolio, you look at the access points, you look at the Meraki portfolio, and then you look at Cisco's industry leading 20 years of power over ethernet. Power over Ethernet is, is something we came out with many moons ago, but it takes power and data on the same line. Now, the limitations of PoE is it goes up to 90 watts. But today what we're seeing and what we've built into many of our own offices is we're taking switches that are smaller, compact, fanless, putting them up in ceilings and enabling new use cases to power lights, window shades, automated desks, and all sorts of new things that again, because you're connected to the network, will allow you to conserve energy. Not only does power over ethernet make it 
easier to navigate from a networking perspective. It is a much simpler cabling methodology. So if you are familiar with anything that goes into building um, a brand new build, you have a lot of steel and a lot of copper wiring in the conduit. All of that is removed. You may or may not be familiar that native clean renewable energy is DC native. Power over ethernet is also DC. So without having to do the conversion of line loss, AC, DC, AC, DC, right, depending on how many times it takes to get from your generator to your, when you're flipping a switch on, now you have cleaner, more efficient energy. Getting that visibility into an overall building also allows you to have more automated control. In our one pen office in New York, we retrofitted an, a building that was built in 1972 and in three years, we've seen close to 40%, right, 39% of an overall energy consumption. That it does not take into account the thousands of pounds of steel that were saved, copper that was saved, conduit that was saved. Not only an experience from a workplace perspective that actually draws people into the office. So in that one floor of the building, there were close to 20,000 pounds of steel that we removed from all the copper, um, all the... Uh, ceilings, and when you see all of those connection points and all of the POEs come together in this one room, it's so simple and it's so elegant, uh, and it's it's safe, right? You don't have you don't require all of the same um, amount of electricians to go through and um, and wire that up. But let's take you through a couple of other examples. When you look at the built environment, sometimes you don't have the luxury of taking everything out and completely re rewiring. So in our Singapore office, we simply did a retrofit. We, connect, we replaced all of the lighting to be PoE. We created more collaborative workspaces, right? Lots of video endpoints. Uh, and then we maximized the space. Again, Singapore is not a whole lot of real estate space. But this is drawing people back into the office for a better experience, occupancy load, uh, and now we can start to control the energy consumption and measure that. Uh, for those of you who you know, aren't getting on a plane to New York anytime soon, this is a VR code with an actual VR experience that you can click, uh, and it will take you directly to the lobby of the Pen1 office. You can walk around, look around, and click on the various technologies and see how it plays. What I love about this is there are 5,000 endpoints in one floor. And you can see how all of Cisco's technology, again, it's Meraki sensors, it's our, WebEx, um, it's our WebEx devices, it's, of course, our catalyst switches, all working together for a completely different working environment with a large, you know, a large conference room, a small conference room, a huddle room, and all of these things that you don't necessarily think of, but when you're there and you start to collaborate in it, it really works. One of my favorite rooms in that, um, in that building feels and looks like a living room. So the people on the other end of that, it, you can, there's no desks, there's no laptops. It really is a collaborative workspace and it's designed as such. Um, another room there, some of the um, desks are actually built to fan out so it's not a rectangle. So that the view in the screen, if you've ever sit, you know, seen it sit at a table, you can't see people at the end if you're on camera. This is literally designed to be able to see every single person in that room. So there are these small things. Think about what I said, the ecosystem partners. There are new ecosystem partners that are coming. Furniture, uh, furniture that can be um, connected to the internet and monitored. All of these things are coming into play. A little bit closer to here is 22 Bishop's Gate, which was a brand new build. Partway during COVID, they built it up, they tore it down, and then they said, we want to go with a fully integrated design that will have the latest and greatest technology to not only make it a collaborative workspace, but to have all of these integrated systems work together. So the building management system, the HVAC system, the security system, these all work together to maximize the number of use cases in that building for, again, both hybrid work and efficiency. How many people remember the heat wave last summer in, you know, across Europe, but particularly London? In that, bu in that building, there's 62 floors, beautiful view from the top, 62 floors, one tenant in one floor said, we do not want to automate our window shades. Every other floor said, please automate to your heart's desire, the, the, the glass, the solar, everything was built in to be automated to, uh, to raise the blinds up and down the particular times of day. After that heat wave, that one floor had double the cost of electricity bill for that one week. And the data laid it all out.
because it was all integrated into one building management system. So I really I en encourage you, I'm actually heading after, after Cisco Live over to Canary Wharf for an outdoor, uh, again, kind of a, a working living space of the future um, because there's some other projects back, um, back in the States that are, are leveraging that technology. The third solution that I referenced uh, in the beginning is really around the internet of the future. And for those who may or may not remember, a couple of years ago, Cisco announced Silicon One. We're taking that Silicon One chip and all of the efficiencies of that chip and, and um, expanding it across the rest of Cisco's switching portfolio. Not only does that increase the energy efficiency, reduce the footprint and the shipping costs and all the things associated to it, but it allows the actual internet at its, at, at its core layer to be more sustainable. So we're building and working with our, everything from our service providers to our governments and our major enterprises at every point in the network to help for a more sustainable and scalable solution uh, as more and more demand for our internet continues. This morning, if you had a chance to catch the keynote, you would have seen a couple of very great industry examples um, and how this comes to play. The one thing I would call out is sustainability must be integrated into the business. There is a massive shift in what our research is telling us just in the last 12 months from regulatory and compliance, not only to helping the bottom line, but actually helping the top line. And it's very visible when you look, look at industry solutions because industries aren't going to stop, right? What we need from our medical facilities, what we need from our stadiums as they come back online, how we travel, even airlines are less predictable today than they were before COVID. And the integration of all of these IoT devices, uh, visibility into the network, security, all of these things working together I had an opportunity to, be, uh, to visit, uh, I, live in, I live in California, wine country that had outfitted water deten uh, IoT sensors and water leakage across their fields. And you know, you may or may not be familiar, but California is in a perpetu perpetual state of drought up until this last season. And so, so water leakage is extremely costly and can cost you know, an entire crop, um, an entire season. So what we're starting to see is the application of sensors in all different places, whether they're mega factories and agricultural. Um, the regulations that are coming out in EV alone is going to move the needle and, and allow for the stimulus money to accelerate all of these solutions in these different ecosystems. In the EU, after 2035, there will be no more uh, gas powered car or gas cars sold. Right, well, what does that mean? The infrastructure and the technology has to be able to withstand the transition and be ready for that. So there is so much opportunity across these industry solutions, across these ecosystem partners, and I hope at a minimum your wheels are turning at where are those potentials. And hopefully, Cisco can help you along that journey, right? Uh, where is Cisco going to help you along the journey and how are we together um, going to tackle the next trends of the future? There are a couple of key things I wanted to call out here uh, because sustainability, clean tech, they're going to introduce a lot of new skill sets into the market. They're going to call upon skill sets that we didn't quite think may have intersected with IT once upon a time. And it's going to take all of us to educate, make more aware, and to bring others along on this journey. So first is renewable energy systems, right? We know clean energy, we need more and more of it. The cost of clean energy is actually at par, if not cheaper, than our traditional coal powered. That's the first time and that's a recent, um, th that's recent data that's come out. Cloud managed sustainability. Jeremy walked you through Intersight and Nexus Cloud. Uh, you saw earlier today the, the WebEx control hub. We are helping across their entire portfolio build an energy management ecosystem of data to help you get real time views of the grid, the energy mix, the cost per kilowatt hour, wherever you are. It's a fun, interesting thing to talk about, to ask someone where they're from and what their cost per kilowatt hour is of energy, particularly uh, in this last year. It's become very dynamic, right? It's not a commodity that we all take it for granted anymore. When we think about this concept of putting power and data on the same line together, we're effectively networking energy. Imagine the concept of energy networking and what that can do to all of our existing IT systems combined with the, the expanded TAM and the expanded opportunity of the ecosystems of OT. 
And then eventually imagine a DC microgrid. Imagine building or retrofitting a building where you have solar coming right off the glass of a window that you may not even own the building, but it's coming right off the window and powering your desk and, and all the lights in your office. The technology for all these things exists today and how we move forward and how we put it together um, is gonna be underpinned by this backbone of, of technology uh, and that intersection of, of, of networking. I'm gonna leave you with two things. First, Cisco is on this journey with you and we are committed throughout the entire life cycle. When we think about what buying models are available, how you move things as a service, um, we are incentivizing with 5% up front to give our product back at the end of its useful life because Cisco, in its number one supply chain, can guarantee 99.9% res responsible recycle, remanufacture, and reuse. And I still have yet to see another company that can offer that. Um, it's so exciting. We actually have a demo of it um, right there through the hub to walk you through what that um, teardown process looks like. There's also, I want to call your attention to four and five. Working with our partner ecosystem, we have a specialization, and we also have a number of organizations that are keeping track of all of the stimulus money to help you unlock that stimulus money. It is so critically important that we try to simplify. I mean, we know, yes, there's a lot of money out there, but I heard from many partners and customers just yesterday how cumbersome of it is, how much paperwork, how many rules there are. We have teams in place in countries around the world working with these organizations to unlock and match our technology and these solutions to help you take advantage of these programs. And last but not least, this QR code will take you to an ebook that walks you through in great detail all of Cisco's solutions. Um, feel free to, to grab that and save it for later. There are 17 sessions across Cisco Live uh, in the next couple of days, so please keep a track of those. The demo lounge that I mentioned uh, in that other room has six different stations, and there'll be tours uh, ongoing for the rest of uh, the rest of Cisco Live. Um, and again, last but not least, that ebook uh, will continue to be updated uh, with with every big event that we have. So if you take that QR code and you save it, it will continue to get refreshed. But it has in great detail all the programs, all the solutions that we walked through today. I cannot thank you enough for being here today. Uh, if, if it's not really clear, I thoroughly enjoy my job uh, and my role, which is to embed sustainability into all of Cisco's products and solutions. But I can tell you it is not something that can be done with any one vendor, or any one company, or even just the folks in this room. So I just I encourage you to learn more. We're just getting started. This is going to be a long journey. The last year, if it's any indication, the amount of growth in this topic in this area just continues, and it doesn't look like it's going to stop. So thank you. Have a wonderful Cisco Live, and I hope to see you soon. Oh, fantastic job, Denise. Thank you so much, and welcome everybody back to the studio, broadcast studio A. My name is Steve Malter. I'm the horse one of the four of us who's having trouble with his voice, but otherwise loving every minute of the show here, and we're so glad to have you with us on the broadcast. So. We are going to be with you all the way up to the top of the hour and our next session, which I'll tell you in a moment. But this innovation talk, sustainability, net zero capabilities. In just a moment, Denise is going to run all the way across to us and sit down with my buddy Nish Parker right over here in Studio B and continue that conversation around net zero. There are so many different ways that Cisco is contributing to sustainability all over the planet. You can find all of those sustainability initiatives in that great ebook that Denise just mentioned a moment ago during her iTalk. The name of that ebook is Cisco Sustainability Technology and Solutions. If you want to check it out, just scan that QR code. It's directly underneath my head, and you can go directly to it. That will take you straight to that source, and you can check it out for yourself. So like I said, we're with you right up to the top of the hour, 2 o'clock Central European time, and our next innovation talk this is going to be a fantastic partner conversation, how we are modernizing the data center with innovative solutions from Cisco and from AMD. You're going to want to check that out. First, though, we're going to head straight down the hall to the sustainability zone and my friend, Cedric D. Valder. And I think, Cedric, you've got a demo for us. Is that right? 
Absolutely, Steve. I am here in the sustainability zone in the hub. And man, I can hear your voice, but you're diehard and we know it. So thank you for being with us, Steve. So I'm here in the sustainability zone. They're actually focusing on six key areas over here. Um, so I'm just going to let you have a wander around right now. Um, but essentially here, there are a lot of experts that can talk to you about sustainability, about Cisco. Um, and actually, I have one of those experts with me here today. Christian is our global sustainability lead for Meraki. So Christian, how are you doing? Very good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really much enjoying Cisco life here. It's mm. good to be here. It's good to see you. Great to be here, yeah. Great. So we're going to talk a little bit more about um, energy saving accelerators here um, in just a uh, quick few minutes here. Um, so Christian, for Meraki, right? Um, what are the, what are some general outcomes that we're trying to achieve with Meraki and sustainability? Right. So we're looking at three main areas. So it's basically the first one is to reduce the amount of travel that is required for IT operations and implementation, thanks to zero touch deployment and remote management capabilities. Another one is to reduce waste, which we achieve mostly through our environmental sensors, where we can control the temperature, humidity, detect water leaks, and so on. And another key area at the moment is really energy savings, where we have multiple use cases, how we can address that. Awesome, great. So as you can see behind me, we have actually a dashboard running. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening on this dashboard? Of course, so what we see here is the um, energy savings chart, uh, which is related to our empty environmental sensors. And um, so this dashboard shows basically all the sensor readings in terms of temperature and humidity, and it's plotted on this chart, which goes back to industry standards, how air conditioning uh, efficiency is being displayed. And we see here the readings from the cold eye of the data center. It's also possible to display um, other areas, like we can show you, for example, um, that we can at the moment, you can see we only have the cold aisle here, but we can also add, for example, the hot aisle sensors from the data center. So really by grouping those readings together, get um, a really good visibility about where the different readings are. So this is awesome, because how is this then in practice helping your customers in the end? Right, so if you think of data centers, a main area where energy is being consumed is in the air conditioning area. So it takes a lot of energy to cool down those spaces that the IT infrastructure can operate in a, in a safe and efficient manner. But very often we, we realize that those spaces are actually too cold. So the air conditioning runs more and you know, it's higher utilized than it could be. So by turning you know, the, the heat up a little bit, right? so by increasing the temperature, you can actually save on the amount of energy you spend on air conditioning. But you also want to have a tight control then, because you, when you want to, you know, when you see that the air conditioning units may be failing, for example, that the temperature is getting too high, like here, for example, you can see there are two sensor readings which are just off the chart, you want to be alerted as well. So what we do is we will send you an alert and inform you that there's maybe, you know, the temperature is a bit too high, so you want to investigate the air conditioning unit. Okay, great. I think the cool thing actually is that I can see here it's Bethlehem Lakes 10. That's actually the building there I sit, where I sit day to day. So, I mean, uh, and I think that's also where the Cisco TV studio is in, uh, in London. So, yeah, but I'm a customer, let's say, Christian. Um, I'm seeing this. I'm loving this. I'm sitting at home. I can't be at Cisco Live, unfortunately, but you have to be here next year. Um, how can I access this? Yeah, so all you really need is um, our empty environmental sensors and a gateway. So you see actually a sensor here, right? So it's uh, Bluetooth um, connected, um, battery powered. So it's very easy to install them. You can just uh, use them and stick them via a magnet to an IT rack. And they connect to a Meraki gateway, which can be either an access point or a camera. And once you have those products, you can just simply um, put them on the IT rack, start seeing the data and immediately seeing is there a room for optimization, right? So what is the temperature today and then take action to, you know, use the energy spent and then also verify what the outcome is so you can see the temperature readings changing in the dashboard. Great. So I can see here, like, there is the gateway, right? I can also see here, like, I'm looking around, like, I can see sensors and so on. So what types of sensors does Meraki have or do we are compatible with the dashboard? Yeah, so at the moment we have a temperature and humidity sensor, um, we have a water leak detection sensor, a door open and closure sensor, air quality, which is an increasingly important topic, also in you know, the light of you know, post-pandemic to monitor really what the air quality is in spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, we have also an automation button, which you can do anything you want with, basically, right? So you can express intent, you can power down um, Wi-Fi, switchboards, but also send a message, for example, if a new cash register needs to be opened in a retail shop, right? So I think the applications are really, really widely spread there. Okay, yeah, because I, I was going to ask you about that automation tool, right? So mm. what, what do you think is the coolest automation in there? 
Yeah, I think so. Really, I think the button really uh, gets people excited, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a really. I, I would like to show it now. I don't have it here, but it's you know because it's so much possible with it. So you know, for example, really just turning off the Wi-Fi, which is also an interesting use case to save energy. So when spaces are empty, you know, no one's in a school, for example, no one's in an office, and to save on energy, you can start powering down infrastructure and really using this automation, which is possible to achieve those savings. It's also in other areas. I think that's that's a great use case. Awesome. Well, great. Thank you so much, Christian. We'll be, we'll be back here in the sustainability zone later today. But I think my wonderful friend Steve is still in the studio. So, Steve, are you there? I am here, Cedric. Thank you so much. Fantastic job on that interview. <clears throat> really, really good information and, and, and great demo there from Christian. Really appreciate it. So, coming up in just a couple of minutes, we are going to go out to the world of solutions and we are going to take a walk through the Metabus. Metabus is very cool. It's a great partnership between Cisco. Deutsche Bahn, BDL, Bus and Coach, and A Plus Video Clinic GmbH. So together, these phenomenal companies are helping to really expand access to reliable health care, and it's bringing small towns and big solutions together in such an exciting way. Uh, Nish is going to be taking us on a tour of the Medibus, which we're very excited about. Rob Boyd is going to be out front of the Medibus. They're going to kind of tag team on all of this, and they're going to uh, give us a really, really good excitement. You know, when we think about the shortage of digital knowledge, when we think about the number of people that we need to bring on board to serve our society in the greatest possible way, when it comes to medical, patients just don't have access to proper medical care in a lot of situations. Well, Metabus is bringing that primary care directly out to the people, plus things like uh, company medical examinations and uh, telehealth and translation services and vaccination campaigns and COVID-19 antibody testing and all of it goes right where it is needed the most, which is incredibly exciting. So in just a moment, we have got the woman of the hour, Denise Lee, here on set with us. I'm going to be sending it over to Nish in just a second. A quick reminder, please keep reaching out to us using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. You can also hit us up on any social media you prefer at at Cisco Live EMEA. And remember to tell everybody that you know about the stream. Tell them to head directly to CiscoLive.com. They can go to Cisco.com, whatever works best for them. We would love to have as many people as possible on board. Our social media team is directly behind us, ready for your call, ready for your text. And right now I'm going to send it across to Studio B, where Nish is hanging out with Denise. Hello, Nish. Hello, Steve. Thank you so much. Now, I'm excited. I've got Denise uh, Lee with me here in the studio. Well, you've just done an amazing innovation talk and we're lucky because we get a few moments with you, get the behind the scenes, right? So sustainability is obviously top of mind for a lot of our customers. Um, tell me why it's top of mind for Cisco, why we're focusing on it so much. You know, Cisco it, it has been reporting on our environmental f since 2005. And when you think about Cisco's purpose, which is to power an inclusive future for all, there is a lot of plans, very specific plans and execution around every one of those words, and it all relates to how we plan for a more sustainable future, right? Whether it's how we're dealing with climate crisis, how we're embedding sustainability and, and energy efficiency into our products. Uh, it's just so core to who we are and what we do uh, and the customers that we serve, the governments around the world, uh, because this is such an existential cr uh, crisis and challenge today. Got it, and obviously, like I said, you know, sustainability, hot topic here at Cisco Live. What are some of the things that you're hearing from customers in terms of the challenges? Why are they coming to Cisco, and how are we helping them? Yeah, it really comes down to one thing for all customers right, right. now when it comes to Cisco, and it is the data. And when I say the data, how, how sustainability is measured is through carbon, um, greenhouse gas emissions, right? Um, carbon emissions. And so when we look at energy consumption, like that's where Cisco can help. And we're, see, we're hearing from our customers, where do we start? How are we measuring? How do we reduce? Again, follow the data and you'll follow kind of what customers care abouts are. Um, in the data center, we know it's a big footprint. You know, data centers are often seen as a very big energy hog. Uh, when you look at the built environment and buildings, they are also seen as uh, consuming a lot of electricity and energy. Uh, particularly here in this region, we're in an energy crisis. And so there is even more um, kind of a finite point on how do we use our technology and our solutions to not just incrementally reduce some of the energy re we're looking at, but maybe revolutionize um, how we consume power and, and how we build. 
Got it. And obviously, you know, it's a priority sustainability globally for all our customers around the world. But when we look specifically at the, um, you know, European region, we're here at Cisco Live EMEA. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, you know, the energy crisis. What are some of the priorities we have here within region for advancing sustainability? Well, you know, it's so it's so almost serendipitous that Cisco Live happened the week after um, the president of the U EU announced the Green Deal. Right, the Green Deal last week announced all, an entire four-point plan, um, ma major investment in skills, uh, new skills that are needed uh, for for the advancement of clean tech and, and its technology, uh, new regulations that are coming out. So I think when we look region to region, uh, most of it in this in this area is going to be a little bit more focused on the energy crisis. Um, right. But when I think about the skill sets that are needed, again, it spans everything from you know, maybe power engineering to thermal to even chemical engineering in some cases because of some of the technology that we're looking at to advance in this area. And, um, you know, for some customers it could seem quite overwhelming to say, how do I get started towards net zero? Some customers are further, you know, along their strategy and have a more mature strategy. What advice would you give to those organizations that are earlier on? How do they get started? How can Cisco support? What are the next steps? Oh, it's such a great question. We're actually, um, we've jointly published uh, paper and some research work with IDC that helps articulate just that, right? The point is, regardless of where you are on your journey, A, we're all on this journey together, and B, there are specific steps and actions that you can take uh, to help further along your entire organization and do it within the ecosystem and a community that can help you, right? So again, starting with the data and how and where you start to measure, there, there, are, no, there are no shortage of Again, partners, vendors, ecosystems of solutions that can help you uh, accelerate on that journey. And I think the point is it doesn't matter where you are, start somewhere, baseline, and go from there. And I think when we had Rebecca Stone in the studio earlier today as well, she was, you know, it was music to people's ears when it was when she was talking about how customers don't have to rip out everything that they have. They right. can, you know, do um, more with less. Uh, I'll make sure I got that, that the right way around as yeah. well. So lots of comfort for customers there, even if they are earlier on in their journeys. Um, now, I know that there's lots of regulations coming to in place, you know, lots of policies. How do they impact customers' decision making when it comes to, you know, the technology that they're using and how Cisco plays a role in that? Hugely. Uh, in fact, you know, this region is, is often seen as far ahead in its sustainability, you know, regulations and compliance and, and really just overall education and awareness. So when you think about you know how RFPs are going out and and customers choosing to work with vendors because maybe they have a cleaner supply chain or they have circular design practices or they've eliminated the the use of you know the what I call the naughty list right there's a <laughs> list of, of of chemicals and products that we know you know, what we know now, we didn't know then, right? We right. didn't quite know they were toxic back then, but now that we know, we're removing them and eradicating them. So to the extent that we start to see more and more of, of both these regulations and the enforcement uh, of them, I think we'll start to see a lot of changes in behavior and hopefully a lot of, you know, really good actors trying to accelerate um, the movement to, to a cleaner uh, environment and more circular design and circular consumed products. I love what you just said there about, you know, what we didn't know, we do know now when we move forward together. And it's a learning journey for all of us, right? And we're all yes, striving right. towards that. And um, thank you, Denise. I just want to say, you know, I know we've talked about the ebook, and Steve mentioned it earlier. Tell yeah. us a little bit about what that resource is and how it's going to help customers. Well, first of all, it's very sustainable, right? Uh, it's a, Q, a simple QR code that takes you to an online ebook um, that walks you through Cisco's solutions. Uh, the details of those solutions are various products. It also walks through the overall life cycle uh, of a customer and all the various programs, incentives, initiatives that we're putting into place. Um, one, one such program that a lot of customers don't know about, and, and I'm hearing all the buzz here at Cisco <laughs> yeah. Live um, as I learn, is that we have a free take back program. Okay. Customers can take old products, package them up, take a picture of it. Cisco will come pick it up from them. Yeah. And then 99.9% .9 of those products will be responsibly recycled, remanufactured, and reused. I love that. So we're imagine- We're making it easy, right? We're making it easy. <laughs> imagine how much you know, junk you can get out of those IT closets um, for so many of our customers. I wish we could apply that for the rest of things in life. But um, <laughs> yeah. this program's great. We actually have a demo here that, that deconstructs and does a teardown of a product so you can actually see what that looks like. But it's nearly 100% responsibly recycled, remanufactured, and reused, and that's pretty remarkable. 
Amazing. Well, thank you so much. I know we'll be covering sustainability the whole way, you know, through the whole week. Denise, thank you so much. Steve, thank we're going to head back to you, Studio A. Thank you so much, Nish. Appreciate it. Great job, Denise. Really excellent eye talk and great conversation here. You know, from all these sustainability initiatives to creating a truly inclusive future for all, Cisco is all about technology innovations and creative partnerships. And we have got one of those coming up for you right now. Stay with us. We're going to take a very, very quick station break here for branding. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Right. Once again, welcome back to the broadcast. We are so glad to have you with us here in the studio. I am the very horse, Steve Malter, joined by three other fantastic hosts, all coming to you from the beautiful guy in Amsterdam. In just a moment, we're going to head out to the world of solutions and a fantastic partnership story from Cisco on the Metabus. But before we get to that, we want to show you a video on the Metabus. There is so much great capability that we can show you when you're here at the show. Let's go ahead into that video right now. Let's learn a little bit about the Metabus and then I'll be back to tell you more and send it across to Rob Boyd. An increasing stream of mothers with children Old and young people are currently on the run due to the refugee crisis caused by the war in Ukraine. According to the UNHCR, we're talking about 5.2 million people who are forced to leave their beloved homeland. Among many of these people are chronically sick, injured, as well as people who became sick while fleeing. Probably the biggest humanitarian crisis since the Second World War is emerging and calls for action. Fast and unbureaucratic help is needed. Cisco was not long in responding. Thanks to the innovative technology of our CDA program, a fluent collaboration with government leaders and local partners has been established to power an inclusive future for all. We deployed our expertise and resources where they were needed most urgently. Starting at the most important arrival points in Germany, Cologne, Berlin, and Hamburg. We joined forces to set up a project which took only four weeks from the idea to its implementation. The Medibus, first aid on four wheels. Mobile and as flexible as the situation currently demands. MedibusHelps.org is a private sector initiative by Cisco with support of DB Regio Bus to improve basic medical care for refugees. The fleet is fully equipped and the medical practice in use is digitally networked. It ensures fast primary medical care and provides vaccination prevention for older and younger people. Refugee children receive all the most important vaccinations here so that they can attend daycare centers and schools as soon as possible. The project aims to help to close the current bottlenecks in medical care. And shows how great the willingness and desire of medical students and volunteers is to get involved. Barely any of the Ukrainian refugees speak German. A smart solution, due to the language problem, was required. Direct communication is one of the most important factors here, so that medical help can be provided to the point. So we are pleased to welcome all refugees warmly with the Medibus, in their own language. What's your language? Or in 49 other languages. Actually, we are speaking the same language. We want the refugees to feel at home and safe from the very first moment. That's why we have 750 translators being able to collectively speak 50 languages just at a press of a button. Every child, every woman, every man that we will welcome warmly with first aid till the end of the year brings us a big step closer to our goal how to positively impact 1 billion people by 2025.
All right. Hello, everybody. So I'm here in the studio, and I'm joined by Chris Reeves. He's our VP of uh, Country Digitization for Cisco. Cool job, uh, Chris. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the work of you and your team. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I look after the uh, Country Digital Acceleration Program, or CDA, as Got we it. call it. CDA program for EMEA. So what we do is we invest in projects and programs around the world that um, power digital adoption. And the reason why we do that is we're very optimistic about the benefits that digitization bring. Right. And we're, we're trying to focus on the outcomes. So we're investing in projects and programs, adopt digitization for positive outcomes for people. And I know we just saw a video just now on the broadcast, the Medibus, right? That's one of our great projects. Yeah, you were saying just before we started how much of a fun project it was for the team to work on. So tell me what the Medibus is, and then we'll head out um, to the world of solutions and see it. Yeah, uh, the, the thing is with CDA projects, they're all based on partnerships. Right. And the Medibus uh, is a great example of that. So many years ago, we partnered with Deutsche Bahn, right. a bus co transport company in Germany, and we converted some of their buses, uh, s seven of their buses into mobile, fully networked clinics that could um, serve people in remote, in, in remote communities. And then what happened, unfortunately, the Syrian refugee crisis happened and we were able to leverage those mobile networked buses to right. deal with that refugee crisis. And then after that, we had the pandemic and Deutsche Bahn were able to use those buses to respond to the COVID pandemic, doing vaccinations yes. and testing around Germany. And then more recently, when the Ukraine crisis happened, Cisco asked us in the CDA team, what could we do to help? And we did a number of things. We got equipment into Ukraine to bring the networks back. But another thing that we did was to leverage those buses, get them rebranded and back on the road again to serve right. Ukrainian refugees in Germany. Got it, and I want to make sure we take a look at the bus, so let's head out to the World of Solutions. Rob, you're in the Medibus, right? All right, yes, no, I'm here, and uh, this is time for kind of a physical show and tell, if you will. So we've got a bus. A lot of times we talk about technology, a lot of vehicles that we've showcased here, all about the technology. What's the technology doing? And this has plenty of technology. But this is really about helping people. But to really get a look at what this bus is doing and get the lowdown and the details, because this is amazing. Mirko, so glad to have you with us. Are you willing to give us a show and tell and maybe show us the secrets that we put through this bus? Hey, Rob, absolutely. You know, basically, that's a doctor's office on wheels. It heals on wheels. Ooh. Should we take a tour? Absolutely. Let's yeah. do it. Let's go. Okay, please, guys, come on. So basically, uh, this is uh, what you expect uh, from a doctor's office. So uh, there is a reception at the beginning. Then we have a patient room, one of the patient room. There's a laboratory in the back. And then we have another patient room. Um, and this is one out of a fleet of seven buses. Deutsche Bahn in Germany is operating. Um, and usually, you know, they are covering not only railway, but also the uh, bus transport. They run 15,000 buses. And they discovered, um, as we have in the countryside, in the small villages, doctors closing their offices. So kind of medical desert, no successors. And you need to travel 30, 40, 50 kilometers to see the next doctor, next doctor. So the idea was, can we transform uh, a passenger bus into a doctor's office? That's what we did. So seven of them are already running. Um, and for example, a small uh, region in uh, Germany, in the middle of Germany, we can cover six communities per week uh, with that doctor's office. This is what you see here is a reception, right? So usually patients move in here. The bus is fully digitally networked. Um, and what we can see here, uh, as the main connectivity device is our 1800, you know, uh, this is uh, specially designed for the transportation industry. Uh, we have 12 volt connectivity, it's a router, it's a switch. We can run an operating system on it. We have modular modularity on the connectivity, so you can carry 3G, 4G, LTE, even a 5G module is in there, hot pluggable. Um, and we can run two SIM cards with it. So in Germany, it's T-Mobile. Then we have Vodafone and automatically switches to have the best connectivity. So the fleet management gets the vital parameters of the IT system on the bus, but also connects to the CAN bus of the bus, so to get the vital parameters in there. So we have 16 solar panels on the roof, so you can run one day completely emission free. And if we move forward, this is one of the patient rooms, so it's also used for mass vaccination. So during the COVID pandemics, you see here um, what we use the bus for uh, doing the vaccinations. Also, uh, we had the 
COVID antibody testing. Then we had in crisis, communist, crisis situations the R, uh, the flood in the R Valley where you know the buses have been dispatched. If we move a little bit forward, please follow me. This is the laboratory. Uh, usually, you know, there is a mobile X-ray station. We have EKG. Uh, you have a blood centrifuge. Um, even if you look here, it's a barrier-free entry, so you can even have people uh, moving in with their wheelchairs. And as I just mentioned, everything is connected. We also have cooling units here. We can even cool down vaccines up to 20 degrees uh, minus uh, to do vaccinations, for example. And now I would like to invite you to come into the back of the patient room. Usually there's a red light going on if it's occupied, and I see here Oh, there's already a patient sitting here. Hey, Rob. Hey, hey good to see you, man. Good. I was trying to get yeah, ahead yeah. of things, save some please, time. Please come in. So this is the back of the patient room. Um, and, you know, the most inter interesting thing is, and that's a big game changer, um, we used this and we also funded this as we had the um, Ukrainian refugees coming through wow. through the war. Um, 1.2 million we took in Germany. Um, and we uh, ran four buses over nine months in Germany to serve the refugee settlements in Berlin, Cologne and Hamburg. And the biggest game changer is what we have here. We are connecting with a roster of medical translators uh, who do collectively speak 50 languages. So imagine you have different people coming from different countries. Right. And imagine, uh, Rob, you are far away from your hometown. I can imagine that you, right now. You get sick, right? Yeah. And uh, you get in front of a doctor. Um, and you don't speak the same language, so how would you feel, right? Yeah. And we have a roster Lost. here of 50 languages. Oh, wow. Okay. The ones uh, which are very frequently used, oh, okay. like oh, okay. Arabic. Okay. Yeah. I tell you what, we're going to have to cut now. Guys, I apologize to cut you off because it's fascinating. Yeah. They got the translation, they got the doctors, and they're bringing it to people in need. With that, we'll go back to you guys in the studio. All right, thanks. We are going to throw it straight out to the partner talk. Let's go ahead and have them kick off right now. We'll come back to Metabus. So welcome everyone, I'm Jeremy Foster, I'm the general manager for Cisco's compute business. And really excited to have with me today Kumaran Siva from AMD. Why don't you go ahead and give us an introduction Hi, to yourself. Thank you, you so you. much for having me here. It's just quite the honor to be here and, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting us. Um, so I run uh, business development, strategic business development at, at AMD. So that includes um, kind of our, our work with verticals. We work closely with partners like Cisco, enabling solutions for end customers across different industries. Oh, that's great. And you know, we got a chance to, to catch up yesterday and, and, yeah. and talk before the session. And um, you know, just maybe it would be great for the audience to give them an overall view of the big picture and what you're seeing, as well as some of those levers that you all are pulling to make some of the moves in the market that you're making. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a few, it's been a phenomenal journey that AMD has been on. So we got back into the server business about five years ago, right? And, um, and we've actually had generated four generations of new CPUs in that time, all right? Um, and so we, we, we named them after Italian cities. We started with uh, Naples, Rome, Milan, and the latest is Genoa, which we brought out in uh, the end of last year, around the November time frame. Um, and so it's, it's been phenomenal. We've, we've really managed to uh, sort of bring back you know, that cadence that folks had expected from, uh, from the, the server, CPU uh, uh, you know, server CPU providers. Um, and so it's been, uh, it's been quite interesting. So um, uh, you know, kind of big picture view on it, you know, there's three, three things that customers really look for that we've been able to deliver consistently in those generations. The, the first thing is performance. Right, so absolute raw performance. We're able to like give you the most, like you 96 cores of really high performance CPU with uh, commensurate memory bandwidth, um, an, an I/O, you know, PCIe Gen 5, DDR5. We're able to do all of that, you know, on the on the top end performance. The second key, second thing we brought was performance efficiency. So uh, uh, performance per watt, power efficiency. 
very, very key, especially here in, in, uh, in Europe, where there's now this massive pivot towards power efficiency um, you know, across the board, and that's something that we're seeing. It's not just performance at any cost, it's now performance per watt matters the most, and delivering performance within an envelope is really, really important. The third thing we bring, and it's a consequence of the other two, is TCO. Right, and so the, the TCO benefit, um, you know, has been has been extremely substantial, um, and it's been it's been really good. Um, so if you think about it in terms of the lever points that we bring here, we're able to take you all the way up and give you like you know absolute performance, like 96 cores running full full throttle. These these are pretty pretty powerful CPUs, and they're able to to really give quite a bit of uh, you know the, the most per core performance and the most uh, performance per socket. But what we've actually found that's really powerful is customers have picked not just our top of stack, but, for, uh, but CPUs that are sort of in the middle, either 16 cores, 24 cores, 32 cores. And we've had customers, like an FSI customer, who's been able to launch um, you know, their virtualized workloads into a 32 core AMD. What they have told us is that um, they were shocked at the adoption that their end customers, like they had thousands of applications across multiple departments, those customers, how quickly they adopted this, uh, this new instance, or this, this new um, infrastructure, was the fastest that they'd ever seen. And it's because all their jobs just ran faster. Yeah, that's that was, great. Yeah. I mean, our last session was on sustainability. That's clearly a key theme in, in all markets, but in me in particular, uh, you hit on some of the other big things there in terms of performance. Uh, and, and the approach around, and, and just the innovation that you all are delivering, I mean, four new processors in that amount of time, that, that many years, is, is pretty darn impressive. Um, it, but are there specific workloads that you see customers adopting with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, look, the, the way I look at a, especially large enterprises, they, they have typically you know, two classes of workloads. You have what I call general IT, and then you have specialized workloads, workloads that make the business run, workloads that make money for the business. So the, probably the clearest thing is like in financial services, you have uh, trade analytics, where you know, the amount of, uh, amount of CPU time, amount of processing you can do between trading, trading day to trading day you know, is directly proportional to the amount of money you can make. So there, it's performance at all cost. Right, you have uh, simulations in um, in uh, manufacturing, like the car manufacturers. They have to do crash simulations. The number of simulations they can do there, uh, you know, to, it makes their cars better. So there's these these workloads that are directly proportional to business outcomes. But on the other hand, there is general IT, where you really want to hit the sustainability. You really want to hit the the power efficiency. So what we what we really found is that AMD is actually we, we get in. On, the, on these uh, vertical applications that are really performance oriented, but then our cu the customers see the value and see the value of having the latest generation uh, you know, process nodes, five nanometer, and then we see that um, growing into the general IT space, and so they'll use you know, maybe the, the, the 96 core state of the art, uh, you know, the, the highest performance thing for, uh, for the crash simulation or for a risk analysis, you know, those specialized workloads, but then they'll use um, a 32 core, 16 core, 24 core device, you know, with a, uh, with a, an, an amazing power efficiency and amazing performance for the general IT workloads, so that their you know their broad set of you know long tail of users are are, are, are happy with that. Yeah, I mean, and that's a really big value that we see from customers as well. I mean, a lot of this taking advantage of the new technology is all about consolidation, right? And and how do you end up going from 500 servers down to 130, 140 servers, and how do you save and drive that sustainability? And you know, that's what we're seeing when we work together with our customers here is, yeah. you know, how do we take, for example, large financial customers, healthcare customers, and then drive huge ROI around the consolidation, both on the networking side as well, but you know, that ultimately yields big sustainability savings, and, and that's really what our customers are after. And the other thing I think financially that's really important is when you drive consolidation, you take advantage of you know, these types of technologies is you save a lot of money on things that aren't just hardware, right? It's the software to operate those environments. Yeah. You're talking about being able to reduce those types of numbers close to 30%. Mm -hmm. On average, we see it like 27%. And so you reduce the number of boxes and you reduce the spend there. You take your support, you know, your, your smart net from Cisco that includes the AMD processor in the box. You reduce that many boxes. You're talking about taking down the process, the, the price of smart net by you know, 39% in a lot of cases. And so yeah. it's, been, uh, it's been really interesting.
No, that's, that's a great benefit. You're highlighting the, the system level value that Cisco brings, which is really, really key, right? We're an ingredient, but being able to bring it up and then being able to take it, do server consolidation, do, do some of these things that really matter to the end user is, is really important, and, and I think that's, that's a real a strong value of the partnership that we've built up. Right, and, and along those same lines, I mean, the things that we just talked about consolidation, you know, can you talk some more about how you're looking further to reduce the amount of energy? You mentioned sustainability uh, yes, a little yeah. bit, but I think there's probably some more there you could talk about. Yeah, certainly. I think, like, I think, I think fundamentally, what, what really brings value to our customers and really drives sustainability is matching um, what the customer needs, giving them a, a, taking where they are, meeting the customer where they are. So for example, if your infrastructure today is a 12 core Skylake, you know, dual socket, you know, we can offer you, an all, you know, a, a number of alternatives that really t give you the performance uplift you're looking for so that your users get a benefit. At the same time, you're providing you with the sustainability, providing you with the power efficiency. Right, so to to uh, uh, take those twelve, to take those du um, uh, dual socket twelve cores, give you a tw a twenty four core one p or one, one socket or a uh, a two p with uh, sixteen cores, thirty two sockets, uh, thirty two cores altogether. That kind of you know th 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 that kind of incremental benefit while giving you the um, the value in TCO and then also giving you the value in terms of uh, you know power savings. That's actually quite powerful, right? Now you can also go you know if, if you're a power user, you can also take you know, four of those uh, or five of those uh, Skylake servers and consolidate them down into, you know, a, a, you know using our the, the state-of-the-art Genoa, uh, you know, one or two server of, of 96 cores, right? Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's also a use case. But for, for a lot of people, it's about kind of the incremental, like, you know, being able to take what they have today, the manageability that, uh, that Cisco brings, you know, allows you to, to, to scale either, you know, e any way you want, but be able to take that and, and, br and bridge into something that makes sense for the workloads you have, the, 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 the management architecture you have, the type of workload deployment, the type of data center deployment that you're, you're working from. Yeah, I mean, I really like the flexibility you get within the platform to go from 32 cores all the way to 96 and address all those use cases, sim it's very simple, right? And that's, that's what we also like to do when we, ma we bring management into the, into the game as well with things like Intersight is be able to treat all your servers exactly the same way, make sure that you're using the latest and greatest firmware, update them in a very simple, simple fashion. Um, and then there's some other things that we do with Intersight as well as it relates to security, which is obviously another really big uh, hot button, if you will, top of yeah. mind for CIOs. And I don't think people often associate, well, what's my CPU got to do with security? Like all the other stuff yes. around it has to do with security. My, my, my bad malware, you know, uh, yeah. email that comes in, uh, phishing attacks, those types of things. Those, that's what I think of when I think of security. But you know, you're doing some really interesting things as it relates to yeah, security. Yeah, no, no, okay, so, so baseline modern, modern AMD CPU, we take care of, you know, I, I guess security did come in, in in terms of, like you mentioned, that CPUs are not necessarily in the news for security, but, you know, there was a Spectre meltdown, right. all of these sidecar attacks, um, you know, on virtualization that came into being. You know, our, AMD's modern CPUs, that, that, you know, our whole line at this point really does actually address those sidecar type of issues and those vulnerabilities. So just doing that upgrade into, you know, either a Milan or a Genoa, server, you take care of those vulnerabilities at the CPU level. But probably more interesting, we've been working very closely with the hyperscalers. You know, part of our journey back into, um, into the server business, you know, we, we partnered very closely with the hyperscalers. And one of the, one of the technologies that we've pioneered with them, um, you know, is really, you know, in, in the cloud, you have multiple tenants. And they all have to live well together. And, and you want to make sure that one isn't somehow maliciously attacking the other. And so one, one of the uh, capabilities that we've brought in is to secure encrypted virtualization. So like, uh, you know, this being a Cisco um, show, of course, as everyone understands networking IPsec, you know, encryption across the wire. What SCV is about is providing that same kind of encryption into the compute domain so that each virtual machine is actually encrypted from another. So you have these different, uh, different domains that you can set up. And the hypervisor can't see what's going on in the guest. The guest can't see what's going on in each other. So it provides you with this, this, this nice, nice um, uh, platform for, for security, which, which of course uh, ties in very well with the manageability and management capabilities that, that Cisco bring. Yeah, it's another place to think about a threat surface and, yes. and, and, and being able to augment it. That's pretty cool. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do is make it really be able to adopt those features within Intersight. So just like we would do with firmware, like I mentioned, we can do that with the SEV 
settings. And that way you're always in the right state as you deploy a server or add a new server or you don't forget to put this as part of your automation or change a particular setting. So you can adopt some of those features like they've built with the hyperscalers in the enterprise without having to worry about you know, any type of a challenge. Um, and you know, what else, like we talked about, we've talked a lot about a lot of things, uh, primarily in the data center. But what about you know the edge? What are you seeing out there? That's another yeah, big, you know big big top of the mind. Yeah. Thing. So the edge. I mean, it, it, I, I love love talking about the edge because it, it means different things to ever, almost everybody, <laughs> right? If you talk to a hyperscaler, they'll tell you the edge is anything that doesn't sit in the cloud, right? But then you know you have um, it, what I think of really as the edge actually is is what's deployed outside the data center, right? So you know if you have big you know big managed data centers that are cooled and you know temperature controlled and you can you know have uh, how many kilowatts per rack. Right, that's that's one environment. Another environment, though, I think about as being edge is where it's where those boxes are out in the out like in a, in a, for example for retail out in a store or in a telco they're out in a in either in a co location or in a in a. Um, uh, a NEBS environment, of, you know, near a bit, underneath a base station somewhere. So those, those are kind of you know what we call edge environments. Um, so AMD, you know, we we start off you know really focused in on the um, on the core. On you know we start off with hyperscalers. Now we've really broken into enterprise in a fairly significant way. Uh, but now we're also you know the, our parts have gotten deployed into edge applications. Um, so for example, uh, you know, Colo CDNs um, were, were deployed quite a bit already today. There are folks, you, the telco, um, telco is a big area for us. We'll, we'll be at MWC, you'll see a fair bit of like, you know, the, uh, the adoption from carriers of, of AMD technology. So you, th that's, that part of it is, is growing substantially. Uh, but um, we also, you know, we want to invest very directly in, in, uh, in um, the edge going forward, and this, these are for these boxes that sit outside. So in our roadmap, we have a part coming out later this year called Sienna, and that's actually specifically targeted for uh, edge applications, including those retail applications, smart retail, as well as uh, the telco, um, you know, VRAN, um, you know, a, a far edge type, type use cases as well. Yeah, so maybe just tell us a little bit more about Sienna, just in terms of what's different yeah. than that versus Genoa, which until you said earlier that it, they were all named after Italian cities, I thought that was actually salami, so I appreciate <laughs> you educating me on that today, yeah. uh, but would love to know more about Sienna. <laughs> No, yes, yeah, again, it is an Italian city. Uh, apparently a really pretty one of that. But what it is, is it's a lower power, um, you know, it's, it's by design. So our architecture is you have a, a centralized IO die with, with uh, these uh, uh, chiplets that are actually the CPUs around it. And one of the things that we're doing with Sienna is we're, we're optimizing both the IO die and the little chiplets around it to be very low power so that we can hit, you know, 65 watts, uh, 100 watts, you know, all, the, all of the ranges that are, that are lower and be very, very optimally efficient. Um, and then also be able to, you know, live in NEBS, NEBS compliant environments. You know, I think something Cisco knows extremely well, of course. But to be able to then be deployed into, you know, into uh, telco uh, central offices, uh, you know, s some of which are not, you know, not necessarily you know, temperature controlled and the like, right? Or have to live within much, much greater variants of, of environmental conditions. So that's that's really the the key to it. So it's 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 a, it's perfect. You can think of it as a smaller, you know, lower cost, uh, more optimized version of of the Genoa. Well, that's great. Um, are there any other kind of innovations that are top of mind that you'd like to share with, with the team? Yeah, no, I think there's, I mean, the, the, you know, we're, we're um, you know, fundamentally, I, I can't emphasize enough, the, the, um, the chiplet architecture that we put together, so this is where we had, you know, an IO die with the, the chiplets around it. This is what enables us to scale. It enables us to go up to 96 cores, but down to 16 cores, or even eight cores. Right, and it's it's a combination of having um, ha having uh, th these pieces separated, not not really depending on monolithic design. So we think about our our reassert uh, uh, um, our surgeons in the in the uh, data center and CPU space. It's really been around, you know, kind of an architectural innovation, uh, you know, as well as being able to hit the latest uh, process nodes, uh, you know, and being able to, you know, do seven nanometer, five nanometer on time, right? So, in addition to that, this this architectural innovation has really been been uh, been absolutely key, um, you know. So, I mean, one of the things, you know, we really are seeing a lot of success in the market, you know, because of it uh, and the, the ability to scale. So, we're probably about now. Uh, some analysts, I guess you have to look at you have to look at um, uh, the actual estimates, but they're they're saying that we're hitting about 30% of the overall server CPU market. So that's fairly significant, right? For, for, from uh, you know from a uh, adoption standpoint, and part of it's the flexibility that this architecture gives us. Yeah, it's really significant, and there's a tremendous amount of innovation, and really. 
what I like about it, being an old school data center person from sort of the data center side into the compute side and, and, and so on and so forth, is that you just have a tremendous amount of flexibility. And so for me, it's always about what am I doing? How does that impact the ultimate cost and the outcome that I'm trying to deliver? And you, you, you can actually really customize what that outcome is going to be if you look across the entire uh, lineup of what you're delivering, which is great. So we're certainly looking forward to doing more with you. I think that's one of the questions from uh, that, you know, hey, what, what, are, you, what are you and, and AMD going to be doing and what are you looking forward to doing together with Cisco? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think a Cisco and AMD is one of the best partnerships out there, right? I mean, there's so much IP in Cisco and so much innovation um, and so much capability as a company. And then you, you, you bring the ingredient of AMD um, as a platform, you know, both in terms of, you know, the like the chiplets as being a fundamental ingredient, but overall just the, the, the partnership together to be able to go build, build innovative platforms together. I, I really feel like we're at the beginning of this journey together, right? Now you're going to see a lot of great things uh, between Cisco and AMD come out in the next, you know, the, uh, the next years, right, uh, as, as we uh, grow together. Uh, but definitely a huge, huge uh, partnership between us. Yeah, I mean, we're super excited. And in fact, a lot of people probably don't recognize this, but Lisa Sue's on our board. Oh, right. Yeah, and that's so right, that's a that's pretty right. good connection. Uh, and, and we absolutely love working with AMD. And I'm, like I say, very excited about the technology innovation. It speaks for itself, right? You don't go from uh, low single digits to 30% of the market in a couple of three, four years if you weren't doing some pretty innovative things. And so uh, from an industry perspective, it's really neat to see, you know, uh, yeah. I think. Uh, we're, we're certainly excited to figure out how we can take those chips, put them in our building blocks, and help yeah. further customize that outcome for customers. But, yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's been uh, it's been quite the quite the journey to, to to date. We're really looking forward to working closely with Cisco in the next uh, next generation. Yeah, and like I said, it's just the beginning. Yeah. But with that, we'd like to thank everybody for coming, yeah. and have a great Cisco Live. Right. Thank you. Hybrid work is here, it's there, it's everywhere. But for someone to be able to work from here, or here, there has to be someone here, making sure everything is safe, secure, consistent. So go ahead, log in from here, dial in from here, sit in from here, assured that someone is here, with a view of everywhere, ready to fix anything, anytime, anywhere even here. That's because nobody, and I mean nobody, makes hybrid work work better. Cisco, the bridge to possible. We're all connected, which means the more healthy people we have in this community, the healthier this community, and this community, and every other community will be. Good health is made possible by great care. And great care is made even greater by connections. And only Cisco can securely connect patients, providers and staff with healthcare technology to power a more inclusive future for all. Between good health and great care, there's a bridge. My phone is at the center of my world. Life and work all in one wherever I am. And now with WebEx Go, I can easily balance both. Enterprise grade calling with my phone and an experience I'm used to. Personal calls are still on my plan and phone number. And for work, I make and receive calls on a dedicated business line with great call quality. I connect with clients, coworkers, you name it on a separate, secure mobile network without sharing my personal information. WebEx Go is built into iOS and Android, giving you the best possible calling experience. And that experience seamlessly extends across my WebEx workflow. Now I'm taking my business calling and my collaboration tools anywhere my work takes me. 
That's WebEx Go. Humans and nature. We're in this together. Yet nature has given and given. It's our turn to do more. Cisco Smart Building Solutions and our partners' technology benefit both humans and nature. Catalyst switches connect securely, delivering power over Ethernet, reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. Cisco Wireless and DNA Spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet. And collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hard work has its place, but when it comes to managing your network, you want to work smarter, not harder. You want to accomplish more and stress less. That's where the next generation AI-powered Cisco DNA Center comes in. It simplifies operations through automation and shortens response times. So tasks that took days are done in minutes and sometimes don't need to be done at all. With Cisco DNA Center, you'll have the superpower of teleportation to virtually see and adjust your wireless coverage in any space in your network. You'll have AI-driven security to classify endpoints and enforce security policies across domains. And you'll be seamlessly integrated into the broader Cisco ecosystem for an unparalleled end-to-end -end network management solution, which means you'll spend less time worrying about your network and more time innovating. A cyber attack can grind everything to a halt. Cisco Security keeps your network and your company moving forward. Because if it's connected, it's protected. Cisco. A classroom is no longer a room. It's wherever a student is. It's wherever curiosity plants a seed in a mind, sprouts wildly, and then demands to be fed. More, more, more. It's wherever someone asks why, or how, or what's at the bottom of a black hole. A classroom is anywhere in the world where there's a student eager to learn. Through secure remote and hybrid learning, Cisco has created the world's largest digital classroom. And we're making education possible for millions of students in countries all around the world, powering an inclusive future of learning for all. Between curiosity and knowledge, there's a bridge.
neither. How can I help? Hi, uh, I have a few questions about the family savings plan. Can I set this up so that any member of our family can contribute to the savings plan? I'm actually not sure, but I can contact an expert for you if you can give me one second. Okay, great. Hey, I have a special request from a customer. I'm pretty sure Plan 3C should allow for this. All right, great. I have found a plan that is going to work really great for you, and if you're ready, I'll send you a secure link right away. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone and welcome back here in the Cisco Live TV studio. We're still in Amsterdam and I hope you enjoyed the talk about modern, modernizing your data center with uh, Jeremy and Kumaran uh, earlier. Um, so yeah, it's so great to have you here on the live stream. We're still in the hub here in the Ryan Amsterdam. And you know, this is, this is flying by. Time is just flying by. We're already in the mid, like half of the first uh, day here at Cisco that we're streaming here for you. So I am enjoying it so much. As I said, it was my first time here at Cisco Live, but in the meantime, I was able to like have a wander around in the world of solutions. Um, I was in the sustainability zone earlier, as you saw as well. And I'm actually planning of like just meeting up with some more people later today. We're gonna like go to the Cisco store later on as well, where you can find more about uh, Cisco's merchandise. Um, but I mean, I, I am a, I'm so interested in merchandising. Like I have so many things at home. I got so many things here already. I think all of my co-producers are quite jealous about all of the stuff I have. I've been collecting everything. Um, but yes, no. So I think it would be really cool if we maybe can uh, kind of go into some social media part, right? Like. Um, we are still uh, streaming live at, at Cisco.com, uh, but also we have the hashtag, so let us know, hashtag Cisco Live EMEA, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're excited about, what were you excited about in the keynote, in the innovation talks, uh, just let us know. So I have Twitter open here, so I'm just gonna have a scroll through um, and I can see just people like meeting uh, at certain booths. Um, I can also see just people talking about the keynote, what they liked about Wendy um, and, and team that what they announced there. Um, I really liked Wendy's uh, actually blue dress. I think it was Cisco blue to be honest, which is a very good choice Wendy, like it's Cisco proved right now and Cedric proved. Um, so yes, but I think niche is for us in the world of solutions right now. So. Let's go there, Nish. How are you? Yes, I'm good, Cedric. Thank you so much. I'm in the Cisco Insider area of the World of Solutions. I'm here with Caitlin Ross. She is the lead for Cisco Insider. So let's start with Caitlin. What is Cisco Insider? Sure. So Cisco Insider is Cisco's central hub for our customers, their networks to connect with one another, learn from product experts, and kind of grow their network here at Cisco Live and beyond. And we talk about the community that comes together at Cisco Live. Networking is a big part of that. Um, so why should a customer join Cisco Insider? What's in it for them? Absolutely. So the wonderful thing about Cisco Insider is that there's multiple opportunities to engage with the wider communities and offerings here. So we've got four main ways that folks can connect and communicate with each other here at Cisco Live and beyond. The first one being Cisco Insider Advocates, uh, which is a global online community for people to connect with one another. We've got Cisco Insider Champions, which is our digital evangelist community, which is an application-based program. We have user research here as well, where we're doing surveys and getting an understanding of folks' feedback about how we can improve our products. And then we also have user group as well, which is giving exclusive access and opportunities to register for product roadmap sessions and learn more from each other. 
Got it. And obviously, you know, this is a really buzzing booth. I think every seat I can see around me is taken. Everybody's kind of camping out here and wants to experience all four areas, right, that are just there um, behind as well. So what would you say is kind of the highlight of this area or, you know, what should really people be taking away from Cisco Insider this week? Absolutely. I would say for me personally, one of the wonderful things about Cisco Insider is it's a bit of a choose your own adventure. We have so many folks come through here with different levels of interest and different experiences that they want to share with each other and share with us at Cisco Insider. So folks can come in and enjoy a customer spotlight session. They can connect with other evangelists at Cisco Champions, have exclusive access to talks. And we also have a customer award session taking place at 4 p.m. on Wednesday here within the hub. Love that. So customers also have an opportunity to kind of celebrate their peers as well through these awards. Um, you obviously mentioned the user research and the user group. So can you just clarify what's the difference between a Cisco Insider user group and user research? And in which cases should people you know, join which activity and group? Absolutely. Totally fair question. So for user research, what we're doing here this week is we've got a whole wall of opportunity, literally and physically, <laughs> where people can kind of share what they wish for Cisco uh, products and Cisco services. So we're taking physical feedback in sticky notes and we're running surveys and opportunities for people to share their experiences on site. User group, on the other hand, is a registration-based uh, community where people can come in and learn from each other, product experts, and get that access to product roadmap sessions, which are exclusive just to them. Got it. And, um, you know, you talked about some of the reasons why customers should join Cisco Insider, you know, for, in terms of what's in it for them. Can you give us a sneak peek as to some of the fun perks they get? You know, what happens behind the scenes that makes this a really fun community to be part of? Yes, absolutely. So it really depends, again, on that choose your adventure piece. So, for example, we have opportunities available for executives within advocacy. So we were just launching a Cisco Insider executives community where people can kind of elevate and even beyond and connect with their peers there. We have a couple of opportunities to get rewarded, again, with either status or opportunities that they may not have otherwise. And that's for people here on site at Cisco Live, but then also online as well. There's a lot taking place behind the scenes. Amazing. Thank you so much, Caitlin. So things to do here at the event in Amsterdam. Things for people to do at home as well. Take action and get involved with Cisco Insider. All right. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Back to you in the studio, Cedric. Great. Thank you, Nis. And also good to hear from you, Caitlin. I am going to go to the Cisco research group, the user research group there, because I found out yesterday that you can hear that you can win wonderful prizes there, and I need to have some more swag. Um, so, you know, I'm going to give it a shot there and, and kind of help, uh, help the guys out there. Um, so we have listened before to um, the talk with Rebecca um, about simplifying your network experiences. So if you've missed that, we're replaying that at 4 p.m. CET uh, today. So just make sure to, to, to kind of look back at that. Uh, but I think we can roll, but um, before, we, before we roll a video, because there's a really cool video that's coming up um, about uh, uh, DNA Center and working smarter. Um, there is also so much, so many things here, like we're all in, as we said, it's our tagline. I can see people just walking around. It's really nice to be crowded. I can see people in lines everywhere for coffee, for, um, for store waffles, as we said before. It's, it's some really great food. Um, and so on and so on. So it's a really good opportunity like to meet here with your peers, to meet here with your colleagues, to meet here with your friends, and just maybe talk to Cisco, talk, like catch up on life. Like this is what it's all about. It's all about being here and ex experiencing Cisco life together, right? Um, I think um, Rob is actually very close to me right now. I think he's just there um, in the definite zone. So Rob, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm so excited not only to get to walk you through the DevNet Zone, one of my favorite areas that continues to grow and morph and add more value as they become so much more integrated within Cisco at every single level. You know, DevNet's not its own thing. It's really how it works, how everything actually works together. And it really is the dawn of where everything is going. My good friend Jason Davis happens to be here. So good to see you, my man. I wonder if you could just give us a quick 30 second overview of kind of the space as it's laid out now and what we could expect. And then I'm going to walk everybody through it. Sure. Uh, well, the DevNet Zone is broken up into an area for people to go have more individual discussions with subject matter experts. It could be Meraki experts or developer experts. And then farther down, we have our classrooms and work areas where people can just hear from the subject matter experts in a dedicated session. So it's a lot of fun. There's some robot things to do back there and, and a lot of working areas with laptops where people can try things out. Well, this is perfect. We're not going to show what's on your screen, but it's funny because you're coding, it looks like. 
I don't even stop. Your mind never stops going. But thank you for everything. Let's take a look around real quick, guys. I'm going to do the backing up because I promised Steve that I would try to back up a little more often. If you look over here, yeah, it might be the last time I do it. Obviously, these are the DevNet Lightning Talks. So this is more of the smaller sessions, a little bit more Q&A focused and such here, but they get through those relatively quickly. Follow me. Now, as we get into this area here, there's some very smart people. There's one of them that all run, some of the people that put this entire area together. How well, good to see you. And as you look in here, so, okay, we have Meet the Developer, they've got the calendar layouts. Everything here now starts to gamify some of the learning because there's no reason not to start learning more of these things and why not have fun with it? In fact, over here, these guys are answering questions. And so the better they answer the questions, the faster these vehicles are gonna go. And as you see this one example, they must not be answering anything correctly because their cars are not moving. But there's some kind of haul and butt right around the corner down below. Now we get into the workshops. Now look at the beard on that presenter. I forget his name, I should know it. But one of the many, many smart people talking in detail here in the DevNet zone as they get deeper and deeper into everything that can be done. Again, this touches every single product line. So we're gonna do the best we can with me, with me losing pace here. I'm gonna try and not lose my breath, but I gotta start walking forward. Now, this is DevNet Workshop 1, as I'm just reading it. But everybody here has got a laptop in front of them. They are working on the actual examples that the instructor is going through so that they can figure out, okay, how's this gonna work in my situation? So it's very, very hands-on. Steve, I'll have you turn around again. Every single section has a nice digital board laying out what kind of sessions you can expect coming up next. In fact, I think there's a big network takeover in another one of the big areas over here. There's so much to take advantage of, but what I like is it's a focus on learning, always about learning. So the big DevNet Classroom 2, it's amazing how much space they dedicate to all the learning and exposure here. This here is obviously in a break, but it's another area for more group size learning, some interactivity, but not as much. They don't have the room for the laptops. And then come down here. Now look at, I'm gonna turn you around again. They are, the network takeover is happening here in this particular space, uh, the DevNet Theater. This is the big main theater. Everybody here is just listening and absorbing, but they go into quite a few topics as well. Classroom One's currently in transition, so they have nothing going on here. Everybody's laying around checking their messages. And just to orient ourselves in the hall, so as we look across here, the Cisco Insider Group, Cisco Champions, what used to be known, the gateway and everything you can find there. This is where you can cut across to the world of solutions through the big hall in the middle. The Cisco Theater over here has got big topics at various levels. And then as you come over here, the technical solutions clinics, let me show you this. So there was an area, there was one of my favorite ones from a Cisco perspective over the years going to what was first, I think it really started with networkers before it became Cisco Live. And that was what I always called the whiteboard farms. So now instead of whiteboards, finally this thing has been updated, it's all digital boards. And so as you go in here, now this is where you can interact with engineers, grab a pen and start outlining specific challenges you're having with your network or questions you have with networking in general and an engineer can work with you on that specific technology. All right, with that, I'm gonna throw back over to the studio. Guys, there's our tour. Great, thank you so much, Rob, for such an extensive tour. And I think also what you did is you showed that you can talk with our engineers, which is also one of the reasons to come to Cisco Live. You can have first-hand experience with our engineers, talk about your issues that you have, and we can try to help and solve you, solve them. We're going to explore more from the hub and from the world of solutions later today, uh, later this week, sorry. I'm getting a little bit <laughs> in advance. But um, yeah, so we're going to explore uh, about that later. Um, so I think we're going to like roll a video right now. Yes, thank you so much for staying uh, with me. Um, we are, uh, we just saw the video, right? We're just about 15, 15 minutes, 20 minutes out from the, uh, from the next innovation talk. But before we head there, um, we're just gonna watch a quick video from Thousand Eyes right now, um, and I'll see you soon.
Yes, hi again. Yeah, we're just a few minutes out for of our next item, so it's probably the time to get a coffee and to get uh, comfortable in your couch. Um, maybe a strobe waffle, actually, if you have them at home. Maybe if you're in the Netherlands, like you know. Um, so it's uh, it's a really cool uh, innovation talk that's coming up. Um, so stay tuned, and we'll see you soon. Hard work has its place, but when it comes to managing your network, you want to work smarter, not harder. You want to accomplish more and stress less. That's where the next generation AI powered Cisco DNA Center comes in. It simplifies operations through automation and shortens response times. So tasks that took days are done in minutes and sometimes don't need to be done at all. With Cisco DNA Center, you'll have the superpower of teleportation to virtually see and adjust your wireless coverage in any space in your network. You'll have AI-driven security to classify endpoints and enforce security policies across domains. And you'll be seamlessly integrated into the broader Cisco ecosystem for an unparalleled end-to-end -end network management solution, which means you'll spend less time worrying about your network and more time innovating. A cyber attack can grind everything to a halt. Cisco Security keeps your network and your company moving forward. Because if it's connected, it's protected. Cisco. How do you elevate hybrid work? hear you. Okay, we're back. Start my meeting. curiosity plants a seed in a mind, sprouts wildly, and then demands to be fed. More, more, more. It's wherever someone asks why, or how, or what's at the bottom of a black hole. A classroom is anywhere in the world where there's a student eager to learn. Through secure remote and hybrid learning, Cisco has created the world's largest digital classroom. And we're making education possible for millions of students in countries all around the world. Powering an inclusive future of learning for all. Between curiosity and knowledge, there's a bridge. 
hello again. There are a lot of hellos today. Um, but yes, I am really excited still to be here. It's exciting to have you here. Um, I want to see those emojis coming in, right? Um, and I think we're going to get loads of emoji emojis uh, about what Nish is going to talk about next. She is in uh, the world of solutions, and she's at the Thousand's Eyes uh, part or stand. So Nish, are you there? All right, thank you, Cedric. I am here. I'm in the Thousand Eyes booth in the World of Solutions. My goodness, you can probably hear behind me the energy. Everyone's kind of had lunch, then are wandering around, seeing what the show has to offer. So yeah, Thousand Eyes, I'm here with Ian Waters. He is the director of Thousand Eyes Marketing in EMEA. So welcome, Ian, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. All right, let's start with what is Thousand Eyes? Give us a quick kind of 30 second, you know, summary. Well, we've been doing a lot of that this week on the stand because it's a pretty common question that we're getting from the, um, the customers as they come. So Thousand Eyes is a cloud and internet intelligence platform. We're a SaaS platform. We basically exist to let our customers see, understand, and improve the quality of the network experience that their users are getting, regardless of whose network it is. Got it. And I know Thousand Eyes is an acquisition that Cisco made. I think this is the team's first Thousand Eyes, um, sorry, first Cisco Live in EMEA as part of Cisco. Tell me what the experience has been like. Are you having a good time? We are. We've been uh, very busy. We've been doing uh, lots of demos. So the Thousand Eyes platform is something that, that demos really well and people understand it when they see it in action. So we've done a lot of that. Um, we had been at Cisco Live previously, but the pre-acquisition. Pre Obviously now we've got a, a bigger stand, a bit more interest, a bit of a bigger organization, so it's, it's pretty lively. And you're here as part of the, the hosting organization, which is fun. I always describe Cisco Land almost as like a Disneyland for technology in the sense of you look around, everything here is hosted by Cisco. Um, so we've got a presentation, an innovation talk that's going to be starting soon that's really heavily featuring Thousand Eyes. Tell me a little bit around what you think customers, partners should be listening out for. What you know, do you want them to take away about overall like Thousand Eyes presence at Cisco Live this year? So the, uh, the session which is just about to start, we have Moet Ladd who's um, our general manager, but also one of our co-founders. So he's going to be on stage. He's also going to be joined by Karen Bullen, who's the head of networks for EasyJet. So you may have heard about EasyJet from Liz and Tony in the keynote this morning. Uh, so Karen's going to give us a little bit more detail about how they're using Thousand Eyes and the FSO solution in general. Uh, so that'll be exciting. And then Moet's got a, a couple of new uh, product announcements to make. So I won't steal his thunder. I'll let him, him do those. But uh, they should be pretty interesting for anybody who's got an interest in the platform. Got it. And obviously this booth, we're going to squeeze through here in a minute and hopefully we can find some space to be able to do that because it's so busy. Um, we've seen so many demos happening on all of these different screens. Are there any common challenges, any common things that customers are saying that you want to share with the, the audience that we have at home? So I think, well, it's been timely, actually. We've had a, a few outages happening this morning, so and they've been affecting the Microsoft 365 suite in particular. So we've been digging into that. Customers, you know, do like to try to assure their their key productivity apps like 365. Uh, we've also been hearing a lot, a lot of customers who are moving to, to SD-WAN with Cisco and how we complement that solution. Uh, but it really, it's been a, a broad range of use cases we're hearing. I and mean, people are doing a, a lot of transformation in their uh, corporate networks. And they need visibility of things like the internet and the cloud and SaaS to, to go with that. And that's where we come in. Really. Got it. And I'm going to take away all possibility of bias here. So you can't answer the thousand eyes. But what's been your favorite thing you've seen at the show so far? I have been on the stand demoing for most of the time, so I actually haven't really been much past this space. So I will have to go and, uh, and check out the rest of the floor later. Yeah, for sure. We'll make sure that you get some time to do that. All right, well, let's head through here now. We're going to head over and we're going to see Pablo Martin. Pablo is the director of Thousand Eyes um, in EMEA as well. So Pablo, how are you doing and what have you got to show us? Hello, Nish. Very good. How are you? I'm great, thank you. So obviously I was just saying now to Ian, lots of different demos going on here at the show. What are you showing in this one around predictive network insights? So what we're doing here is showing you an example of an outage that happened, a disruption that happened around two weeks ago for some of Microsoft services and some of Azure hosted services as well. So two weeks ago, we saw for a number of different end users here all around the world that SharePoint and other services had experiencing issues with accessing that application. So all of these users effectively in this interval in time around the course or the span of two hours almost were unable to get to that application. So their end user experience is halted, you know, employees are going to be affected. They're not going to be able to work efficiently and effectively. So an enterprise needs to know why that is, why my employees cannot get to these services, right? And, and what we care about is 
reducing the time it takes to identify that problem so you're alerted on the problem and then you go back to the data to resolve and identify the issue and the root cause. So when we look at end users and the application experience, we need to know is this application experience halted because of an issue with the network, so you transport to get to the application, or is it just merely the SaaS provider, the Office 365 provider? If we go down to the network layer, and that's why we run different tests in different layers, we're able to show you a map of those end users going to SharePoint and see quite effectively at the same time the issues were seen for the application, we see quite some packet loss. So we know that there is a network issue, right? Now, what we need to understand is whether the network issue is happening, right? So if we scroll down, we'll be able to see a perspective from all of the end users sitting all across the world, all transiting through the internet until they get to that application, right? Now, if I click here on show me the nodes have more than 10% packet loss, I'll start to see in the map where those nodes are having that forwarding loss, right? So we're in the internet that is happening. So in a matter of minutes, I can show you, okay, Microsoft is having an issue in their network and we are not able to get to the application because effectively the transit to get there is interrupted, right? And if I can go back to the different layers where we actually see the testing in Thousand Eyes, we're able to show you how that prefix is advertised towards the internet. So SharePoint in this case is hosted on a prefix somewhere on the internet. And if I scroll down to the visualization, I can see that same prefix being propagated by Microsoft and a lot of different changes happening for those routes to get to different parts of the world, right? So there is some instability in the routing layer of the internet, and therefore, they're gonna have end user issues when accessing um, SharePoint in this case, or any other Office 365 um, application. So effectively, what our customers can do by using Thousand Eyes is, you know, be alerted on the issues that they see when accessing a SaaS application and get down to the root cause in a matter of a few clicks to then escalate to Microsoft and enforce SLAs and ensure that you don't escalate to their uh, internal teams, don't go into war rooms, you don't lose time into looking into issues so as to operationally deliver that digital experience to employees. Got it. And, you know, if I may say so, that is beautiful. I don't know whether that's a word that will only be used at Cisco Live for a screen, right? But I think that's helping a lot of uh, different, you know, IT teams to really make things simpler and have everything, you know, in a way where you can visualize it really well and, and make things simple and easy for our customers. Exactly. It's how to understand the Internet in a simple way for everyone to be able to operate. So, um, Pablo, I was just chatting to Ian now. Obviously, this is the first Cisco Live that Thousand Eyes is part of in EMEA as part of Cisco. So, tell me, what's your experience been like at your first Cisco Live as part of Cisco? Cisco Live as part of Cisco? It's great, honestly. It's so I'm I'm happy to see customers and partners attending Cisco Live, uh, delivering you know demos and going into meetings every day. Uh, it's a great experience, and looking forward to meeting more partners and customers throughout the week. Got it. And obviously, you showed us the predictive network insights part of the Thousand Eyes booth. In about 60 seconds, can you kind of summarize what else is going on? Because there's obviously there's a lot of a customer attention being brought here. So tell me a little bit around what else is happening in the booth today. Yeah, so we have, you know, tailored pods for different kinds of demos. We have SD1, we have SaaS delivered uh, or SaaS monitoring uh, applications uh, for demos as well. Uh, we have certain mini sessions where you can go into a deep dive into one of our technologies, like some of our actually uh, announcements that are going to be made for Thousand Eyes in, in the next session, right? So uh, feel free to come by, swing by, and, and let us know how we can help you. Got it. Thank you so much. And obviously, you know, we're here in the world of solutions. There is just so much here to do. I just want to ask you finally, Pablo, obviously we have the innovation talks that are coming up as well, right? So we have, you know, I don't know if you've had a chance to walk around the world of solutions yet. I know Ian was saying he spent a lot of time in the booth. Have you had a chance to see anything and what stood out to you? Yeah, no, I've been flickering through some booths and stuff, seeing some old colleagues from the wider Cisco teams as well. But, um, no, definitely uh, something to 
to get maybe later on in the week when I get a free slot and, and go and see some customers. And, right, and you know, yeah, for sure. And you know, we're quite lucky because as part of the hosting team, we get to walk around all of the event and you know, take the event back to everybody that's there on the broadcast, whether it's the demos that we have here, the innovation talks, the keynotes. I have to say the orange juice stand, I think next to you and the street waffles are quite popular. So you're getting a lot of traffic. I'm sure it's the product and the technologies and not the orange juice. But thank you so much for spending time with me. I'm going to head back to the studio now. Cedric, over to you. Nish, 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 you are having so much fun there in the world of solutions and I want to touch on two things. You have a lovely dress on today, that's the one. And also the second one is, I love it how you describe Cisco Live as the Disneyland for adults. Like, I mean, I think I, think I would, you know, I would love to be here uh, as a kid actually as I, and, and walk around. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm actually getting a little bit sad because like we're actually coming kind of close to the end of the day, to the first day, to my first uh, day at Cisco Live, my first ever Cisco Live. Uh, but it doesn't stop here, right? Like we're gonna explore more tomorrow. We have uh, exciting sessions coming up about IoT, about FSO, so full stack observability. Um, we're also gonna talk about zero trust, um, and we'll have more demos with hybrid work um, and the Cisco Collab team. So. This was just in the uh, world of solutions. We're going to talk more about Thousand Eyes. Um, and we're actually going to talk about when we're going to go to the innovation talk where they talk about identifying the um, problems. The, sorry, I'm, I'm getting that wrong. Um, identify the internet problems before they're actually becoming a, a user, uh, end user problems. Well, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting day today. Um, but yes, yeah, so I can see already that they're like um, setting up the theater. So we're going to get there very soon. But before we go there, Keep remembering, like, let us know how you're feeling. Let us know what you're looking at, what you're liking. Use the hashtag, hashtag Cisco Life EMEA. I will be scrolling through your tweets personally. Um, I might respond to one. I don't know. Um, but yes, so if you've missed anything as well, like, go to CiscoLive.com. We're going to make this available on demand for you. And also, don't forget, like, we have the emojis on the left-hand side. And you can watch uh, the live stream here, live captioned uh, in eight languages. So. Um, that's something really cool as well. Um, we're having a great day here. As you can see, it's very sunny in Amsterdam. Um, it's still a little bit cold, uh, but I can uh, think that we can go over to the talk right now in the Innovation Theater. So thank you so much. Enjoy the talk and see you soon. And ultimately deliver optimal experiences to your end users. Please welcome Mohit Lad. Right, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Thousand Eyes, which means I'm responsible for pretty much anything you do not like about Thousand Eyes. So if you have a list of complaints, make them now. And we talk a lot about signal and noise and separating signal from noise, and there isn't another better example than the signal and noise in this area here. So hopefully you're able to hear me uh, and follow through this presentation. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Thousand Eyes. Just show of hands, how many people know Thousand Eyes? Right, that's good. Uh, so if you know Thousand Eyes, we're going to tell you more. For those who don't know Thousand Eyes, we're going to tell you a bit about Thousand Eyes. And I always believe in this notion of uh, we want to show more, than, uh, more in real product than slides. So we have a few slides, but there's two highlights that you have to look forward to. One is Jason's going to show up come up on stage and, and actually show you real data, real events, even including the outages that happened as recently as a couple of weeks ago. And then we have a customer, uh, Karen from EasyJet, who's going to share her experience. So those are the two highlights that I'm going to try to um, make sure we don't delay. So before we go into Thousand Eyes, it's really around why, what's changed that is important. And I think the crux of this is we're living in a very different world where everything is becoming more and more fragmented. Apps are moving out, people are moving out, the enterprise perimeter is no longer a perimeter, it's a borderless network. That's the reality of what today's enterprise looks like. And if you think about digital experience, it's, it's going across all these different elements. It's DNS, CDN, data centers, home environments. And traditional monitoring has been very focused on looking at what's going through a device. But as you think about the digital experience and the end-to-end -end chain, you don't control the devices anymore. And so we have this notion of a borderless enterprise and the fact that your responsibility of digital experience doesn't end where your purchases end. And what I mean by that is you, know, you purchase routers and switches and all that, and that's the periphery typically, but that's not where your responsibility ends. 
So if you think about these trends, really, cloud is the new data center. SaaS apps like Office 365 are the new app stack. <laughs> Home is the new office. This has especially been accelerated over the last two or three years, and this really makes the internet the new network. And what is really incredible is the amount of dependencies that are external to your environment that are becoming a fabric of what you are responsible for. When, when this happens, you obviously lose visibility and control. And what is really critical is this massive bind spot that is being created that you're responsible now to manage, right? Is it DNS? Is it CDN? Where is it breaking? And I'll tell you what. I've, we started the company after seven years of research doing a PhD in internet, and we, saw, we thought we knew every way the internet would break, and 13 years later, there's still new ways people break the internet. There's still new ways people break systems. So the possibility of scenarios is near infinite. And I'll share one quick story before I hand it off to Jason. When we moved to our first proper office as a startup in San Francisco, uh, we started in 2010. 2020, we were acquired by Cisco. We'll talk about that in a bit. But when we moved to our first office, this was in 2011 in San Francisco, the lights would go off at 7 PM to save energy. It's a culture of like saving energy. And at 7 p.m., we had to pick up the phone, like a, hand, a, a physical line that was attached to the wall. We would pick up that phone, dial a number, and enter a four-digit code to turn the lights back on. That was the system to have the lights back on, which makes sense. For about seven days, it made sense for us because we were working till 9 p.m., and then we were, my, my co-founder said, this is stupid. We can't do this. We have to automate it. And so he, um, he wrote a script with Twilio. Are you familiar with Twilio? the API automation for uh, SMS, et cetera. So he wrote a script with Twilio. And at 6.59, we would run this cron job to automate the whole process of turning the lights on, which worked for about a week. And then the lights go off. And if you were a normal person, when the lights go off, the first thing you would do is you would walk up, pick up the phone, and turn it on. But we were debugging the code in the dark, trying to figure out what broke. And what we found was that Twilio was fine. Our script was fine. but it was hosted, Twilio was hosted on Amazon in the East Coast data center, and there was a power outage because of a storm. So because of that, Twilio actually had an issue. As a result, our, our script was not working. And think about that. Our lights in our office in San Francisco were controlled by an Amazon outage on the East Coast of the data center. So that's the, the new reality of what you live in, uh, and that is what we're going to talk about. Uh, we are in this business of really helping you understand every digital experience, no matter where the boundaries are of what you own and what you don't own. And there's two things that we can promise to you. One is help you see beyond your environment, not just from a network, but an application experience standpoint. And the second is to help you collaborate better with third parties. And this is one of the things that is very unique to Thousand Eyes. If you think about every SaaS company that you may rely on, pretty much every one of them uses Thousand Eyes. So if you see an issue with the Salesforce, you can actually share data with them. So that is the promise. And in order to see this in action, I want to invite Jason Warfield to the stage, who's going to share a little bit more and show you how the product actually works. Thank you, Mohit. Cisco Live Amir. So uh, I had to wait three years since the Thousand Eyes acquisition to be here. So if you can't tell by the big smile on my face, I'm incredibly excited to be here. Um, what I want to walk you through before I dive into the actual demo is our three primary use cases. And uh, my role here at Thousand Eyes, I lead the solution engineering and adoption engineering teams. And we work with customers closely every day to really show and prove the value of the technology. And it really centers around you know, three use cases focused on the first being what we call customer digital experience. So think about any internet-facing, revenue-generating, or citizen-facing service, helping you assure a consistently great experience no matter where in the world they're accessing that service and no matter when they're accessing that service. And the way we do that is by leveraging over 600 points of presence around the world to help you understand the user journey, accessing the service, all the different providers that they traverse across the internet that delivers that service, as well as the ecosystem that supports delivering the service, whether that be content delivery networks or the actual data centers in which the application is hosted. That could be on-premise, that could be in the cloud, it could be a hybrid deployment, but having visibility into that full ecosystem to allow you to consistently deliver great service to your customers. The second is around workforce digital experience. 
So how many people here work at least part-time remote? So Workforce Digital Experience really helps you assure productivity for your employees no matter where they choose to work. Um, part of that is making sure that they can access the applications and the services they need to do their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. But that also means that we extend that visibility down to the last mile in the local network on which they're connected to. Because a lot of times, the issue is not with the service or even the network transit. It's in the home, the coffee shop, on the plane, wherever that user may be working. And it can be very challenging to really support remote workers without the visibility uh, down to both the service and their user experience accessing the service, as well as you know, the full ecosystem, including the local network in which they're connected to. The last uh, major use case focuses on what we call enterprise digital experience. Uh, one example is as our customers have been reopening offices around the world, giving them data they can use to assure when employees come in and they work in an office that you know, they'll have a seamless, consistent, and great experience accessing the internal and SaaS applications they use. Another use case is focused around SD-WAN. And when you think about SD-WAN, uh, really being able to leverage Thousand Eyes across the full SD-WAN lifecycle. As you're selecting which service providers to use at a given location, using data to select the best service provider for that location. As you deploy, having visibility into the performance of the services being delivered across your SD-WAN environment. And then once you have uh, deployed and you're in production, being able to both assure the productivity of your users uh, as well as being able to leverage the data and the analytics to actually predict which path is best for a given site to optimize performance. So those are our three primary use cases. And as Mohit mentioned, let's uh, show them to you in action with a demo. So the first demo we're going to look at is uh, something that's been top of mind for our customers over the last couple of weeks. How many people in here were impacted in some way, shape, and form by the Microsoft outage on June, January 25th? So let's walk you through the, the visibility that Thousand Eyes provides in, uh, in the context of what we're looking at here first is a synthetic test that we have set up running to, our, uh, to uh, SharePoint, Microsoft SharePoint. And what this is is essentially a page load test, which help us understand the user experience. We're running this, this test from 22 locations around the world, or points of presence, leveraging our cloud agents so that we have visibility from you know, different, point, uh, different countries and cities globally. And what this allowed us to do is when the issue occurred, right now everything's green, everything looks great, users are able to access SharePoint and other services. However, if we move forward to 710 UTC, we can see that at this point, immediately, users around the world were having an issue. So you know, the first thing we understand is there's a definite impact from a user perspective not being able to access the services, the Microsoft 365, and as you'll see, other services. Uh, and really, the question that we help answer in real time is, is this an application issue or a network issue? Is it a issue you own and can fix, control and can fix yourself, or is it one you need to work with a provider? And then what's the root cause? So one of the things we can see here is users were having issues uh, from everything from trying to resolve the host name, trying to connect to the services, trying to get information back from the services, really all the way through the HTTP stack. So oftentimes, this is pretty indicative of a network problem. And we were able to ver validate that very quickly, or immediately, I should say, where we were able to see what we're looking at now at the top is the end-to-end -end loss uh, for all the sites in aggregate. So we know for, for a fact we're seeing a lot of network loss. And so we're highly confident this is a network issue at this point. We can look at loss per site if we wanted to do that. And when I talked about you know, Thousand Eyes being able to dynamically understand the user journey, what I mean by that is here we're representing user experience uh, for users in, in Tel Aviv. On the right-hand side, 
is the actual SharePoint service that we're providing visibility into. And every time we run our synthetic tests, we capture the, the, the path, or in this case, multiple paths the user actually takes to access that service. So uh, this is how we're able to quickly identify any issues in the root cause uh, of those issues. So we certainly see there's an impact in the Microsoft network, which is highlighted in this case by this um, red circle. But in this instance, we know this was actually a BGP-related problem. So if we scroll down and look at our, our BGP view, what this is really highlighting is the dotted lines are showing all the routes that were withdrawn. So essentially, at 710, we identified that uh, it, all, almost all of the route, BGP routes that Microsoft had established were withdrawn. And that's what uh, caused a direct impact on the users. It really started the chain of events that led to this outage. And if we simplify this a little bit and just look at it from one monitor, it's very interesting what we saw. So in this case, we're looking at, looking at this from one uh, BGP monitor's perspective. We see that the dotted line was the direct path between Tiggy and Microsoft. That was withdrawn, and we see that we, the path actually was extended, and we added a provider work online in between. However, what was most interesting is if we look at the actual path changes, we can see an incredible amount of flapping where routes were introduced, withdrawn, introduced, withdrawn, introduced, withdrawn. And that's why you saw there was in intermittent ability for some users to access the service throughout the outage. Uh, but because of all of these BGP route changes, users weren't able to consistently connect and actually interact with the services. And this went on for roughly an hour and a half and you know, I, I won't go through the, the whole time period, but I'll, I'll show you just visually um, how this looked, where we see routes withdrawn, routes added, routes withdrawn, and then about an hour in, hour and a half in, almost two hours in, we see that, let me go back one period, we see that the uh, BGP routes were restored for the most part and then we start to see the services from a user perspective improve and more, more users able to access the service. Um, so this is the type of visibility that Thousand Eyes provides for any digital service. And all this information is dynamically captured really from two pieces of information. The URL for the service, and in this case, the 22 cloud agents or 22 agents that you want to gain visibility from. And that could be a combination of cloud agents, which are over 600 points of presence around the world that we control, or agents you deploy inside networks you can control. The one other thing I'll highlight is, as part of this outage, it wasn't just the uh, Microsoft services that were impacted, but it was also other services that were hosted in Azure. So you see LinkedIn, SuccessFactors, SAP, and Netflix. All right, so the last demo I wanna highlight focuses on hybrid work. Uh, so here, what we're doing is providing visibility into end user experience, access and digital services from anywhere they work. And what I wanna highlight is a couple things. One, we have a number of different users there in the middle and there's a number of services they're accessing, one of which is Office 365. So we can see Office 365, the experience is uh, a lot worse than all the other services. So let's focus on that as part of this demo. Filter out everything else. And then what we see here is for Sean Eustace in particular, he's having an issue accessing Office I can see on the left that Sean, I can see his network uh, uh, connection in his home looks good. He's connected via Wi-Fi, gateway looks good, but between his gateway and the service, there's 90% loss. So there's certainly an issue uh, in the transit network in between, and being able to then drill into the network layer, being able to see the path that Sean's taking from his home, 
and then being able to identify, in this case, there's an issue inside the Microsoft network. You can identify the root cause of the problem, tell Sean, yes, we know you're having an issue. It's related to an issue in the Microsoft network. We'll reach out to Microsoft and, and get back to you. So let me wrap up there uh, from a demo perspective, because what I want to do is transition into uh, one wrap-up slide and then my favorite part of the uh, session. So in terms of the actual business impact that Thousand Eyes delivers to companies, uh, and this is from a uh, economic impact study we did, from an ROI perspective, being able to deliver 173% ROI, and a lot of that is driven by what you see here in that second box, having less than a six-month um, payback period. The reason why? we can very quickly and easily get going in terms of getting the service deployed, getting the Thousand Eyes adopted, and, and delivering and showing value. And, and literally, you know, with, from the first day of a deployment, you're immediately seeing value in terms of the visibility that we're delivering. In terms of productivity, being able to help increase productivity over 50%, uh, and you know, a large part due by being able to reduce um, the time it takes to identify and resolve outages. We've had customers literally have over 100 people on a conference bridge, internal, external providers, trying to figure out the root cause of a problem. Uh, they've looked in Thousand Eyes. They immediately identified you know, what the issue was, whether it's CDN or otherwise. 90 plus percent of the people were able to drop off the phone, and they could work with the provider to resolve the actual issue. And then being able to reduce both productivity and uh, the uh, impact in terms of revenue delivered back to the business. So with that, let me introduce Karen Bullen, Head of Technology, Networking, and Hosting at EasyJet. Hi, Jason. Hi, Karen. So I'm sure most people here know who EasyJet is. I hope but so. <laughs> <laughs> for the few who may not, could you please tell us a little bit about EasyJet as well as your role? Oh, sure, okay, yes. Uh, so EasyJet, uh, if you don't know, is a, a European airline. So um, our, our, one of our strap line is making uh, low cost travel easy. So, so that's what we're here to do. We are make here to, to get our customers to the places that we need to do. Um, so my role at EasyJet is the head of networking and hosting. So I'm accountable and responsible for um, anything we host, whether that's in data center or in the cloud, as we transform and move more to the cloud space. Connectivity, so as you mentioned, um, how our crew, um, how our uh, end users and our campus sites um, are connect, but also around our remote working as we are a hybrid uh, company in terms of workforce. Um, and then we've, what's more important here, we've also introduced observability and AI ops, as well as part of our full platform service. And could you share with us how EasyJet's changed since you joined the company? Yes, so I, joined, so I have a background in infrastructure and operations for the last uh, 20 years, um, and I joined EasyJet in 2021. Um, and we were just very much looking at uh, transforming these services that I've spoken about in terms of cloud um, and hosting and observability. So it's very much looking at uh, driving, uh, putting down the foundations uh, doing their transformation and then looking at that innovation piece going on. Um, and so we were very much looking about, in terms of business value, the uh, going to cloud, um, bringing that agility um, in how we can be a part of the market and you know, um, provide those services to our end customers in a much more agile and in uh, a better way, providing that value for our customers. And how have you been able to address and accomplish this? So as I said, we mentioned in terms of, um, it was uh, back in the summer of last year, um, as I said, we were just lying down the foundations in terms of observability. Um, and we worked with yourselves, um, and, it's, and it's great to have done that. So we looked at how we can get ourselves ready for summer flying 2022. Um, and our uh, enterprise stack of uh, monitoring tools wasn't really enough. Yeah, so we wanted to look about how we can, as you've mentioned, in terms of as we're moving to cloud, um, as we're using direct internet access, having those pieces, bringing them all together to have that full stack observability. So we partnered with yourselves, not doing a massive rollout, 
Um, we looked at our critical business services for flying and also for selling tickets, because obviously that's the heart of, of EasyJet. Um, and uh, we partnered with yourselves and were able to roll out uh, Thousand Eyes so from an enterprise point of view and from an endpoint uh, agent point of view to roll out um, the, the Thousand Eyes uh, across the business services that we wanted to concentrate on. And where would you say you've seen the most value from Thousand Eyes? Well, absolutely. It's been, it's been tremendous in terms of our journey working with yourselves. Um, very much in terms of what you're saying, in terms of the, the headline straps you had earlier. Um, it's around reducing that um, M MTTR, um, so the, uh, you know, the reducing that time to resolve or even identify um, potential incidents. Um, and that's what we've been very much looking at. So it just relieves that. So rather than spending hours trying to, to root, go through and find out where the root cause is, um, we are now sort of focusing much more on what the business value, really, in terms of rather than our engineering spending hours and hours on incident calls, and like you say, multiple people coming to those incidents, we now can focus those engineering capabilities um, in providing new services for the business and therefore our customers. And what are some of the lessons you've learned during this transformation, both positive as well as constructive? So in terms of uh, transformation, yes, so you know, we are moving away from uh, the network, but going through a data center. We're very much moving to the cloud, being the center of our network, um, and using the cloud services. So I think that's, that's really key to say, because that's going to add value um, and what we're going to do for our business. Um, but again, it's not a case of a big bang rollout, right? We are really concentrating on the value add, doing that proof of concept uh, with the critical services that we knew that we needed for being able to fly, um, being able to sell those tickets uh, to our customers. So it wasn't a big bang approach in terms of our rollout. And there's more to do, yeah? So we just laid down those foundations last year. So we're working with you to do more in that transformation. But then it's then moving across to innovation and that continual service improvement and optimization that's where we need to get to in the future yeah, it sounds like an agile approach and continue very much an agile approach exactly yes i love it uh and last question so looking forward what are some of your strategic priorities for easyjet yeah so it's so as i said if we're if taking using a thousand eyes or, or observability um, as a whole it's very much um we've gone through that reactive phase very much in that more proactive way of looking at it. And now it's, we're looking at more predictive, right? So we want to spot things before they happen. We want to be able to detect those anomalies, um, et cetera. So that's very much what we're looking forward to. Very much looking at the full stack of visibility and AI ops. That's what we're looking forward to next. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for joining us here today on stage. And uh, thanks for sharing your story. Thank you very much, Jason. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And Mohit, I, I know I said this was my favorite part of the session, but I, I love your presentation too. So let me <laughs> turn it back that. over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we're going to do a quick wrap here, but just let me just capture a few things that are critical. Uh, I mentioned earlier, it's been a two and a half year journey inside Cisco. And one of the things that has been really exciting is Thousand Eyes decodes the internet and these hybrid environments, and it, and it threads to every part of Cisco's business. So these are some of the core areas we are working in on full stack observability. You hear a lot about that. We're working closely with AppDynamics on that. There's a lot of work going on on hybrid work to support remote employees, work from anywhere, working with WebEx and AnyConnect and the likes. And then there's a bunch of uh, activities around just the WAN edge, secure access, et cetera, where we're doing a bunch of stuff with Cisco networking as well. Now, one of the announcements we have uh, at this Cisco Live is the support for open telemetry, OTEL. And this is one of the, the first kinds from the data we have. So it adds a new data set to everything you're building on your observability practice uh, and takes away all this bespoke integrations that you have to do. So we're excited about this. I think this is going to be big. And the first manifestation of this is our support for full stack observability. This is where we have uh, a really powerful integration with AppDynamics. We're able to really exchange data between the network and app tiers and really be able to correlate these things together. So this thing will only get better. And I encourage you guys to uh, go and check out the demos. There's various pods. There's the Thousand Eyes pod. There's AppDynamics. And there's also the FSO pod. So please do check it out. And then finally, uh, something really exciting. And this is where the power of Thousand Eyes coming inside Cisco is really, uh, really powerful. Uh, when we think about Thousand Eyes, 
for 10 years, we basically were building this picture of what's happening on the internet. And in the internet, you can't predict outages in a lot of scenarios because uh, when you have a beaver chewing on cables in Canada that takes down parts of the internet or an undersea cable being bitten or cut by a, uh, bitten by a shark or cut by a boat. So there's outages you can't predict, but you can see. That's the power of Thousand Eyes. But what we have realized is collaborating with groups inside Cisco, we can actually learn from behaviors within your local environments. And WAN Insights is about one of these where you can understand past behavior and be able to forecast certain kinds of issues, recommend optimal paths. This demos, the, the demo for this particular uh, capability is available on the Thousand Eyes demo booth, so please go check it out if you want to do more here, but more coming from a network AI ops standpoint. Uh, this is a code that we captured. I'll flash it for a second uh, from uh, someone who was uh, using WAN Insights, and it was really helpful to find the optimal default paths uh, without any configuration uh, hassles. Finally, here's what I'd like you to take away from this session. Uh, our, our entire journey is around helping you control every digital experience, no matter what. And so if you, if you think about issues that you're having that may not be with a specific server, it's just general digital experience issues, and you want to figure out what's, what's going on, that's where our power lies. So definitely check us out for that. And this is my last slide, a few action items. By the way, if, if you, um, you want to check out, a very simple thing to do with Thousand Eyes is thousandeyes.com slash outages. If you go to that portal, thousandeyes.com slash outages, you will see a live view of what's happening right now. If there's a key network outage or a key SaaS outage, that's one way to look at it. But please uh, check out the website, check out the booths that we have here, explore the website. We have a lot of blogs on past outages. We do actually always share live information anytime there's a major disruption. So you can subscribe to the blog and you can get all this information. And finally, talk to your Cisco rep. Uh, I know we all like human conversations again since we're getting back. So hopefully you can use the time to do that. Uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you, everyone. And uh, look forward to working with all of you. Cheers. All right, we are just out of an innovation talk. The session was called Identifying Internet Problems Before They Become End User Problems, and it's all about Thousand Eyes. We're here in the studio at Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. I'm joined by Tony Finn. Tony, you are the director of Thousand Eyes for sales in EMEA at Cisco, so I welcome. Am. Hi, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for having me. And um, just an apologies for the cup, because I'm running out of voice, so I need oh, it just in case. No, definitely, totally fine. So. We've obviously just come out of talking about Thousand Eyes just before this show here. I was in the booth and I was interviewing some of your colleagues. We've got a, um, a few demos. Congratulations, by the way, on the booth because it's a very popular booth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, we managed to weave in and out a little bit. Um, and we've obviously just come out of the innovation talk there where we had Mohit, um, who talked a little bit around Thousand Eyes and the capabilities and what we have to offer customers. So what are your thoughts on some of the announcements that he just shared? Well, um I mean, in, in terms of open telemetry, which we just heard about, for me, that's a game changer because it uh, takes the capabilities that Thousand Eyes has and all of the data that we're able to produce and allows an open platform approach, which means all sorts of other solutions that are out there could ingest that data, exploit and use that data for good for the customers. So for me, that's of the, all of the announcements, it's a great one. Um, and then I think on top of that layered is that first phase with that D because the full stack observability story we tell, and then in particularly ourselves with that D together, is equally game changing, but you kind of expand that and it becomes FSO on steroids. Right, and we heard from Ian and from Pablo in the booth earlier. This is the first Cisco Live EMEA that the thousand ITs have been part of as part of Cisco post acquisition, right? So yeah. what are you kind of taking in from being part of Cisco, being part of the host of, I guess, Cisco Live as well? What's the energy been like? Um, well, to be honest, this morning on the way in, I came in early and I um, did some recordings. In fact, I did a recording just over here and in right. that kind of mood booth, and it's astounding. I think you could almost use the word overwhelming. The enormity of everything is just on another level. Um, being part of such a big company when you're a startup and you're so small, um, I mean, it's it, also the culture has been wonderfully accommodating for us. So for me, when we were first acquired, I was, I was, you know, you were always a bit unsure. Right. Um, but it's been probably the best two and a half years of my career, and I've been around for a while. 
Oh, that's so good to hear. And obviously, we're here in EMEA, this is Cisco Live EMEA. So, um, EMEA is a special hub, right, for, for Thousand Eyes. I hear yes. it's a growth hub, it's an yep. innovation hub. Um, so, tell me a little bit around what Thousand Eyes EMEA presence is like. What's changed since acquisition? You know, obviously, you said best two and a half years of your career, I just heard. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell us a little bit about that and the growth you've been seeing and conversations with customers. What's been happening for you? Well, um, I mean, to put it into perspective as an objective, we tried to expand the EMEA business into being a significant contribution or participation in overall revenue for the company. And I can gladly say we've doubled in size since Amazing. the acquisition in EMEA, um, which is great. Well, great if you're running sales, right? <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. But I think being part of the um, Cisco business and that engine uh, in terms of how it opens doors into very large logos. So if you look at the kind of sales we're doing now, that's transformational stuff. Uh, we're more strategic in some of those discussions where we might have been quite tactical. We're now very involved in, in strategy. And, uh, you know, I meet customers who talk about thousand eyes in the same conversation as the necessity of, for argument's sake, you know, um, you know, CCTV. Right. So we've got CCTV for our real stuff and we've got thousand eyes for our digital stuff. So I think being inside of Cisco for us has been a huge opportunity. We've worked with some phenomenal people. We did a very quick alignment in the beginning and that made, made us join up very closely with our colleagues and we've benefited ever since. Well, that's so good to hear. And obviously, you know, we're surrounded by customers here, partners as well. Is there anything that you're hearing time and time again from customers in terms of the challenges that they're facing and then how the Thousand Eye Solutions kind of swoops in there and helps make their lives easier? Well, I think um, uh, in a way the question is, it should almost be um, pre and post. So I right. think before we were acquired, it was all about what we could do in network observability, right? And we've moved into this assurance for digital and, and, uh, and being joined with AppD and the whole FSO discussion has really uh, catapulted that, that storyline with customers. And I think customers were used to having many, many monitoring tools or many ways of looking at things, but never any single um, pane of glass or single way of looking at it in a correlated view. And I think we're transforming that space uh, in EMEA, you know, I, I, I'm a new generation of employee. I know that doesn't sound right when you look at my age, but <laughs> I interviewed digitally, so I didn't meet a colleague. In fact, I'm still meeting colleagues three years later for the first time now here at Cisco Live. That's what's so great about being back in person, right? You can feel that energy, yeah. and all those reconnections that people have made. And it's just... I've seen you on WebEx, and I'm great to see you, and you're taller than I thought you would be. Yeah, that's, uh... <laughs> that seems to be a common Actually, one. Actually, mostly I, I get you're a little bit shorter than you look on video. <laughs> but, um, but I think in answer to your question for us, um, because we're sort of emerging, what we have done a lot is borrow from the solutions we've already sold into successfully. I know you're, you're, you have a kind of industries vertical yes. background. Yeah. So we took banking, which we're very proud in and we just crossed it over. Um, so we're seeing the same sort of things, but the obvious suspects are there, like hybrid work. Right. Uh, we're, we're involved in, in discussions with companies like, we aren't going to bring everybody back to work. What does that mean? How can we have this kind of flex worker or fluid worker? We like to refer to them as a fluid worker. I might work in the office today, I might work tonight, and then tomorrow I might work You know, from... Uh, I, I met my first nomad worker the other day. Okay. They, they tried to do a different city every month. Oh, okay, that is a fun life to live. Absolutely, <laughs> and Thousand Eyes really works in that whole um, hybrid work environment very well. There are many other use cases, but I think hybrid, especially with, um, with COVID, has been a very prevalent uh, success for us. And so we had in the innovation talk just now, I think the example used was EasyJet, right? So, yes. So tell us a little bit around, could you kind of summarize, you know, what, what happened there? And then you, obviously we've been talking a little bit around industries, and I think you mentioned banking. How does the Thousand Eye solution, you know, as part of Cisco, help banking customers? And you, you mentioned it kind of translating through to all these other industries, right? So what are the kind of key things that customers should be listening out for where Thousand Eyes would be a really good fit? So I think um, probably to go to basics, we have three very specific solutions. There's four if you include insights, but we have an agent that sits on a device like the laptop in front of right? you. Okay. What does that mean from your client to wherever you're going, we can see what's going on. Um, in the middle of that, we have a cloud agent which sits in thousands of places in over 250 uh, cities in about 65 or 70 countries. And, and those are just out there waiting to be utilized on almost every network you can imagine in most clouds and software. On top of that, we have an enterprise agent which is integrated into the Cisco framework and, and infrastructure. Um, and typically what we're doing, if you were to summarize it in one thing is, if you're having a problem on your laptop getting to a particular software in the cloud, we can tell you exactly why you're having that problem and we can do it in four clicks. Got it. Why that's important is most companies are struggling to isolate and identify the problem. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars every 
time that happens and we can immediately recognize where the problem is so that the problem can be fixed as opposed to spending hours trying to find out where the problem is first. So I had single pane of glass, so easy, all in one place. I had yeah. cost savings, yes. what else, what did I miss? Well, efficiency, I, I, I'll give you an example. In, if you're a, a COO and you have employees that are remote working, for argument's sake, I have 3,000 people in Manila trying to access Jira in the UK, and they're, they're at 65% productivity. Well, using something like Thousand Eyes, we can find out why and we can get them to 75 or 85% productivity by improving their access to those remote, you know, remote products. Got it. Well, thank you so much for joining me in the studio, Tony. We're actually going to go back out to the Thousand Eyes booth. I believe Cedric is out there. So, Cedric, what have you got to show us this time? Hey, Dernish. Yes, I'm here back at the Thousand Eyes booth in the world of solutions. We just had to talk from uh, Mohit um, from Thousand Eyes. And actually, he told me that like it's all about human connections here at Cisco Live as well. So I was able to catch Mohit just after his talk, and he's joined here with me at the Thousand Eyes booth. So, Mohit, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's ex exciting to be here in person. So this is not your first Cisco Life, right? But it's the first Cisco Life for Thousand Eyes is really part of this fully integrated in the Cisco portfolio. So how do you feel about that? Oh, I feel great. I think it's great to be here. It's great to actually learn from all the conversations that are happening. And it's just validating the, the work we are working on. So it's awesome. Awesome, great. So you talked during uh, your innovation talk about open telemetry, yeah. right? So can you just tell us a little bit more about what that is and how that works? Yeah, so I think think about any time there's an outage that happens, different teams come together, which is a network team, app team, infrastructure teams, and their only job on that is to prove that it's not them. So it's almost like when the glass breaks in the house, every kid you have is saying it's not me, but you don't actually know what happened. And what we need to do in the modern world is to really be able to have all of these silos connect together so they can actually solve a problem. So whether it's a network issue or an app issue, they have to come together. And part of this is being able to move data out of these silos. So what we do with open telemetry is really using a global standard for exposing all the intelligence we have. And Thousand Eyes has very unique data on, the, on what's happening across the internet. This now gets exposed with open telemetry into environments that you may want to build, no more bespoke integrations. And we have a very specific uh, real-world use case here where we are uh, integrating with AppDynamics through open telemetry to bring together that FSO story that Cisco has been talking about. So it's really exciting. It starts to work towards breaking silos that is critical for success in today's experience. That's awesome. So also, I think you met, like we know that there is a one a one insights um, kind of preview happening right now. It's not fully available for customers yet, but it will be very soon. Like, what are you most excited about, and what are you hearing from customers today about that beta? Yeah, I mean, even before we came into Cisco, customers were asking us, "You have all this intelligence on the internet, and can you actually connect this with what's happening inside my network?" And so, what Van Insights does really is, uh, while we have all the all the real-time view of outages on the internet, WAN Insights is the first time we're actually extending to inside SD-WAN environments, and we're able to learn from past behavior of performance, so we can forecast certain kinds of issues, we can recommend optimal paths, and this has been game-changing even in the pilots we're running with customers where they're really excited about being able to predict some of these issues and get ahead of them before they impact user experience to SaaS applications in particular. So I think it's been exciting. People are looking forward to it. Uh, they're obviously asking us to do even more, like more on automation. So we have been on this journey and we're going to automate more as well as we go forward. Okay, so this is cool, right? Like we're on this journey of automation. So we're, you're gonna, like, I can see you're excited about it, right? Like you're a true engineer. Um, so what is, that, what, is that gonna, what is that gonna be? Like what's on the roadmap right now in terms of automation? Yeah, so I think the first step to automation is getting the right data, right? And so we have a lot of work going on towards the right data, but also an important element is being able to understand what is actually happening. So there's a root cause analysis, network AI ops effort. That's sort of a core capability that we're working on. And then in terms of automation is really being able to connect that data to making a closed loop decision, whether it's a routing change or whether it's a change in the Wi-Fi you need to make. So some of it is coming live with WAN Insights pretty soon. We're working on automation in WAN Insights in coordination with Viptela, with the SD-WAN team. And we are thinking about automation more broadly across the entire networking portfolio because we have a, a really good data set. So uh, automation across all aspects of the digital journey, including automation at the home environments when you have a work from home user. So lots coming and I'm, I'm sure at the next Cisco Live I'll be even more excited to share all of these information. 
I'm going to come to that Cisco Live and I'm going to check into you just to kind of feel the levels of excitement that we can benchmark it. What I also want to touch upon is like in your talk as well, uh, you mentioned that there is thousandseyes.com slash uh, outages, right? Which shows you real time information about like where there are outages. So how does that work actually? Like how do you, how do you scramble all of the data together? Yeah, so I mean our, our whole PhD uh, as founders was in internet routing and we basically were able to build this picture of the internet based on data collection from everywhere. And that's what we've sort of expanded on and created with uh, Internet Insights. It's the global view of the internet. Think about it like a Google Maps of the internet. And we can help you understand with uh, billions of measurements what is actually happening in critical networks as well as critical apps. And so you can instantly, even without a subscription, 2,000 eyes, you can get a quick view of is there an outage with, say, Microsoft or Google or uh, a big network like British Telecom or so on. And from there, in the product, you can dive deeper and start to understand what's happening. And the way, the reason we do this, or are able to do this, is really three things. It's the way we collect data. It's our, our, our proprietary way of collecting and processing data. The second is around the, the network AI ops functions we have, which are making sense of that data and drawing inferences and where the outages are. And the third is the visualization. And the visualization is equally powerful, because you think about Google Maps, if it didn't have a UI, it just have a text dump of what's happening on every street, you would not be able to make sense of it. So the visualization of these outages and what's happening is equally important. And it's really powerful for customers. We see this on knock screens all the time. You'll have a knock screen and it has the Internet Insights dashboard because it tells you what's happening right now. I love it how you describe it as like the Google Maps of the Internet. I'm just going to close up with one quick question. Um, this Amsterdam here is a new venue for Cisco Live uh, here in EMEA. Now you're part of like Cisco like in full. Um, like, what can we expect more to hear from Thousand Eyes this like next couple of days? Uh, I think Thousand Eyes uh, first inside Cisco. We have been the most fa the fastest integrated company. So we've done integrations with so many technology stacks with ISRs, with Cat 9Ks, with WebEx, with AppDynamics, uh, with Meraki. So there's a lot of that connective story that we're bringing together, and this was intentional because we want the intelligence from the internet to connect with what's happening inside the enterprise. So you can hear a lot about that. There's WAN Insights, uh, there's stuff with AppDynamics and OpenTelemetry and FSO. Uh, and beyond that, what we're continuing on in this journey of really completing every step of the modern digital experience, right? From home, through a branch, through a data center, through cloud, through SaaS, no matter where you are, we want to complete every step of the digital experience. So not only the next two days, I think in the, in the next uh, few months and years, you're going to continue to see us expand that footprint. And the outcomes that we are trying to drive for customers is really twofold. One, we want you to see the as, all aspects of the digital experience, no matter where they happen, because the new enterprise is borderless. And the second is we want you to better collaborate, not just internally, within your different functions, but we want you to better collaborate with your external dependencies. And that is something very unique to Thousand Eyes and Cisco, that we can actually help people speak the same language when there's an outage that is impacting different people. So if you have an outage with, say, Salesforce, you can speak Thousand Eyes to a Salesforce, and that is the beauty of Thousand Eyes. Awesome, great. Thank you so much, Mohit, for your time here uh, with me here in the world of solutions. As you can hear, Nish, like Thousand Dice is killing it like here at Cisco Live EMEA and in general. They're integrating with loads of our other Cisco uh, product portfolios. And also, like he talked about like Salesforce.com, like so many people use that as well. So um, we're going to throw it back to you, Nish, in the studio right now. Thank you so much, Cedric. I think we've been to the Thousand Eyes booth a few times. We've been, we've had them here in the booth, and like you said, Cedric, they are killing it. They're having a really great time at the show. I can tell, and it's their first um, Cisco Live as being fully part of Cisco as well. Well, that concludes our segment on Thousand Eyes. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right. So for those of you that have just joined us, we're here at Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. Don't forget to use hashtag Cisco Live and at Cisco Live um, to stay in touch with us. Let us know, you know what you're loving about the event, ideas you have for future events. Um, and thank you again for being here with us. If you've missed any of the content through the day so far, don't worry because we'll have a lot of the content for you on demand in the library at CiscoLive.com. Now, if you're wondering what Cisco Live is all about, because you know there's lots of people around us, we've been talking about the energy, the buzz. As you can probably tell, we're having a good time. We're having a lot of fun here at the event, and we hope that you're feeling that at home as well. Whether you're, you know, joining us anywhere in the world with whoever you're joining with, but there are four key things that I think a lot of Cisco Live attendees are excited about. 
And I'll start with one that I think a lot of people will say is their favorite thing about Cisco Live, which is the community that we have available here. Not only do you get to meet with your peers, your friends that you haven't seen in a while, but also you get the opportunity to meet with Cisco executives, Cisco engineers, to discuss technical business uh, requirements, questions that you might have. And then the networking piece, like I said as well, is something that's really popular. Just behind me here, we have Social Media Central. I've seen there's the DJ playing, so it's a very popular area, and it's where people have just gone just to you know, relax with a cup of tea or coffee um, and just take a bit of downtime at the show. But community is really what Cisco Live is all about. Then there's a group of people, like many of us, that are here to learn, and the education piece is just as important. So hopefully you're getting some of that at home, you're joining some of our innovation talks. We've got five days of sessions. People that are here are getting hands-on training. There's different labs, one-to-one -one meetings. So if you're not here this year in person, definitely have a think about it next year, because each year the event gets bigger and better. And then there's a lot of people are really excited about the certification exams. So if you're here live on site, there's over 10,000 people that are here. It's really exciting that you can take a Cisco certification for free whilst you're here. So learning, education, networking, and then inspiration. Um, this brings me to the third one, right? And you've probably seen from us, We've managed to get in front of the Cisco executives. We've brought you those interviews so far throughout the day, but getting the opportunity to hear directly from the, te the teams and the leaders of those teams, um, as well as industry leaders, that's you, the people that are telling your stories about how you're using Cisco technology to make your business um, you know, even better and take it to the next level. And we've got to give a shout out to our partners that are here as well. We've got partners here in the world of solutions, so really cutting edge um, technologists that are here at the event. And I'm, I'm not going to finish without saying the word fun. The final thing about Cisco Live, people are here for fun. We've got an annual celebration at the end of the week. We'll tell you a little bit more about that. But just before um, I tell you about that celebration and the keynote that we have on Thursday, Rob, you are out in the world of solution and you're with Cedric. So what have you got for us? What are you going to show us? Take, us, take it away. Well, I thought we'd just take a breather for just a moment, kind of check in with everybody. I haven't, Cedric's been so busy running around here. Yeah. Well, what have you been up to? You were, you used to another live shot because I was laying down for a minute trying to get some rest. That is a typical Rob boy thing to do, <laughs> Rob, laying down and having a rest. No, I don't know you're doing. Got to find work. a way yeah. to do it. No, I was just walking through the world of solutions and we met, just met Mohit and like we had like a little bit more information about Thousand Eyes because it's a big part. Like, you know, it yeah. actually kind of feels like a Thousand Eyes afternoon. Like there's so much to talk about. As I said, they're killing it. So like, yeah. Well, I've always turned to Thousand Eyes specifically because it's the only company, and this was before they even became part of Cisco, because it was a way to get it, that collective view of things happening uh, into actual clouds, you know, not just the internet, not just your own private network. Yep. It's a way to understand, well, this is why we might be having some latency issues or identify things. It's basically visibility for the for the wider net. Like he called it the Google Maps of the internet, which is, oh. I think, a really great anal analogy. Yeah, that works. Like, you know, we should we could use that to show. To. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, hey, I want to make sure we cover some housekeeping items. Yep. So we want everybody, and we're going to walk this way because I want to go do some VR. Okay, so he's going to back up. I love that. So, um, what are some of the things we need to remember? You've been in the studio more than I have, so what's most important for the audience to for focus on? For housekeeping, here? yeah, I think, you know, we want to hear from you at home, right? We are all in. Rob and I are all in. Steve and Nish uh, are all in. We're just all in. And I just, yeah. <laughs> We're all in. I think I got in. that yeah, part. Okay, got and don't it. forget, hashtag, Good. Okay. hashtag live, E, E, M, E. No, no slash. Oh, no slash. No, no so E, M, E, A. Yeah. Oh, that's right, because it's yeah. a hashtag. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah exactly. It's just a hashtag. You're getting old. You're getting Keep old, my mic Rob. to my mouth, I've been told. You're getting old, Rob. You should do that more often. Huh? Yeah. You're getting a little bit old, I said, like with the slash and Walking and talking also is not something much I could do. Yeah, hashtag's also called a pound sign where I'm from. Really, is it? Yeah, but anyway, Ooh. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to talk to yep. Arv in a bit yep. because this booth has been crowded and it looks like there's a, a little bit of a lull in the whole thing. So you good with that? I'll do that and then check you back go, with you. You go and play and rest a little bit more. I will right. just go and do some work. Come here, guys. See you later, guys. So let me come over here. Arvin, he's been waiting so patiently for me to come <laughs> over here. You guys have had crowds with lines. It was like a favorite ride at Disney World over here. And it's immersive. Everybody gets in their glasses on and they're doing stuff. Can you explain what it is you've got going on in this area here and what's important about it? So, Rob, here we have different industry experiences like retail, healthcare. Then we have, you know, education from school, university. And we have a smart building, Cisco One, uh, One Pen Plaza. And then we have hybrid work, work from home, office, anywhere, right? So we're taking our customers through this immersive tour of these different industries which are relevant to them. Right? So that they can experience Cisco solutions and our partner solutions and how they come together and solves the business use cases or outcomes for them. 
Well, and the immersive part is with the virtual reality. Let's come back over here. So uh, here we go. We've got some open ones here. Can I, is this a good one to, yes. to check on here? So explain what we've got going on here. Well, I don't want to put, I've been sweating like a pig this whole day, but we'll kind of show it. People know what the, you know, kind of how this works. But when we go in this and we'll show the screens in just a moment, I think we show a little bit about what people can see. We can. Okay, but the idea is you put these on, you've got the controllers so you know where you are in space. And like, <laughs> no, but like, this is interesting here because he didn't, see, he's in another world, yeah? So this is interesting. What, what might he be doing right now? You just keep doing it, you're doing wonderful. He is in New York right now. He is he's in New York? York. One, yes. That's amazing. It is, and they're experiencing all the innovations that we have done there. Right, oh. right there. <laughs> I forgot. Say that again because you're not working with a professional. Professionals would have given you a mic, but here, I'm not, I'm off my game. It happens. It happens. So he's in New York right now in our one pen office, experiencing what we have enabled there from smart buildings perspective. All the innovations that we brought in from sensors and all that, he's right there experiencing that firsthand without being physically in New York. But here's what I want to understand. So part of the way that this is applicable to customers, to partners, also to Cisco employees, is making uh, is increasingly making these kind of experiences available, not just to show how cool the office is, or maybe how your office could look, and how you can really integrate these technologies. But you guys are using this from learning to uh, providing more context in certain situations. How do, how do customers actually get to interact with these things? Maybe if they're not even here, how do, how would that work? So they can experience this at home, so they don't need to be really here, right? So they can experience it on tablet, on laptop, or if they have Oculus at home we can enable these experiences on their devices as well. Plus, to make it more interactive, we have a gamified version as well, where they can play a quick little quiz, like capture the flag, if you guys are familiar with that, and experience the environment, and also apply their knowledge on it. Well, perfect. In fact, speaking of the gamification, I'm gonna step back over here and just show, so this is the leaderboard. Uh, so explain to me what we're seeing here. This has been a competitive area all day, or? Yes, this has been a very competitive area. What you're seeing here is all the attendees who have taken the gamified version and the scores that they have done and which category they have played, right? And as the score, they get top on top of leaderboard. So that's a great interactive way to, to kind of get involved here. But the point is we need the context and such. Thank you, Avin. I appreciate your time. You. With that, I'm going to go ahead and throw it back to the studio. Nish. Thank you so much, Rob. Really great to hear that. And obviously, VR is something that we talk about, we hear about a lot, but it's really great to see that in action. And um, I look forward to making sure that I pop by there and have a chance to put the headset on myself. All right, let's take a look at some tweets because um, we have the social media area just behind us. I mentioned just before we went to that interview out in the world of solutions, people are gathering there. There's a DJ, lots of cups of coffee, so lots of great conversations that are happening. But if you're wondering what is being, we've mentioned hashtag Cisco Live a few times, right? For those of you that have joined, what are people saying about the event? Well, what I see overall is a mix of people that are here in person. We've had some behind the scenes. I saw Jonathan Davidson, who was part of our keynote this morning. He kind of put a picture up just before he went live behind the scenes. Um, and he was saying a moment of quiet before it all began. First Cisco Live in Europe and it's sold out and around 13,000 attendees. So that's just so great to see. And then we have Nicole Wager. She is a regular at Cisco Live. Many of you may recognize her because she gives out her Stroop waffles. And she was so excited today to see that we have fresh Dutch waffles that are being made live on site. So Nicole, I know you're probably the happiest, or even happier than you usually are when you're here at Cisco Live and connecting with everybody. Um, now, this is, one's a bit of a scary one because it's a picture of me, which I didn't realize was taken earlier at the keynote. So we were interviewing some of the Cisco insiders earlier, um, some of the champions that we have. We were in the Cisco insider booth earlier as well. So we got to speak to Caitlin about the insider program. Um, and obviously, you know, that we got to speak to two friends here who had a really lovely, heartwarming story about how they met for the first time at Cisco Live. And they used the event as a chance to reconnect with each other all the time. Um, now, what I'm seeing in the screen is something very interesting that you have to see at home. So over to you, Rob, over to you, Cedric. Please tell me what is going on. <laughs> he, he was sleeping again, this right? Well, no. Can you believe that? Now, what I didn't explain to you was this is about, you've got to figure out how within the job, because this is your first Cisco Live, I know, right? Yeah. So there are times when you can figure out how do I incorporate more horizontal type <laughs> actions into <laughs> things that are largely vertical? This is one of those things. I'm trying, this is. Uh, come on, you're kind of a, I feel like a mentor-mentee relationship developing. We have you? that, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, but you're still, 
yeah, using yeah. your young legs to support <laughs> yourself in a squat position, which just... Yeah, it's just like getting active at Cisco Oh, life, my God, right? look like, at you, know? you. Look at this. Yeah. I, you I just up been... and down. I didn't even hear a grunt. <laughs> well, do you want to stand up as well? I'll help you if you need it. I'm afraid. I don't want to try and stand up in front of camera. Okay, but, yeah. well, I'll give a, I'll give a, I'll You give were talking a, to, go ahead, Cedric. I will give a quick social media update, like, just, you know, let us know, while, while Rob gets up, right, we don't want to have that on camera, we want to spare you from that, we don't want to, like, burn your eyes for that, but, um, you know, like, it's so important for us to hear from you once again, like, because if you're not here, you have to come here, is he up? Okay, he's up. Okay, anyway, okay, I'm, gonna keep, I'm gonna keep talking. Like, uh, use the hashtag uh, Cisco or pound sign because that's how they yeah, know yeah, it. In, yeah, that's, that's, some of the audience may yes, recognize yes, yes, that. So, so a pound sign like Cisco Life EMEA. Let us know what you're thinking, like how you're feeling, um, and you know, it's it's just so important because if you're not here, you can, you're living to us actually, Rob. No, we are conduits to the experience, right? Yeah, like sleeping on this thing here. That's one conduit. <laughs> yeah. No, that works. It didn't last long enough. We're going to work on that yeah. part. But Luckily, I found you. One of the points is, though, that obviously this whole event could take a lot out of you, and there is a lot of nice areas to relax, kind of disconnect, maybe absorb a bit about what you've been working on. Perhaps you've been deep into certification land. Yep. I've seen people that are just coming out there, taking their first, you know, because we offer discounts when people come in to get their certifications. You can actually do them on site. Like, yeah. you can take the exam here. Well, some people literally arrive early. Well, that yeah. used to be one of the biggest purposes of Cisco Live was actually Networkers, mm -hmm. the original name, and it was much more of an engineering-only type conference. You came here to get certifications because it would be a discount. It was a chance to get your written, which has to be proctored yep. if you're working on CCIE or some type of a lab. And this provides the environment to do so at cost, and people take advantage of that. I think it was really cool when I was watching the keynote, like Wendy mentioned that she has uh, been like in CCIE, I think 25 years ago. Like, yeah. Did she say that, right? I'm sure she got her stroke waffle in the CCIE lounge. I'm really sure about that. So Wendy, <laughs> let me know. Let me know on WebEx. Um, but yes, I can also see that, you know, we can play some games here. We can chill out. Like, it's a very relaxed <coughs> environment. You were sleeping. I was exploring the games. Like, you know, um, let's go there. Like, I want to know what that well, thing there is uh, we got about 20 seconds left here we'll throw back yeah. to nish you yeah. got this yeah you go we'll, we'll just go right like so we have a we have a chess board here um yeah and then we have uh, some other game as well like i'm gonna come back to try it because i think nish is still in the studio right now so nish are you there Yes, I am here, Cedric. And what I really love is that everybody is making the theme all in their own thing, right? You're doing it in your own way, horizontal, vertical, exploring all the different places that the world and um, the Wilder Solutions has to offer as well. So that was what we had in the keynote this morning. Uh, the theme was all in, and I love everybody's making it their own. Remember to use social media and hashtag Cisco Live to let us know how you are all in. And don't forget to use the thumbs up. I don't know where it is on your screen, where I am in relation to all the buttons, but make sure that you're giving us a thumbs up if you are all in and enjoying Cisco Live. Now, some of the things that um, really stood out from the keynote this morning where they were talking about the theme all in was around simplification. And that's where we're gonna you know, head into now. The title of the session is Simplifying Network Experiences. We're gonna be joined by Omri Gorfund and Rebecca Stone, who is the SVP and um, Customer Solutions Marketing SVP that we have here at Cisco. And um, they're gonna be talking about how we can adapt you know, to the changing world that we have every day. So enjoy the session, stay tuned, and we'll be right back in a few minutes. I am Rebecca Stone. I head up uh, customer solutions marketing for Cisco, which is really just a fancy way to say product marketing. Uh, and I will be joined on stage shortly by my friend and colleague, Omri Gilfand, who heads up uh, product strategy for our SASE products. And we're here to talk to you a little bit about a theme that you probably started to hear Hopefully many of you made your way over here from the keynote and heard it there. If not, you'll probably hear it over the course of the next few days, which is that Cisco is on a journey towards simplification. And we are on a journey towards helping you simplify your IT infrastructure. You heard uh, Javid talk about hybrid work and how we're trying to unify the solution around hybrid work to make it easier for you to in install solutions for, um, for remote workers and across your, uh, your uh, office. We also talked about security, and you heard uh, Tom talk a little bit about how we are unifying all of the different uh, applications and products that we have from a security perspective in order to have that unified security platform. 
The last thing that you heard was from Jonathan Davidson. And Jonathan talked a little bit about your network infrastructure and how we are on a journey to simplify that. What you probably heard from Jonathan is hopefully two things, since I wrote that messaging, so hopefully, hopefully he delivered it well, was the first was really a journey towards the convergence of hardware. And that hardware across your access networks, your data center networks, even uh, between security and networking. The next thing that you heard was that we are on a journey to deliver that all via a cloud platform. And when Omri and I were talking a little bit about this presentation and what we were going to do to explain how and when the convergence was going to happen, we were trying to come up with a few real world examples for why this was important and, and a way that you could kind of visualize how this was going to happen. And the uh, recommendation that he suggested was actually currency. And as I thought about it, at first I was like, oh, I don't really get it. And I, after I thought about it a little bit, I was like, oh, this, this actually makes a ton of sense, particularly here where we are today. Because when I first started traveling across Europe, and this might date me a little bit, but when I first started traveling across Europe, I had to go to a bank and get a traveler's check. And then I had to go to a, another bank when I arrived in the country and cash that traveler's check and get a certain currency for that country. And every country that you went to within Europe, you had to do the same thing. And that was a complicated process. You had multiple currencies in a very small region. And then the euro was introduced. And that is sort of like the convergence of hardware, right? Is that it all came together into one thing. The next thing that happened is the next few times that I started to travel was I had credit cards. And that was a simplification in itself because I was down from 10 different currencies to three credit cards, my business credit card, my, whole, my, my personal credit card, and then my ATM because you know, I still wanted to pull out that cash if I, if I needed it for something. That was a simplification because we moved from one, one type to an easier type. This trip, however, it was completely different because this trip, I didn't use any of that stuff even though it's still in my purse. I use this. I've used this almost everywhere. And that's an example of a move to a cloud platform because it really exemplifies the coming together of all that currency into a simple, easy to use device on your hand. And this device not only delivers that currency and, and helps me buy things in all of the stores and restaurants that I've been to, um, but it also helps me because I'm able to talk to my kids and I'm able to do WebEx calls um, and I'm able to answer my emails and I'm able to do running, I tracked my run this morning too. So um, it, it is really truly a convergence of all these things on a cloud platform that simplifies it for me. Unfortunately, that simplification for me has made it increasingly complex for you to navigate because there is the connectivity that I now have to have 24 seven, whether I'm in the office or I'm here or I'm uh, at home, creates complexity if you are delivering an application to me because you have to think about multi-cloud and hybrid cloud uh, solutions and then add a layer on top of it in that we are in an incredibly complex security environment because I need to, uh, I need to be secure no matter where and how I'm working. This causes your IT experience to suffer. I've talked to so many customers this week who have said, we can barely keep up with the things that we need to keep up with. It's really, really hard. It's hard to scale, it's hard to be predictable, and it's really less reliable than, um, than we'd like it to be. And when your experience is suffering, then the user experience is suffering because you're not able to deliver the time to, uh, to delight that you'd like to. You're not able to free up the time that you could be doing thinking about those higher level strategies because you're trying to just troubleshoot the problems that you're having across the network. In fact, by, in, by next year, more than 40% of CIOs, so 40% of the businesses that you represent say that it's going to be really hard to deliver on the business outcomes that they want to drive because they can't allow for that digital transformation. The struggle is real. So what does it take to be successful to do it? As we said, there are two things. There's the cloud platform, and the second is the convergence of the hardware that we need to think about. 
in order to, if you start with the cloud as your priority from an operations model, from an operations and management model, you'll be able to better uh, access and allow for security, access, and IoT in your networks in a simple and scalable way. If you start with that as your, as your foundation, you'll then be able to work with your ve vendors in a different model, using flexible consumption, and that allows you to change and move resources much faster and much more quickly than you could before, because you'll be able to, uh, to prioritize the different things that you might need to prioritize in a different way. The second thing is the automation and the analytics that come from that infrastructure. Today, if you're typically on-prem, you're doing a lot of that manually. You're potentially scripting it so that you can pull it out. Um, with cloud, all of that is done for you. It's maintained for you. You don't have to do it. You simply have to connect to an API that is hopefully stable. Um, and then you'll be able to pull those analytics out. If you do all that, if you automate all of that as your infrastructure, as your platform, then you'll be able to deliver on the examples like what's here, hybrid work, as a solution. But you also might be able to deliver on a couple of other examples too. Let's say you are wanting to serve a digital business or you are in a manufacturing plant and you want to track all of your devices and your inventory across your, your uh, plant. Those are all examples of how by moving to this new structure, you'll be able to simplify. So how Cisco is thinking about that from, from that cloud operations model is three things. One, you have to have that automation, and that's, that is driven by the cloud. So simplifying those day-to-day -day tasks by creating an easily scalable way to do that. The second thing is the network insights. So we talked a little bit about analytics and being able to uh, pull the data out. Those network insights are now accessible across your entire infrastructure. This, the last thing I again mentioned is that API value creation. Those APIs are not only going to be able to pull the data out, but you're going to be able to build different solutions and applications on top of your network using things like AI and ML in order to be able to deliver a solution to, to things that you might be trying to solve. And we know, I, Jonathan talked about this fact, that this is going to be a journey. For many of you, you may be on-prem right now. I'd like to see by a show of hands, how many of you have fully on-prem networks, Catalyst and maybe DNA Center, okay? How many of you are, um, are hybrid? How many of you maybe have Meraki and Catalyst, okay? And then lastly is um, how many of you are fully on uh, the Meraki cloud platform? Okay, so not quite as many of you. Um, and then how many of you just really wanted to take a seat because the, the <laughs> that, uh, that concrete is hard to walk on. You need a, a break every now and then, right? Um, it's OK, because this path is going to be different for every one of you based on where you are, not only in this journey, but where you are in the, the journey to the cloud across your entire IT uh, strategy. And how we're going to help you in that journey is in three ways. One, if you are on premise and you have, uh, if you have the need to stay on premise, whether you have security issues or, or a business need that you might be driving towards, we are committed to Catalyst, we are committed to DNA Center, and that roadmap is going to continue far into the future. Um, in fact, you can even, uh, you can e even do things like uh, v VM for uh, DNA Center, which allows you to be self-hosted in the cloud of your DNA infrastructure. The next thing we're going to do is obviously, of course, we're going to continue to invest in the Meraki infrastructure, which will allow for those more scalable remote sites to be able to, to build as needed. But the majority of you raised your hands and the majority of customers that I've talked about are really those hybrid approaches where you have Catalyst and Meraki in your infrastructure and you're trying to see across both. Maybe you even have um, competitors uh, in your infrastructure. That's where we're going to introduce cloud monitoring. Cloud monitoring is going to allow you to see and scale across both your Catalyst and Meraki devices, uh, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about the details of that. Um, but you will be able to see and manage um, those devices in a unified way. And that's where that converged hardware, that cloud managed uh, for Catalyst, and the converged uh, and the 
and the uh, cloud platform, which is, uh, which is the, the uh, cloud monitoring, come together. So we have a little bit of an example from a customer of ours who is actually in this journey himself. And why don't we go ahead and roll that tape so you can hear, oops, there we go. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service. Uh, we've been running for about a decade and hitting almost 20 different countries. So we have to provide meal kits that are healthy, correct portioned, um, and easy to cook. Because we're a global company, we are very far apart from, from our counterparts and employees. So having the cloud to have the applications in every region uh, without having a big footprint um, everywhere in terms of hardware is really great. So we can get to what we need without the fuss of, of waiting around or, or having something physically there that we have to maintain and make sure that's available all the time. The biggest one recently has been able to get our Catalyst fleet into the, the monitoring as well. Um, something very new and we wanted to try out. Um, but having that has then kind of decreased the uh, issues of hopping into every single switch in our campus to find the problem. We now have that single pane of glass that, that everyone wants to, to dive in and have a uh, look at issues. I think the, the biggest advice is, is just to get in with whatever workload is the easiest for you to start. I think that that first step to kind of see how it works and see that it probably isn't as daunting as you think is, is vital. So as soon as you get one in, you'll try and get the next one in and, and you'll have that the path that you want to follow to, to get everything across the cloud and accessible everywhere, which is just kind of the ease that you want as, a, as an engineer. We're already starting to roll out these uh, larger smart warehouses uh, and they'll kind of utilize a, a lot more intelligence into how they want to do their production line stuff. I think right now is that opportunity to bring it all together, uh, not just have us as a platform and them as uh, taking uh, customers of that network. We want to be able to give them some insights into their stuff. If we can kind of sew it in, and get Meraki and, and the IoT stuff to be one single pane of glass for their production, and then us have one single pane of glass for our network management, uh, that makes just for a, a lot more ease in terms of looking at the solutions, getting automation around the data that they're getting, and just making more sense of, of us together as both production team and a network support. It's a great story and it's really indicative of many of the customers that I've heard uh, talk about how they're starting to use monitoring. It's really about allowing the tier one and tier two uh, customer service to be able to support things in an easier, more scalable way, easier to, to take the time and requirements off of your most senior managers and senior leaders in order to be able to focus on the things that really matter. And that's the value of bringing together the number one in cloud management with Cisco Maraki and the number one across the board in networking with Catalyst is the drive towards the simplification of your day to day. Now, the first step, as, as Damien talked about, how do you take that first step? Well, cloud monitoring, as I, as I said, is that first step. You may have heard Jonathan talk about it. That first step is available today to anybody with a DNA license immediately. You can leave here and go and sign up for cloud monitoring for all your Catalyst switches. The next step towards full cloud management is moving your access points into a dual managed Wi-Fi 6E uh, access points. And those are also available as of a few months ago uh, and can be managed both by uh, DNA and by uh, the Meraki platform. The early field trials for cloud management with the Catalyst 9300s will begin over the next year, and cloud monitoring for the access points also over the next year to two years. So our convergence story does not end there. We have an exciting amount of security and networking convergence that Omri is going to discuss. Omri, why don't you come up stage and share it with us? Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. So you've heard from Rebecca about the benefits of convergence and experience simplification in access networks. And I want to talk to you about how we extend this journey of convergence and simplification to SASE in order to unlock its true potential. IT teams today struggle with, it, with managing the complexity of applications that are no longer confined to the four walls of the data centers. 
Applications can run in public clouds, in private clouds, in colos, and even in SaaS applications. And this is compounded by today's hybrid work reality in which users can be anywhere. Users can be working from home. They can be working in an office location. They can be in a trade show like this. They can essentially be anywhere. So the traditional perimeter no longer exists. And the attack surface of organizations increases significantly. Add to that the fact that cybersecurity and cloud talent is in high demand and difficult to obtain, the IT environment today is more complex than ever. And organizations are less secure. So to help IT teams get ahead, Cisco Plus Secure Connect, which we've launched six months ago, is our unified SASE solution. This solution converges and brings together Cisco's networking and security capabilities in order to deliver the outcomes that customers expect from SASE, which fundamentally boils down to connecting users wherever they are to applications and resources wherever these are. Leveraging, powered by the, the Cisco Meraki dashboard, we deliver a unified and streamlined experience that extends from premise to cloud. And powered by Cisco Umbrella, we deliver all the key security functions that you would expect, including secure web gateways, firewall, DLP, CASB, ZTNA, and remote access. Secure Connect unlocks the true promise of a unified SASE solution by creating this secure fabric that extends from cloud to premise, a fabric that connects users, branches, sites to private and public applications. And it delivers on the secure internet access and secure private access use cases. Now, when we designed and built Secure Connect, we had two core product principles in mind. Interconnect everything and security everywhere. Interconnect everything is a principle of simplicity. Anything that you connect and attach to this SASE fabric is inherently interconnected. And it is controlled by the policies that the customers set. Customers and admins don't need to worry about where resources are, what type of access technology is being used. It is all abstracted into this single consistent fabric. And beyond that, it also gives you, you know, future protection. So as new technologies emerge, once you connect them to this fabric, you gain all the benefits of this SASE fabric and the platform. Security Everywhere is essentially enabled by the notion of centralized management that is powered by the Meraki cloud management platform with distributed enforcement. Policies can be applied in the most optimal location. Again, providing a superior end user experience. You don't need to necessarily backhaul everything to a centralized location. And you can do that without losing visibility and, of course, without compromising your organizational security. With Secure Connect, we essentially extend the cloud edge all the way to the enterprise edge in order to also allow customers to benefit from their existing investments that they have in place. Now, with that, I'm also excited to announce that we are further extending the scope of Cisco Plus Secure Connect by adding support to Veptela SD-WAN. Veptela SD-WAN customers can enjoy all the benefits of Cisco Plus Secure Connect for both secure private access and secure internet access use cases. Connectivity of Cisco Veptela SD-WAN to this SASE fabric is done with just a few clicks of a button and with this principle of interconnecting everything, remote workers gain access to resources behind Veptela SD-WAN sites. And connectivity between Veptela SD-WAN sites and Meraki SD-WAN sites is also established. All managed and controlled through a single dashboard. So you can monitor your entire environment in the same place. This new capability will be available to 
Secure Connect customers for preview. Customers that have Vectela SD-WAN will be able to access it later this month. So with that, let's go to demo time. And I want to show you how easy and simple it is to integrate Viptela. So first, this is the overview page of Secure Connect. This page by itself brings together security and networking and, all, and everything you need to monitor in your environment. You can see your security threats across the organization. You can see the different policies. And in one place, you can look at your sites. You can look at your users. And you can also look at the different applications. Going into sites, and here, like in any good cooking show, we've already connected two SD-WAN sites for Meraki. Clicking on a site gives you, of course, access to the site. You can look at the details. You can look at the status of everything. And you can also look at the various security events related to this site. This is where you can also, and you're getting a preview of the ability to look at how we enforce things between premise and cloud. You can see that certain things are blocked at the premise, certain things are blocked in the cloud, and again, this is done seamlessly. Now, to add a Viptela SD-WAN site for private connectivity, all I need to do is go through simple wizard, add the name of the site, click through it, and I get a summary of what needs to be done. I also have access to the commands, and I can easily copy them and paste them through vManage. And once I save and I go back to my Secure Connect dashboard, I have one step, which I have to do once on the first side that I connect, and I need to configure BGP in order to enable private connectivity. And again, very simple, easy. And once this is done, you can monitor and sites go up. Customers that already have an integration of Veptela SD-WAN with Umbrella for secure internet access can import this, these sites with a single click of a button. So just by adding and discovering those connections, we add them to the same dashboard. So you can monitor your entire environment from one place, look at your sites, look at the health of your sites. And the other good thing is that you can start applying policies. So here I'll just go through a simple process of showing you how a single policy, which enables access to a company dashboard, an internal application, a private application. This application, by the way, sits behind a Viptela site. Again, the admins don't need to think where this application is. All they need to set is this policy. And from a user perspective, the experience is seamless. It needs to be transparent. All they need to do is to click on the link for their private dashboard. They can log in. Here we did not turn on MFA, so we just go through a regular process, and that's it. They get that. Simple. So to recap, Cisco Plus Secure Connect provides this unified and seamless experience that is easy to deploy and simple to operate. It removes the complexity and increases the visibility that you have across your organization. Some of our customers were able to deploy SASE in as little as two hours. It empowers IT teams to securely connect remote users at any point of service and enable work from anywhere. And in a recent discussion that I had with one of our customers, sh they shared with me that they can now onboard remote users, and I'll quote, 10x faster than before. It builds also greater network security and resiliency, improving your overall organization security posture with continuous visibility into threats. So teams can better respond to unpredicted events and to changes which we know are part of our day-to-day -day reality. Fundamentally, it empowers organizations to confidently navigate their SASE journey with this single turnkey solution that is built on the Cisco Meraki platform, which converges and brings together networking and security to create a unified and simple yet powerful experience. So let's also hear from one of our customers on how Cisco Plus Secure Connect helps them with their digital transformation journey. Hello, 
Milwaukee Electronics is a current Meraki customer of ours, and in trying to improve their security posture, they identified that SASE would actually really fill this gap. Milwaukee Electronics is a family-owned business founded in 1954. We're on the path to becoming a leader in our market space for innovative electronics manufacturing. Today, we've got electronics at the bottom of the ocean in uh, National Geographic's cameras, and we've even got electronics up in space in the Mars Perseverance rover. We had several challenges that led to our partnership with Cisco. Supply chain issues in the market to acquire new infrastructure technology, and the desire to get a security architecture that would meet our customers' expectations and regulatory requirements. The company came to us and said, hey, we need you to find a solution that works. We can't take these random outages. We can't run a business this way. We need something reliable and dependable. And Cisco was our solution. We picked Cisco Plus Secure Connect because it covered many different needs that we had as an organization. It could do the remote connection for us. It could do DNS and web filtering. And it allowed us to apply the same security principles across not only our physical locations, but to any remote workers we had, no matter where they are. Cisco showed Milwaukee Electronics how easy it was to deploy Cisco Plus Secure Connect across sites and users in a matter of a few clicks. Implementing this solution lets me maximize my IT team's resources, it positions the business for scalable growth, and it lets us focus on flexing to our customers' diverse needs. The services provided by Cisco Plus Secure Connect are critical to our organization, allowing us to expand our security footing and reduce risk to the organization as a whole. My mission as the company's security and technology leader is to guide us through a digital transformation. Knowing that that begins with a solid foundation for execution, we implemented Cisco Meraki's network infrastructure solution and paired that with Cisco's SASE solution. That let us empower our digitally distributed workforce with the ability to work securely on our critical applications from anywhere at any time. Okay, so whatever is driving your transformation infrastructure, whether you are like Milwaukee, where you are trying to pull together that security and network, or like HelloFresh, where you're tr simply trying to scale and streamline and, uh, and uh, f help with those networking operations, we really are investing in simplification, simplification at Cisco in order to help you deliver that seamless hybrid work experience, build security resiliency across your organization, automate operations, and of course, create those new customer experiences. With Cisco's networking platforms, you can accelerate and we can help you on that journey. Thank you all so much. Make sure that if you would like to hear some more information, you can scan the QR code or attend any of these sessions for more details. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. I am back in, I don't know if this is Studio A or B, doesn't really matter, you don't care. A, I'm being told now. Regardless, this is our end of day, end of Cisco Live show show just for day one. It's not, not the end of Cisco Live whatsoever. Everybody's getting worried about what I'm about to say next. Either way, so glad you could join us. I hope you're enjoying all the innovation talks. This is just the beginning, guys. If you're overwhelmed with what's happening today, don't worry. First of all, everything is on demand. You're going to be able to get access to all of the resources and materials and do what I do, which is use that opportunity to slow down, focus on what you need at that moment. All the materials are there, ciscolive.com. You're going to see the, the links to get into what you need. Also, really enjoying the fact that we've got these emojis and the reactions and stuff. Please keep letting us know in that small, innocuous way how you're feeling and what you're doing. It's just a funny little signal that does kind of lift a lot of people, whether you even see them here or not. So, also want to encourage you to use the hashtag Cisco Live E-M-E-A. And this is how we can tag your traffic and make sure you're getting credit for it. I believe there's probably some leaderboards and various things going on with the social media folks. So continue to have fun with that. There's definitely nothing over. I just want you to enjoy the rest of the day. We've got more content for you. In fact, I'm so excited. Before we get to the other stuff that we have coming up in this particular show, I've got a very special guest and I'm glad that I got the opportunity to interview him. Please welcome Javed Khan. Thank you. Yeah, so happy to have you here. And, and it's just interesting, because I've, I've worked a lot in, in your group. Yes. Uh, and so as we talk about collaboration, I ran into you this morning before the keynote. Uh, I didn't get to see if you were speaking in the keynote this particular time, but I know you've been busy all over the place. Yes. Um, tell me a little bit about what's important to understand about how we're tackling collaboration today and how things may be shifting and just yeah. what's important there. So the biggest thing that uh, is on mind of our customers and partners we hear is hybrid work, and I talked about that in my keynote today. 
Cisco is uniquely positioned to help our customers solve for hybrid work because we've got collaboration devices and software, right. which our customers know about, but also security uh, and networking. So a lot of interest today on uh, hybrid work and how Cisco can solve for our customers end to end. We are, we are uniquely positioned to do that. Um, the other thing that we've gotten lot of, lots of questions on is really how do I work with the Microsoft ecosystem? Because yes, so, I, right where I was thinking I wanted to go next, but yeah. please, yeah, how do we work with the Microsoft ecosystem, yeah. Jeff? I mean, Cisco itself, by the way, uses Microsoft, right? Yeah. We, we, we use Who Microsoft internally. Yeah. And, and we've invested a lot of um, energy making sure that our products fit seamlessly with the Microsoft ecosystem. So if you're using the Microsoft Productivity Suite, our products on the collaboration side fit in. But the big new thing that uh, we are showing off on the floor today, which was very, very busy, if you haven't seen it, you should come take a look, is how we interoperate with other vendors. And uh, we've always had interoperability, so Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and uh, Google Meet. Right. But what we are showing is a more native experience for those customers who might be using Microsoft Teams internally. So our beautiful devices, with all the phenomenal AI, now make that Microsoft ecosystem better. So, for anyone, really for anyone that, that may not fully understand, because I think, you know, some some of us may be, uh, uh, you know, we we hear a lot about partnerships that Cisco yes. has all the time, and we partner with Microsoft in many different ways yes. across many different technologies. But I think it's important because this particular agreement with Microsoft and what we're doing, I think, is highly interesting because it really it's a deeper level of integration so that you get the features that we've worked hard to build into the devices to make them easier so that you don't have that, how do I meet with somebody? You know, the, I came up in the old days of picture tell, uh, video conferencing systems where you had to, you had yes. to literally code the codec yes. and, uh, and choose your lines. But this is so we get the one button access, you get all the features and the strength still when you're using the Microsoft platform and they can interact with WebEx in a seamless fashion as well, correct? Yes. So, so we've always had phenomenal experiences in our devices, uh, and we do a lot of things within our devices, some, some of the ones you mentioned, including things like background noise removal and face recognition. All of those features, as part of this agreement, we still provide on the devices side. So if you're in a Microsoft meeting, you now get the benefit of this. And then you can still join a WebEx meeting, you can still manage this device just like you would manage the rest of our devices from within our console. So you get the best of both worlds. Yeah. And there's nobody else out there who can provide this kind of a device experience in the Microsoft ecosystem right. other than Cisco does. So. Well one thing I think we do well, and I think it's reflected well in the, uh, the demonstrations that are going on, is also the fact that we tend to get overly focused sometimes on endpoints, yes. and they're beautiful, and we can do great things with them, but they are useless without a network, and they're useless without all the supporting things uh, that I think Cisco does a very good job with that may be hidden most of the time, and thankfully so, but I, I feel like that's one thing that we've done a good job here is we're saying, look, the hybrid work experience is not WebEx, right? It's, it's really how we work with everything, and we've worked hard to pull that off internally. That's right, we've integrated security, networking, and collaboration, right? Yeah. Uh, collaboration by itself, not going to work if the network's not able to handle that, right? <laughs> so we've we've integrated our portfolio. So one of one of the features that I that I think is really cool is Thousand Eyes integration into our collaboration uh, uh, control hub. Uh, what yes. that lets you do is it gives you an end-to-end -end view, not just what's happening with collaboration software, but what's happening on the network, including network that a service provider might be running. Right? Yeah. So it, it provides this end-to-end -end capability, so you can now deliver these experiences. Uh, because we have control right. and visibility into the network. Well, it's funny because I'm a very big, it's a geeky thing to say probably, but a very big Control Hub fan. Yes. Because I love yeah. it, it every single time I go back to it, and of course it keeps changing with the thousand eyes integration and other things, but I don't think enough people sometimes remember just how much control, no matter the size of your operation, it's built for scale and it's built to yeah. make an administrator's job so much easier in terms of having the visibility, the control, taking advantage of, of sensors that we have in the devices to do things that you couldn't do otherwise or you'd have to spend money building extra inputs into. Yeah, the unsung heroes of the hybrid work experiences today are the IT administrators who are behind the scene yeah. making sure it works end to end and Control Hub is at the center of that and it's the one place where you get full visibility into all things 
FedEx and increasingly all things Cisco, uh, so you can deliver those experiences. Well, let me ask you, switching up a little bit sure. here, uh, the entire conference we're very focused on sustainability, mm -hmm. and I'm curious, what part does WebEx play when it comes to sustainability? So there's a lot of things we've been doing for a while uh, uh, to reduce the CO2 emissions of our processes. Um, and in addition to that, there's a few things we announced uh, for our customers. I'll start with the first bucket. Uh, so I'll give you a very simple example. The new Desk Pros, they actually use a fabric in front instead of uh, aluminum or a metal. Yeah, just a little and, bit less materials. And exactly, so a little bit less materials. It's a little lighter, which means it reduces shipping costs, which, which, which uh, improves the kind of CO2 footprint that right. we have. So we've been doing a lot of those things within our products. Uh, we, we make sure that we, you know, if you want to recycle the product, we take it back without a charge. Uh, what we announced today was a new feature, which, which is a carbon emissions insight console widget that's going to be in control of again okay, see, for the, the IT administrator. So they can look at the CO2 emissions of their entire video conferencing device footprint and make adjustments. So you can say, you know, office hours are 8 o'clock to 5 p.m. Right. and outside of the office hours these devices go into deep sleep and now you're reducing your CO2 emissions. So we are not just ourselves working on him, on on reducing our emissions, CO2 emissions, but helping our customers get visibility so that they can proactively take actions. Which I love because I think the thing that, co what comes out of that I think is when we increase visibility, we increase the ability for us to make educated decisions about being better consumers. Absolutely, right? yes. And I yes. think the more we do that type of thing. Final point, just real quick, number one um, feature you can't live without when it comes to WebEx. Number one feature, I'll start with, uh, I can't live without my Desk Pro, which is not a feature, but a device, it's a beautiful device. Um, and uh, feature, I would have to say, noise cancellation, uh, yeah. so that uh, I can keep working even when there is noise in it the It is so good that I honestly think we need to add something that tells you that it's been activated to the user side because I react to the dog barking even though no one else hears it. That's right, yeah. You know, stuff I, like that. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. I'll, t I'll put that on my Finally, feature request that the list top. that I've accumulated since the morning. <laughs> Javid, thank you so much for taking the time. Continued best of luck with already a yep. successful year. We're getting off to a good start. Guys, at this point, I believe we're going over to the Cisco store which I, hopefully they're keeping a close eye on Cedric because I've seen him coming out with new stuff quite a bit. I mean like Rob, like what can I say about that? I just love Cisco merchandise. This is like the place to be for me. Like, So we're here in the Cisco store. It's just across the TV studio. It's in the hub actually. And I'm really excited to have a browse around and let's see what I bring for you, Rob. Um, the cool thing is actually that I was walking in straight away and I saw this shirt and I'm pretty sure that was the shirt that you wore yesterday. I am, I'm pretty sure about that. But let's have a wander around. Like, it's really cool. Um, like, you know, there is lots of variety of things. You have shirts, polos. Um, you just have, like, um, you have uh, hoodies as well here. Um, so there is, like, just, like, loads of things. Really cool prints. I love this print. Like, maybe that, that would be a Rob thing to wear. Or maybe Steve, like, you know, with those uh, Cisco uh, Bridge logos. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, but the cool thing about this store is that there is Cisco merchandise in here. But more than that, it's also a way for us to showcase what Cisco can do in retail. I call it the future of retail here. So let's have a further browse around what we have. Um, so we have jackets. Um, we have more Rob shirts, as I would call them from now on, Rob. Um, more jackets even this is even this is a cool jacket that i have from here behind us here we have um some bears as well so actually i'm gonna take one of those for niche like i'm gonna buy that for niche it's pretty cute i think right um so i'm gonna take it um we are also like we have pins and so on like we're gonna go a little bit further we have water bottles we talk a lot at, Cis at cisco tv so i might get a water bottle as well for someone because they're actually really cool um, so I'm just trying to think like which color um, Steve might like. So I'm gonna go for a white one here. Um, yeah, let's have a, let's have a further like yeah yeah. Like see, I'm I'm, I'm buying stuff for the team, right? Like you know, I'm a team player. Um, so we're just gonna go even further right now. Um, and here we have some more cool stuff. I think a hat maybe that I could buy as well for for um, I don't know maybe for my dad like when he plays golf or so. So I'm gonna put that on. Um, yes, so we're going to go uh, a little bit further here, and um, I think I might actually need some help. Yep, so I actually might need some help. Um, so, hello. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm great, how are you? 
I'm good, thank you, thank you. Um, as you can see, I'm actually like, um, I'm here with Kaylee from the Cisco store, right? From the Cisco store team. You can see I have my hands full right now, Kaylee. I'm actually like almost shopping spree for the team. Yeah. Um, but I'm looking for a shirt, um, you know, I think actually like Rob might need some new shirts. So um, I'm looking for a shirt. So can you just show us around a little bit yeah, here? for sure. I can show you some of um, some of our t-shirts we have here that are designed by The Hat, which is our internal creative agency. And so maybe one of these would be good. Uh, you know, it talks about sustainability, empowering an inclusive future. It looks like a Rob thing actually. So I can see there is a QR code over here. Like, so um, I think we can get some information here uh, in terms of like the product and how it actually fits with Cisco's uh, purpose yeah, so, so let's give that a scan mm -hmm. so if you scan the qr code on any of our products in store you'll be able to scroll down and see the icons that correspond to how we power an inclusive future through that piece of merchandise mm -hmm. so you can see this one's made from recycled material it's socially conscious it's actually from um, a brand that uses organic cotton Oh, wow. um, yeah, so it's really awesome. All of the merchandise in store has a story to it on how it powers an inclusive future. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna take one for Rob. I think like we might have like a large here somewhere. Like, I don't really, yeah, this is a large. I'm gonna take one here, uh, but also he's a small. No, I, the production's telling me he's a small, but I'm not convinced about that. I'm still gonna go for the large. Uh, but also see here's some really cool um, like Cisco technology actually. Like it's a smart fitting room. Right. So, so let's go there and yeah. like check it out. So how does this work, Kaylee? Well, so all of our product is RFID tagged. So the Cisco store has Cisco and partner technology all throughout the store working in real time. So there is an RFID tag in the product tag there. There is a panel behind this uh, this wall that's, that's an RFID panel. So you don't even have to hold it up. It's got the proximity to get it there. Um, you'll see that the, the product appears on the screen. So you can select a different size and request assistance, and that'll go to our sales associates that'll bring you a new size. So this is obviously not the smart fitting room in practice, because you wouldn't get changed out here, but we do have one working. We just wanted to, to keep uh, at that fitting room free for all of the customers that are coming through the store. I think that's something to like, to, to just like, I, when I go shopping, like, I'm always like, okay, I need to find a size, as you can see Rob and his large. And I think this is really great because you can just like see like, okay, this is a color, like those sizes are available, we have other colors as well. And then you can get someone over here just to like help you out and like get some assistance because I always find it very hard in retail, like to find someone like, because everybody's so busy, like refilling, uh, refilling the sticks. Um, so yeah, let's go here and check out actually, because I think we got enough already. Um, and I think I'm gonna make a donation as well because the cool thing about Cisco is we care so much about power and inclusive future for all, whether it's within Cisco or outside of Cisco. Um, and I think we're working with the food bank uh, from the Netherlands over here right now. So once you go and check out, oh, sorry, like you see, it's, it's very busy. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's selling like eggs. Um, so what you can do here is you can get like one of those tokens and you can actually put it in this uh, board here. So you can actually, um, she can act, you can actually like choose one of those but i think kaylee i might actually need some help once again kaylee actually because you know like there is a donation part over here so can you tell us a little bit more what we're actually like gonna donate to yeah uh our donation tower actually is a really cool story so in lieu of giveaways we decided to build this donation tower and we take it to every event that we go to so we actually reskin it for every event so that we donate to the organizations that the event that we're at is partnering with so as you mentioned, we are partnering with the Netherlands first food bank, uh, which is Voedselbanken. Um, so you can drop your token into any of these three slots and you can watch it go watch it go down. Um, but so we've divided it into, into three different things for Voedselbanken that you can donate to. So you can either donate the food itself, you can provide energy and gas to all the transport that they do, or they have an uh, initiative called Supalicious where they donate um, bowls of soup to people in need. Awesome, great. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. I'm just gonna, before I go and check that, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna donate to all of them, right? Like, I'm gonna be a true Ciscoanian, and I'm just gonna make sure that, like, we're, we're supporting the cause here. So, thank you so much, Kelly. I'm gonna go and check out, like, Rob, I got your shirt, I got a water bottle, I get the beer as well. Oh, I got the, uh, the beer as well. So, I'm just gonna go here, gonna check out, um, and then, you know, we're gonna go back to Rob. Rob, I'll, 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 I'll wanna see you in this t-shirt later on today. Oh, no, absolutely. I appreciate the, all the personal shopping that I'm getting here. Thank you so much. Wonderful. For anybody that may have forgotten or weren't aware, you know, the Cisco store used to just be a store. 
And yes, you get lots of logo merchandise, it's very much that, but it's actually also a showcase for how technology can be used to do more intelligent retailing and, and a lot of ancillary technologies and availability of uh, uh, opportunity there to check out. So be sure and check that out. For now, I'd like to go over to Nish, who's got a customer talking about some of how they're doing things. Eric from Skanska, I believe. Nish? That, that's right, Rob, thank you so much. So I'm here, I'm in Studio B, and I'm joined by Eric Nelson. So Eric, welcome firstly to the show, I guess we could say. We're putting on a bit of a show here for people that are joining Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam from home. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. Yeah, and we were just talking about, this is your second Cisco Live Amir, I believe, yes, yeah? It is. And how it, you have to really prioritize what you want to be doing here on the show because there's so much to do and it's like, you know, where do you want to go? What do you yeah. want to hear? What do you want to see? Um, so let's start with you telling us a little bit about Skanska. You are a senior network manager there, right? So I'm a senior network engineer, yeah. Engineer, uh, so, so what does the company do? And tell us a little bit about the Cisco story. Sure, uh, so Skanska is one of the world's largest project development and construction companies and we really focus on innovative and sustainable solutions. So we're built, uh, among examples, we helped build the Guardia Airport. Uh, okay. We led the whole Guardia Central project. Uh, we also built the world's most northern power uh, powerhouse, which is energy positive, actually. And so it actually produces double the amount of energy it consumes daily, uh, which is an amazing thing. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time when we talk about sustainability, well, for some companies, right, it's a challenge to really get started and they see it as a kind of really long journey where it might take some time to actually get to net zero or to be able to achieve some of their goals. Um, so what advice do you have? Obviously, you're already kind of there and you're doing so much good in the world, double, you said. Um, so what advice do you have, you know, for people that are kind of looking to go, it, well, moved more towards, you know, sustainable solutions and a strategy? How did you work with Cisco and, and what does that look like? I'd say, first off, you need to have a plan. Uh, right. You need to begin to start with, I think, because if you're only talking about it, you're not really doing anything. And especially with Cisco, you have so many people to talk with. You have great experienced people, and also there's no issues ever with PR. Like, you can just contact people and they answer. Yeah, that's, great. That's, that's really good feedback for our team, so I'll make sure they hear that. So let's talk a little bit about the solution, and it's a hybrid cloud solution, right? Yes. The um, model that you have. So what what was it that caused, what was the kind of um, instigator, or what was it that made you kind of work with Cisco now? What was it that changed in your strategy that, that you know, really kind of brought you to Cisco? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, we decided in the pandemic, I believe, the, the company was thinking about cloud. Everyone was talking about cloud. Yeah. It was the huge trend. And so in the beginning of everything, the company was, okay, we're going cloud first. But then after talking to IT, they actually decided to go hybrid because okay. it was a better solution due to not only legacy applications running in our data centers, but also cost. Cloud is an exp um, cheap, so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we managed to have contact with Cisco quite early on in our stage uh, in going cloud, and I believe that they they provide a solution which is now called the Cloud Network Controller, okay. a a way with integrating cloud into your whole solution. So with your orchestrator, the Nexus Dashboard Orchestrator, which you have on-prem as a virtual machine, you can actually manage your on-prem as well as the cloud in the same tool. And this was a huge benefit for us. Not only did we save time, but also cost, because in traditional ways, you would go to an Azure course or a Google course to learn about their products and how their networks are built uh, and how you as a customer need to think. But now, with this solution instead, you can spend that time and money on building your own thing together with Cisco. And I mean, so far, so good. Oh, so good to, that's good to hear as well. And I was saying earlier, we heard from some of our Cisco leaders and executives, there are a few innovation talks today. We focused a lot on sustainability, as you can imagine. And you, as you can see, it's a big topic here at Cisco Live. Um, so what do you like most about the Cisco solutions that you have in place? Like what really stands out to you? And I guess, you know, obviously you, you talked about having a great relationship with the teams that you work with, but what else is it about the solutions that, you know, you're, you get excited to interact with every day? Well. 
I'd say the, the most exciting thing is that it's always evolving. So today it might not support everything that you need, but you know that Cisco will take your feedback, take it to the developers, and then come back every one month or every quarter and give you feedback or an so update. So it's kind of building on, yeah. you know, iteratively. It's exactly. not kind of like because just a presentation of what the sustainability strategy should or could be, but working on that together as a partnership. Yes, uh, because cloud is it's not as traditional networks. Cloud is very different. Right. And therefore, you need to evolve and adapt as the clouds evolve as well. So one thing you planned a year ago might not work in the next year. And so together with Cisco, I think you'll manage a very good progress in your building a hybrid cloud. Got it. And Eric, you have a session, I think you just mentioned tomorrow, right here at Cisco. Yes, so I hope I've, I do. Uh, you're, you're excited and you want lots of people to attend that because watching this broadcast and here at the show, there probably are going to be some more people at your show after today, after hearing you share your story. So give us a sneak peek as to what you're going to talk about tomorrow and then also what's next for Skanska. Sure. Uh, so tomorrow at 4.30, I'll be talking about the solution that together with Cisco, we managed to provide Skanska IT, a hybrid cloud which manages everything from one tool. So it's cost effective, it's time effective, and also you can build upon this and integrate more solutions into it. And so you don't have to buy a different tool for this thing. You can just integrate it into this one. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful product. And I love, you know, we, you're really tying back to simplicity, which was actually an innovation talk that we just um, heard about earlier as well. Eric, I just want to say we're very grateful when people like you join us in the studio because you really bring our technology to life for us. So as a customer, thank you for being a customer of Cisco, but thank you for taking the time out of your busy Cisco live schedule. I know you've got a session tomorrow and you need to prepare, but thank you again. And Rob, we're going to head back to you now in the studio, A. Eh? Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nish. Uh, you know, there's something about not just learning from customers, but the fact we focus on sustainability, we talk about all the things that maybe Cisco does and we're doing with partners, and then you start incorporating customers and you see how we're all enabling each other to come up with answers in places maybe we didn't even realize and hear the success stories that others are having. Believe it or not, we've got Cedric in another complete, you may not realize it, but he is in a totally different location than where he was before. He made his way from the Cisco store all the way over to the sustainability zone Cedric, what is going on in this sustainability zone? Yeah, well, Rob, I was here before, right, and we, we talked about the six key uh, features that they have here. We talked uh, with Christian before about the energy savings um, accelerators, uh, but today we're going, or like right now, actually, like we're going to talk about the sustainability simulator, right? It's actually something close to my heart as well because I have been working with the team that developed it as well here at Cisco, but I'm joined by Alec, and Alec is our lead in, uh, or sustainability lead in uh, competitive intelligence. So, Alec, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you very much and uh, thank you for being here. So this is a tool that we're using for a lot of our customers to show them immediate benefits of refreshing their install base. So what it does is you have here actually a very visual kind of map of what customers can see when we present that to them. So what it shows here is all the different countries where we have shipped equipment and based on that, we know exactly how many products are end of sales, end of life. And what we've done is we've worked with our business units to define what would be the migration path from the old products to the new products. Doing that, because the new products are more energy efficient, we can define or simulate how much energy savings they might do per year in kilowatts and what the equivalent in dollars would be, you know, from a saving based on the price of the energy that they're paying, but also what's the offset of carbon emission of the usage of the product. So what we see here, for example, for this particular customer, these are all the regions where they're present and where we have shipped, shipped equipments. If they would refresh the equipment, they could do an equivalent of 5 million, say, 5 million kilowatts per year savings which would resonate to $1 million savings if we use basic average pricing of the European Commission in terms of price per energy. So it's very visual for a customer to understand you have all the equipment, we can refresh that equipment and we can help you not only on saving energy, and we know that particularly in Europe, energy savings is really a must these days, but also we can look at how much CO2 footprint 
we could save based on the goals that they have on the usage of the equipment. Because any kilowatt of electricity that you pay will generate a CO2 emission. And based on the country that they located, we have mapping of, if, for example, in Germany, the kilowatt or the CO2 per kilowatt is much higher because they're using fossil fuel to generate electricity. In other regions of the world, like France, for example, because we have a lot of nuclear, it will be less um, impactful for the energy, so we have less. What we can also show to the customer, something very visual, is the impact. So sometimes it's very complicated for customer to understand how many tons of CO2 can I save if I would refresh my equipment. Well, here we show them the equivalent of the number of plane travel that they could save for a thousand kilometer travel by airplanes or how many train travel they could save, how many cars save. But a lot of customers do also carbon offsetting. And carbon offsetting means that they could, for example, plant trees to recuperate the equivalent of CO2 emissions. And that's what we're showing here with these trees. So very valuable for a customer because it shows them direct value of working with Cisco in a sustainable approach to refresh the equipment. Great. Thank you so much, Alec. You can hear it. Like, you can do good in the world by doing something uh, about sustainability, but you can also save costs for you. There are some sustainability grants as well that governments are, uh, like, giving out as well. So check out the sustainability zone here in the hub or go to the Cisco website and learn more about that to know how you can spend those grants. We're going to go back to the studio right now where Rob and Nish are. So, hey, guys, are you there? Uh, we are here. Thank you so much, Cedric. Wonderful job. Come back over to the studio, man. We are almost ready to wrap things up for the day here. This, again, was the final show, and we just got a few housekeeping items to cover. But first, before we do that, Nish, I haven't been with you all day. How's I know. your day been? What, what's a highlight of your day? Gosh, what is the highlight of my day, Rob? Well, One I thing say, is all you get. I know, it feels like we're somewhere tropical, I was just thinking yep. with all of these. Um, but we're not, we're in Amsterdam, and that's got, you know, it's great just to be back live in person. I think I'm just going to have to say connecting with people, that's been my favourite thing. All the conversations Always. we've had, yeah. all the things we've seen. I know I've been vague, Rob, but it really was no, all no. amazing. It really we've was. We've talked through a lot of details today, you don't need to be very specific. <laughs> well, we've still got more days left, right? So, guys, thank you so much for joining us as we've covered these shows because this has been a ton of fun and it's gonna be a ton of fun tomorrow as well. Tomorrow, you can expect stuff coming. The next chapter of hybrid work, look at my notes, accelerating secure innovation, frustrating attackers, new IoT innovation, so we get into more details around industrial IoT, which we've alternately teased about and delivered some information, but honestly, there's so many storylines in that area, that's gonna be a very good one to keep up with as well. Remember, everything you need is online, so you can go back and take better notes if you missed it, or go back and get exactly what you need. My name is Rob Boyd on behalf of Nish, Cedric, Steve, and an incredible crew behind us. That's the end of day one. Who loves you? <laughs>